Did you know an estimated 2.5 quintillion bytes of data is generated on an everyday basis? And forecast predicts that the numbers will surely increase by almost 10 times by 2030. Data has always been an essential asset to the growth of any organization. And since we are living and working in a data-driven world, it is important to organize and store data properly and most importantly in an efficient manner. For decades, traditional relational databases have been the backbone of data storage. MySQL, PostgreSQL and Microsoft SQL Server have been the leading database technologies to store and manipulate data. And there's no sign of them disappearing anytime soon. Traditional databases are still an extremely efficient way to store and access data. However, a new type of database known as NoSQL is gaining huge popularity. NoSQL database is an approach that works towards managing data as well as database design which may come in handy to process huge sets of distributed data to address big data performance and scalability issues. And one such popular database is MongoDB. Well, you heard it right. MongoDB is an open source documented oriented database to handle large scale web applications. So what could be better than staying ahead of the curve and getting trained in MongoDB? Well, subscribing to our channel Simply Learn, of course. Since we publish tech related content every day to help you master various emerging technologies and programming languages. Also, make sure to hit that bell icon to never miss an update from us. Today's video will be a full course on MongoDB for 2023, starting from the basics to the advanced level topics. We will start off this video with a quick introduction to NoSQL databases by understanding the fundamentals of MongoDB database. To become an expert in MongoDB, firstly you must understand and master the concepts of schema design and data modeling. Following the mastery of data modeling, the next step is to master how to query CRUD operations and perform projection on documents. Furthermore, it is important to understand the aggregation framework and how or when to use indexing. With this foundation in place, one can progress to intermediate level topics such as monitoring, backup and restore, security options as well as understanding the various storage engines that MongoDB supports and how to use MongoDB with big data. All of this information should provide a solid foundation for moving on to concepts like MapReduce, GridFS and scaling aspects such as replication and sharding with the goal of providing effective fault tolerance and high availability. So without any further ado, let's get started. Today's session, we'll be discussing what is MongoDB, why is it used and what is its significance in today's world. I hope my audio is fine and the screen is clearly visible. If you guys are facing any issue, do let us know in the comment section and our team will try to fix it as soon as possible. Alright, now in the world of databases, the most common and well popular databases are RDBMS, which is Relational Database Management Systems. Now what if you want to develop an application which deals with a large volumes of data? Then we need to choose one such database which always provides a high performance data storage solutions so that we can achieve the performance in the solution in the terms of data store and the retrieval with accuracy, speed and reliability. Now if we categorize the database solutions, then there are mainly two types of database categories that are available. That is, the first one is RDBMS like MySQL, SQL Server, Oracle, etc. And another type is NoSQL databases like MongoDB, CosmoDB, Cassandra, Hadoop, etc. More on that soon. Firstly, let us discuss the agenda for today's session. We'll start the tutorial with a quick introduction to NoSQL and then we'll discuss what exactly is what is MongoDB and then we'll go through the history of MongoDB which is when it when and how it came into existence and after that we'll understand why we use MongoDB. Up next we'll discuss some key salient features of MongoDB. Up next we'll discuss how exactly MongoDB works and then we'll go through some different applications of MongoDB in real life and then We'll see which companies are using MongoDB in current days. And finally, we'll understand when to use and when not to use the MongoDB. Now, before we understand what is MongoDB, it is important to learn what is NoSQL. Now, under the vast roof of big data, there lies a number of databases which are used to store these massive amounts of data that is generated worldwide. Now, one among them which is attracting a huge number of interest is the NoSQL database. The not only SQL or NoSQL database which is often referred as with these two terms is an approach that works towards managing data as well as the database design which may come in handy for huge sets of distributed data. It consists of number of technologies and architectures that seek a solution to the big data performance issues and scalability that cannot be addressed by the relational databases. 
Now, this database is used when companies and enterprises develop a need to access and analyze large amounts of unstructured data or the data stored in multiple virtual servers in the cloud. Now, there is no specific definition for what NoSQL is, but it is a common set of observation where we can describe that it is not a relational model. That is, unlike the traditional data, relational databases which store data in the form of tables which comprises of rows and columns, NoSQL database doesn't store in that way. Now, in NoSQL databases also we have a various types of databases. Now, the first one is key value database. That is, it is the simplest type of NoSQL database and every data element in the database is stored as a key value pair consisting of an attribute name or key and a value. So, in a sense, a key value stored is like a relational database with only two columns. The key or attribute name such as anything like state, ID, your name and the value such as uh, let's say a country name India. So that is one of a NoSQL database. And next we have column based or column oriented databases. Now while a relational database stores data in rows and reads data row by row, a column store is organized as a set of columns. This means that when you want to run analytics on a small number of columns, you can read those columns directly without consuming memory with the unwanted data. And of course, we have the document type of database. The concept that is focused on in document databases, the documents that are stored and received from the database stored can be like a JSON or a BSON or an XML format. Now, these documents are usually similar to each other and are in a hierarchical tree data structure that are self-describing and consists of sc scalar values, maps, collections, and etc. And finally, we do have graph databases, guys. Now, a graph database focuses on the relationship between data elements. Now, each data element is stored as a node uh, and the connections between elements are called links or relationships. In a graph database, connections of first class elements of the database stored directly. Now, in relational databases, linked, links are implied using data to uh, express the relationship. Now, these were some of the mainly used NoSQL database guys, but in this tutorial, we'll be only focusing on the document database and which is one of the most commonly used NoSQL databases out there and the best example is MongoDB. And apart from MongoDB, we do have other document databases like Couchbase uh, NoSQL database as well. Now that we've understood what is uh, NoSQL databases, let us now quickly understand what is MongoDB. MongoDB is an open source document oriented or a non-relational database. Now it is different than traditional relational databases like PostgreSQL, MySQL or SQL Server because it stores the data in JSON like documents instead of tables. And it is primarily is used to store large volumes of data in the form of documents. Now traditional relational databases store data uh, using tables and rows, right? MongoDB on the other hand is a non-relational database which uh, has collections instead of tables. Now documents are stored inside the collections in Mongo where rows are stored in tables in traditional relational databases. Now with MongoDB the biggest advantage is the structure and scheme of your data is flexible and not enforced by a predefined table definition unlike relational databases where you have to specify the schema that is the structure of the table, the attributes and the values in it. Now documents can vary greatly in size and shape within the same collection whereas tables are more rigidly defined in a relational database. So when you are using MongoDB, it represents hierarchical relationship in a single record instead of joining multiple tables. So that is the main difference between a relational database and a non-relational database and MongoDB being a NoSQL database follows the document data model, which is a collection of complex documents which arbitrary nested data formats and varying records formats. Now, because MongoDB does not store data in a structured table format, you cannot query it using SQL. Instead, MongoDB uses a more flexible and a dynamic query language called Mongo specific queries, which is based on JavaScript, which we'll be discussing in a certain way. All right, I hope you understood uh, what is MongoDB. Let us now go to the history of MongoDB, guys. Now, it is also important that when and how MongoDB has came into existence, even though we have several relational databases in the market. Now, MongoDB was first introduced in 2007. Tengen software company began developing MongoDB in 2007 as a component of a planned platform as a service product. So from 2002 
2007 to 2008 it was developed and it was working as a platform as a service product now in 2009 the company shifted to an open source development model with the company offering commercial support and other services so from 2009 since it became an open source the users can directly download it from the internet in 2013 tengent changed its name to mongodb inc and it is working under the same banner on october 2020 2017 mongodb became a publicly listed traded company on nasdaq as mdb with an ipo price of 24 dollars per share now mongodb is a global company with us headquarters in new york city and international headquarters in dublin and has more than 110 million download and regular users in the current times and the latest version of it was released in 2022 which is 6.0 let us now understand why mongodb is used guys now since mongodb is a nosql database uh, we need to understand when and why we need to use it uh, in real life as well now since in normal circumstances mongodb always preferred by the developers when our main concern is to deal with larger huge volumes of data with a high performance so if you want to insert thousands of thousands of records in a second then mongodb is the best choice for that now also one of the main reason is to overcome the limitation of relational databases or like the structured query language guys where the language is only used for certain uh, databases or for limited records right so in order to overcome that we use mongodb since it is a robust and highly scalable and it is also powerful way of storing data in comparison to traditional databases now it is also highly flexible which allows you to store and work on different data types in one document whereas in relational database you store data in tables and you have to maintain a proper schema for that so you need to join multiple tables if you want to retrieve certain amounts of data and mongodb also provides a lot of security and it is also considered as a powerful query language as well now as discussed earlier mongodb uh, allows the user with flexible schema that means it allows you to meet the ever changing conditions characteristics of big data applications if you are uh, working on massive amounts of data on a regular basis and also it gives you high performance with its incredible features like on demand scaling real time resources which will guarantee the user high performance of the applications let us now discuss some of the key features of mongodb now the first one is aggregation now you might have heard about aggregation in sql as well now data records are processed by aggregation which is grouping of data which then produces the computed results or a, into a single result now in simple words aggregation operations group values from multiple documents uh, in mongodb database together and can perform a variety of operations on the grouped data to return a single result I, as said earlier it is similar to that of sql group by clause where we use aggregation functions like average sum minimum max and others next we have the grid fs now grid fs is a specification for storing and retrieving files that exceed the base on document size limit of 16 mb now instead of storing a file in a single document grid fs divides a file into parts or which is called as chunks and stores each of those chunks as a separate document now by default grid fs limits chunk size to 255 kb now it uses two collections to store files so it is also another important feature of mongodb now next we have sharding now in mongodb uh, it uses sharding and replication which are another key uh, factors sharding allows partitioning of data across multiple servers using the shared key and the technique of synchronizing all these organized data across many servers to offer redundancy is known as replication now next we have document oriented as we all know that mongodb is a document oriented type of a uh, database there are different documents to store different types of data and each document has a unique system generated key replication i think we have already discussed and also uh, mongodb is a schema less database that is it stores data in collections with no enforced schema so in other words incoming data can have a predefined structure and it can adhere to it however different documents in the same collection can have different structures if required indexing is also another key feature of mongodb which is one of the most important options to improve the search query performance now as a result we should index the fields that fit our search criteria like without indexing mongodb it has to scan every document of the collection to get the required result that matches the query statement right 
So in order to eliminate that, we need to provide indexing for a faster query retrieval. Next, we have ad hoc queries. Now, in most cases, while designing a database schema, we don't know what queries we'll run ahead of time, right? So when we design our database, we may not be knowing uh, the query types or the data that we process into our database. So ad hoc query is the query not known while structuring the data. Or you can say that ad hoc queries are short lived uh, queries whose value depends on variables. So MongoDB supports these types of queries and can be also updated in real time. And finally, high performance. Performance means writing speed performance of MongoDB is far greater than any other relational database like MySQL. Those were some of the key features of MongoDB. So let us now understand how exactly MongoDB works, guys. MongoDB stores data objects in collections and documents instead of the traditional tables and rows which is used in uh, relational databases. Now collections comprise sets of documents which are equivalent to tables and relational database. Now documents consist of a key value pair which are basic unit of data in MongoDB. Now the structure of a document can be changed by simply adding a new fields or deleting existing ones. Now documents can define a primary key as a unique identifier and values can be of variety of data types including the documents and the array of documents. So it is basically uh, works on a JavaScript query which is JSON and it is further uh, classified into BSON which is a binary encoded object notation. So if you look at the picture in this, we have basically a host which uh, ultimately has a server which stores the data. And further we have databases wherein we have different collections and in collections we have documents. So the data is stored in these documents which is further presented into the collections and are saved into databases. So this is roughly how exactly MongoDB works. Let us now discuss some applications of MongoDB in real life as well guys. Now one of the main application is IoT or Internet of Things which is one of the most appreciated technology innovations in the world today connecting billions of devices globally. Now with IoT companies improve productivity, redefine their models and leverage operational efficiency. So MongoDB helps to maximize this full potential of IoT devices. It's intelligent data platform which speeds up the operation and delivery of IoT devices. It is also extensively used in mobile applications because with the data that is being generated, like for example in social media, in internet, we need MongoDB to handle such amounts of our data, right? So it is also used in real-time analysis. Now with RDBMS databases, analytics and transactional databases were usually separate and data from the transactional database would have to be moved to analytics env environment which requires an immense daily data load. Now with NoSQL databases like MongoDB, companies can now analyze data in real time while saving cost. For example, if you take stock market, we have tons or trillions amounts of data has been generated every day. So again in sports as well, which is uh, a real time data analysis to get the insight, we need the data in a quick and faster manner. So in that case, we can use MongoDB as well. MongoDB is also perfect for catalog management, content management, as well as product data management, guys. It enables product data or the content related information to be managed and processed in a single central system. This allows for detailed cost analysis, increased productivity, gain new insights, and improve collaboration with the companies as well. So one of the uh, best example if I take is the Aadhaar card, guys. It is a real world MongoDB use case where Aadhaar is a un India's unique identification project and world's most extensive biometric database system. Now we know that it was, I think it was launched in to early 2010s and it has collected demographic and biometric information of over 1.5 billion people in India. So Aadhaar mostly relies on MongoDB among other databases like HBase, MySQL, Hadoop which basically uh, runs on uh, massive amounts of data which process huge amount of data in a real time. So MongoDB was one of the database systems for purchase to power the search strategy of Aadhaar card. Alright, let us now discuss some of the companies which are using MongoDB in real life uh, guys. So companies like Google, Facebook, Bosch, eBay are some of the companies which have extensively used MongoDB nowadays. And apart from that, we have other companies like, you know, Toyota, Cisco, Adobe, SAP, AstraZeneca, Verizon and other service and product based companies use 
MongoDB on a regular basis. Now, apart from this, we have Shutterfly, we have MetLife, we even have Forbes, which use MongoDB on a regular basis. And that brings us to the end of today's session, guys. Now, before we uh, wrap up the session, it is also important that you need to understand when you should be using MongoDB and when you shouldn't. Now, although MongoDB is a great database out there, there are times you shouldn't and you should use in certain uh, circumstances. Now, MongoDB works extensively well with unstructured data. So it's great for uh, big data analytic systems. So if you're working on huge chunks of data, which needs you know real-time processing immediately then you can use mongodb mongodb is also used for cloud computing like microsoft azure aws which is an ideal cloud computing platform uh, for mongodb because cloud-based storage needs to easily distribute data across multiple servers and which basically suits mongodb's nature now if you do not have any database administrator in that case you you might as well use mongodb as well now wherein you have lots of unstructured data to process and which has no storable data type limit so in that case you can use mongodb and finally if you have schema issues that is if you have an unstable or undefined schema you can use mongodb which is not with the case of traditional database which requires a predefined schema before you start working on the database. As you all know, we are living in the era of big data where massive volumes of data are generated per second worldwide. So handling and storing these huge chunks of data is pivotal and paramount for all the companies around the world. Traditionally, relational databases were used to store this data prior to when the internet came into existence. Now, in the early 1990s, the internet gained extreme popularity and the relational databases could not keep up with the flow of information and data demanded by the users as well as the large variety of data types that occurred from this evolution. This led to the development of non-relational databases often referred to as NoSQL. The not only SQL or commonly known as NoSQL databases is an approach to data management and database design that may be useful for large sets of distributed data and unstructured data. It basically consists of collection of technologies and architecture that seek to address big data performance and scalability issues that relational databases cannot address. So this database is used when businesses and enterprises require access to and analysis of large amounts of unstructured data. Now this unstructured data can be of any type. It can be a text file, it can be an image or video and others that are stored across multiple servers. So it is important that we understand how this NoSQL databases work. So in today's session, we'll be going through all the concepts that are needed to understand what NoSQL databases are and how it, they exactly work. So without any further delay, let us jump straight into today's topic. Firstly, let us go through the agenda for today's session. We'll start the tutorial by understanding what is SQL and then we'll look at why we use SQL and after that, we'll understand what is NoSQL database and then we'll understand why we use NoSQL. Up next, we'll understand how to use NoSQL and how exactly it works. And then we'll look at some different types of NoSQL databases. And after that, we'll have a detailed comparison between SQL and NoSQL database. And finally, we'll conclude the session by understanding some advantages and disadvantages of using NoSQL. And we'll also look when to use SQL as well as NoSQL. So without any further delay, let us dive straight into today's topic on SQL versus NoSQL. Firstly, let us understand what is SQL. SQL as it stands is defined as structure query language is basically a standardized programming language that is used to manage databases and it performs various operations on data in them. Initially created in 1970s, SQL is widely used by many companies and technologies nowadays. SQL is used for modifying database tables and index structures. It is also used in adding, updating and deleting rows of data. It is also used to retrieve subsets of information from within the database management system. Now, SQL is used to perform various actions such as to insert data, to update data, modify and delete the data in the database as well. Now, when we talk about SQL, it is important that we talk about relational database systems as well. 
A relational database system or RDM, RDBMS is a database system that stores and fetches data in the form of table, that is in the form of rows and columns. Tables are used to store data in relational databases about related objects. Each column contains attributes of data, whereas each row holds a record of unique data known as a key, which helps in making relationship between different data points that is present in different table, which makes us easy to understand. Now, these relational databases or RDBMS are managed using SQL language to perform various operations. Therefore, SQL codes are used to retrieve information from these relational databases by doing various interactive operations like using join, create, truncate, delete, alter, and etc. Let us now look at some popular SQL databases. Some popular SQL databases that are available are MySQL, Oracle Database, Microsoft SQL, Server SQL Lite and PostgreSQL. Now that we have understood what is SQL, let us now understand what is non-SQL. That is NoSQL, sorry. NoSQL database is a non-relational database management system that does not require a fixed schema. That is, the data is, store, is not stored in the form of tables in NoSQL databases. Basically, it avoids any uh, joining or creating or scaling the databases in SQL. The major purpose of using a NoSQL database is for distributed data storage, which is having high volumes of data storage needs. NoSQL is used for big data and real-time web applications. Like for example, companies like Amazon, Facebook, Google collect terabytes of users' data and every single day. So basically, NoSQL database stands for not only SQL or not SQL, and uh, it is introduced in the year 1998 by Carl Stroh. Now, traditional RDBMS uses SQL syntax to store and retrieve data for further insights. Now, instead, our NoSQL database system enc encompasses a wide range of database technologies that can store structured, semi-structured, as well as unstructured data. Let us now understand why we use NoSQL. We use hierarchical storage structure instead of a table-like structure. That means, uh, before relational databases, companies used a hierarchical database system which are with a tree-like structure for database tables. Now, these early database management systems enabled users to organize large quantities of data. However, they were complex, often required a particular application and in a limited way, which they could uncover the data that is stored. Now, these limitations eventually led to the development of relational database, that is, the data that is stored in tables. Uh, so, SQL provided an interface to interact with relational data and allowing the analyst to connect tables by merging on common fields. But as time passed, the demands for faster and more desperate usage of larger data sets became increasingly more important for emerging technologies, for uh, e-commerce and other big giants. For that, uh, NoSQL has became the alternative for everyone. Now, another reason is it is now we have constant addition of new features and functions in the NoSQL uh, database, right? So that means like uh, we know that technology is being rapidly evolved and uh, huge enormous amounts of data has been released on a daily basis and it's important that we store this data and access in a quick way. Now NoSQL is the best database to use for large amounts of data or for ever, ever changing data sets. It is also best use when you have to uh, have flexible data model or need that don't fit into a relational model. And finally, when if, if you want that uh, there is no relationship between any stored data and you feel it is not important, then you can use NoSQL as well. Let us now look at some popular NoSQL databases. Some popular NoSQL databases are MongoDB, Apache Hbase, Cassandra, Redis, Neo4j, and etc. Let us now look at some types of NoSQL databases that are present. Firstly, we have document-oriented. Uh, the document database typically stores self-describing JSON, XML, and BSON documents. They are similar to key value stores, but in this case, a value is a single document that stores all the data to related to a specific key. Popular fields in the document can be indexed to provide faster retrieval without knowing the key as well. Each document can have same or different data structure. MongoDB, CouchDB, CloudEnd are some examples of document-based uh, NoSQL database. Next, we have key value pair database. The data in this is stored like a key value pair. Key value pair data stored in database in the form of a hash table. Each key is unique in this case. 
the value stored may be an integer, string, a binary object, a JSON object, etc. The key value store based database is simplest database among all the data databases in NoSQL database. Redis, coherence are examples of some key value stored databases. Next we have column based or column stored database in NoSQL, which is in this the data stored in grouped columns instead of rows. Every column values are stored separately. It delivers high performance on aggregate functions like count, sum, max, minimum. Group of columns uh, data stored in key spaces like schema in RDBMS. Key spaces contains group of rows or columns and uh, HBase, Bigtable, Aculamo are some examples of column store databases. And finally we have graph oriented or graph store databases. Data in this is represented in the form of a directed graph. It consists of nodes and edges. Nodes represent an entity and any edge represents the relation between the two nodes. Node edge to be unique. Social networks, logistics, spatial data used a uh, graphical storage database. Neo4j, infinite graph, orient, db, flock, db are examples of some graph storage database. Next, let us understand how exactly NoSQL database works. For that, I'm going to take the example of MongoDB uh, database. Now, MongoDB is based on the NoSQL document store model in which data objects are stored as separate documents inside a collection instead of a traditional column and row of a relational database. Now, uh, MongoDB groups data through collections and basically a collection is simply a grouping of documents that have a same or similar purpose. A collection acts similarly to a table in a traditional SQL database. However, it has a major difference. A collection is not enforced by a strict schema, that is, it does not have any fixed schema at all. Instead, documents in a collection can have slightly diff different structure from another as needed. This reduces the need to break items in a document into several different tables at, as it is often done in an SQL implementation. Now coming to document, a document is a representation of a single entity of a data in MongoDB database. A collection consists of one or more related objects. Major difference that exists between MongoDB and SQL is that in that documents are different from rows. Row data is flat with one column for each value in the row. However, in MongoDB, documents can contain embedded sub documents providing a much closer inherent data model for your applications. Now, if I just have to map what are, what are exactly and how it is different from RDBMS, a collection in a MongoDB is equivalent to the tables in RDBMS and a document in MongoDB is equivalent to the rows in RDBMS and fields in MongoDB is equivalent to the columns in RDBMS. So this is how a document looks uh, in a MongoDB. As you can see, this is similar to a row in RDBMS, but we just have a field and a value that is taken separately in, you know, in uh, instead of a tab tabular value. And another important thing to note, uh, note here is that uh, MongoDB supports dynamic schema, which means one document of a collection can have a number of fields while the other document can have less or same number of fields. That is, if a collection can have uh, four fields while other document can have only just two fields, which is basically not possible in a relational database, uh, which does not exist uh, as it, it does not support because it needs a particular and a fixed schema in that. Let us now understand some differences between the SQL and NoSQL. Firstly, SQL is a relational database and NoSQL is a non-relational database. That means SQL databases are in the form of tables that can contain rows and columns and they have fixed logical schema design. All the data in SQL is arranged in tabular format and it is well suited for complex queries. And on the other hand, NoSQL databases is a non-relational database that means it does not store data in the form of tab tables and contains collections and inside every collection there is a document that contains the data of a single entry. This, store, this data is stored in the form of a key value pair, unlike SQL where we store data under the fixed schema. So as we discussed, uh, SQL has a fixed schema design and structure and NoSQL has a dynamic schema design and structure. SQL can handle complex queries, whereas NoSQL can handle large volumes of data. Now SQL is vertically scalable. Now. Uh, SQL databases support vertical scaling, which means it improves the single server by increasing RAM, SSD or CPU. In vertical scaling, we are restricted to a single system and we can improve it as much as we want till the practical limit. 
Whereas in NoSQL database, we can do horizontal scaling because they support distributed computing or distributed systems. In horizontal scaling, we can add another node or computer for better performance and we can add n number of such servers or nodes uh, as per a requirement. So as discussed, we can add as many as nodes as we want and this is why we prefer NoSQL for high scalability because there is no limit for scaling. And finally, it follows ACID properties that is atomicity that means transactions should be performed at once or it shouldn't happen at all. Consistency that means the state of a database should remain consistent before and after the transaction. Isolation that is one traction one transaction shouldn't affect another transaction and it should and should be independent. And we lastly durability. Now successful transaction should be reflected even if there is any system failure. Whereas the NoSQL follows cap property that is consistency, availability and partial tolerance. Let us now discuss some advantages and disadvantages of uh, using NoSQL. Firstly, let us discuss about the advantages. NoSQL provides high performance and scalability and it also has a lot of availability and flexibility. It is open source and it is schema less as well. That is, you can directly uh, download the NoSQL databases from the internet, unlike some commercial databases that are available in the internet. While on the other hand, there are some disadvantages as well. That is, it is, it lacks the standardization. That means it does not have a fixed query uh, in order to retrieve data from the databases, which result in, in uh, consistency issues. And since it, has all these consistency issues and does not retrieve data properly, it, it has a limited query capabilities. So that brings us to the end of today's session on SQL versus NoSQL guys. So you might have a doubt that when you need to use SQL and when we need to use NoSQL. Now SQL is easiest to work with relational databases. That is it is useful when you want to perform complex queries using various operations like join and etc. And if you want to perform quick data storage and retrieval operations, you can use SQL. Whereas uh, if you want, you can use NoSQL if you are designing a distributed systems. And if you want a hierarchical storage structure instead of a tabular like structure. Also NoSQL gives you the flexibility to create dynamic structures and, and can add features as you, as you want. Also, there is no asset properties during the creation of any applications while creating uh, NoSQL databases as well. So in this way you can use NoSQL and uh, SQL as per your requirement. Now since it's already installed on my system, uh, the installation process will be different but you just need to follow the steps there and uh, finally install it. So once you're done with the installation, you can uh, go to your C drive and here you can click on program files and you can see that MongoDB is installed. And inside of it, you have the server folder and then you have the 4.4 folder and then you have the bin folder, right? So here you have the application that is your Mongo and the MongoD applications. Both are executable files. Now the MongoD file or the application is the daemon process. Now this is the background process that makes sure you retrieve the data from the database, access the data. So it does all the background tasks. So after the installation, now you need to create a path to this file. By doing this, you don't have to always go to the bin folder and then execute the file. You can directly execute the file on your command prompt, right? So for that, let's just go to our environment variables. But before that, let's just uh, copy this path, right? And here under the user variable section, click on path and say edit and go ahead and just paste it, right? I've already pasted mine. So just go ahead and paste it and click on OK and say OK, right? So now you've created the path successfully. Now let's head to our command prompt and run the Mongo file. So here. You can just directly type Mongo since the path has already been created. So just go ahead and say Mongo. And here you can see that your Mongo server has been generated. And uh, with this, you know that your in 
MongoDB has been successfully installed and your server is up and running, right? So just for confirmation, let's see if there are any databases and how much space they've occupied. So you can right now just type show DBS. And when you click on it, it says admin, config and localhost and all of it is zero. So with that, you have successfully installed MongoDB on your system and it's up and running. Now, in contrast to structured query language or SQL databases, which is a relational database model where the structure of the database and its tables have been defined, MongoDB does not have or require the definition of a database or a table structure. Instead, we use data models in order to store the documents in our database. So moving ahead, let us now first discuss the agenda for today's session. We'll start the tutorial by understanding what is data modeling and then we'll understand why we use data modeling. After that, we'll be going through how data modeling actually works in MongoDB. And next, we'll understand different types of data models in MongoDB. Up next, we'll discuss types of relationships in data models and then we'll see some methods to create these data models. And finally, we'll understand uh, when to use these data models as per our requirement. So without any further delay, let's get started with today's topic. All right, so what is data modeling in MongoDB? Now basically data modeling is a process of taking unstructured data that is generated from the real world scenario and introducing it to the data server and then structuring it into a logical data model in our database. So it is basically a process of determining how data is stored and what connection exists between various entities in a relationship. Now, you don't have to create a schema before inserting data because no SQL is flexible. This is so that MongoDB can support a dynamic database schema that makes it unnecessary to create your schema in advance. Instead, you can now store your information and make changes in accordance with your data. Now, consider data modeling in MongoDB as a relationship. Now, there is no particular relationship just like uh, SQL where we use. Now, MongoDB relationships are the representations of how multiple documents are logically connected to each other in MongoDB. Now, since MongoDB is a document database, any document within the same collection is not mandatory. To have same set of fields or structure, you can store different types in a collections given field and can even add new fields, update fields and delete existing fields as well. Now, for example, consider an online shopping store where we have like thousands of customers arriving daily and purchasing new products from the website. Now we get a lot of unstructured data that is the name of the customer, their details and all, which is basically an unstructured data. Now, in order to convert into a proper structured data, we need to uh, model them into a particular way. Which This is where data modeling comes into a picture, where we store the data based upon our requirement. Now, the main challenge in data modeling is balancing the application needs, guys. Now, the database engine's performance characteristics and also the data retrieval patterns. Alright, let us now move ahead and understand why we use data modeling. Now, data model basically helps us to create a simplified and optimized logical database that eliminates redundancy, reduces storage requirements and enables efficient retrieval from the database. Now, data modeling may appear to be a complex process wherein you have to make adjustments to your database unlike SQL where you predefine your schema and create a new table and then store the data. Now, while in MongoDB, data modeling helps us to analyze and understand what type of data and how much data has to be inserted into a database. Data modeling is necessary foundational work that allows data to be stored more easily in the database and has a passive positive impact on data analytics as well. Now, let us understand why exactly we use now data modeling. Now, data quality is paramount for any organization and to ensure that we need higher data quality when we are storing unstructured data in large amounts. Now, the visual representation of requirements and the business rules enables to anticipate what could lead to a large scale data corruption before it occurs. So, data model enables the developers in hindsight to define rules that monitor the data quality and ensuring that there is no possibility of errors. Now it is also important to understand how the data is flowing within the database and the characteristics of that. 
creating data models forces the business to define how data is generated and moved across the application. Development and maintenance. Data modeling exposes errors and inconsistencies early in the process, making is it making it easier and less expensive to fix. So in order to maintain a database that is a, a MongoDB database, which is basically an unstructured one, it is important that we try to develop and maintain it in a regular basis. And finally, performance is another reason why we use data modeling. Now, an organized database is one that is more efficiently operated and data modeling prevents the schema from endless searching and returns results more quickly. Those were some of the reasons uh, on why we use data modeling, guys. All right, let us now move ahead and discuss how data modeling works in MongoDB. Now, unlike SQL databases where you must determine and declare a table schema before inserting data or perform any operations, we need to basically provide a schema for that. Now, MongoDB's collection by default do not require the documents to have the same schema. Now, the documents in a single collection do not need to have the same set of fields and the data type of for a field can differ across documents within a collection. Now, to change the structure of the document in a collection, such as adding a new field or removing the existing field in a document or changing the field values to a new type or update the documents to the new structure. Now, basically, the first step is to basically create and design a schema as per the requirement and the application need by the user. And then we have to combine documents. Now, if there is no scope for multiple documents uh, to store into a single one and ensure that if there is no other need for a single document to store in a multiple document, in such way, we need to understand what is our requirement and combine the documents accordingly so that we can have performance as well as the optimization of the database is also improved. Now, this flexibility facilitates the mapping of documents to an entity or an object. Now, each document can match the data field of a represented ID entity even if the document has substantial variation from other documents in the collection. So this is how basically a data model works wherein you have to choose as per the requirement and understand what type of documents that are being inserted into the database. All right, let us now understand some data models that are used in MongoDB. Now, once you've understood the business requirement and the application on how it should be, as you start modeling your data, you will likely go through various steps of data analysis. Now, each step might produce different types of data models. Therefore, ensuring data models, having the right one can be generally thought of as being one of the main aspect of choosing a data model and they are conceptualized into three categories based on the level of the detail and the specificity. Now, they are classified into three types. The first one is conceptual data model. The conceptual data model explains what the system should contain with regard to and how it is related. This model is usually built with the help of the uh, user and the stakeholders. It represents the application's business logic and is often used as the basis for one or more following model. Next, we have the logical data model. Now, the logical data model will describe how the data will be structured. In this model, the relationship between the entities is established at a high level. You'll also list the attributes for the entities represented in this model. And finally, we have the physical data model, guys. The physical data model represents how the data will be stored in a specific database. Now, in this case, we have MongoDB model where we are using establishing a primary and a secondary relationship between the data in a document that is stored in the database such as MongoDB. You will also establish the data types for each of your fields that are mentioned. This will provide you with your database schema as well. Now, although MongoDB has a flexible schema, you need to uh, data model or schema design. A good data model means that you'll establish a strong foundation for an ever evolving data model. Now, MongoDB supports multiple ways to model relationship between the entities in a data model. Now, the first one is one to one. That is, in this type, one value is associated with only one document. That is, it will have a single relationship between the two connected objects or entities in the database. Next, we have one to many. Here, one value can be associated with more than one document or value at the same time. And finally, we have many to many. 
Now, when two or more entities within a document can have multiple relationship, that is basically is many to many relationship. In this type of model, multiple documents can be associated with each other. So let us now quickly understand with an example. Now consider the example for one to one relationship where I have a student table and contact info table. Now for each student ID, there is a unique details or the contact info. So it is basically pointing one value to another. That is student ID, which is one to one relation. And similarly, we have one to many relation wherein we have customer table and orders table. Now, every customer has a different ID and a customer can place multiple orders. So it can generate multiple order IDs. So we have three different IDs like B204, B391, B448. So this is what is one to many, which is basically one entity is being pointed to three other values. I hope you understood one to one and one to many. So if you understood this, let us know in the comment section below what will be a good example of many to many relationship. All right, moving ahead, let us now discuss the types of methods to create the data models. Now, once we are uh, confirmed with what data model we need and the relationship that we have chosen for uh, for a documents to store the data, we need a, a method that is to create a data model. Now that is where uh, we have two different data models that stores the data in documents. That is first one is embedded data model. So in embedded data model, you can embed data in a single document or structure in MongoDB. It is also referred to as denormalized data model. It leverages the full potential of MongoDB's rich document and it uses a one to one or one to many relationship guys. Next we have the reference data model or in other words, it is known as normalized data model. Now they are used to build one to many as well as many to many relationship models. Now while working with the embedded document models, there will be times when you have to repeat the data. This is where reference data model comes into picture, which basically tackles their data redundancy. So I know it is a bit of confusing. So let's just understand this with an example here. Now, if you consider uh, the embedded model, uh, if you look at a document which I have taken here, which is the details of a student named Rohan, where we have a collection uh, that is containing a document has Rohan. In this document, we have embedded a document here that is contact details and his grade. So embedding uh, data model stores relevant details in the same documents or the same database record. This way you can minimize queries and update required to perform common database operation. On the other hand, we have a reference data model or the normalized data model. So if you look at uh, to the reference model example here, we have basically split a single document into three documents. And since contact details and grade have the ID from the document that is of Rohan's, you can call them whenever needed. Now normalized data model splits the data into multiple collections by using references between the newer collections. You can update or change a single document which will update other collections automatically. This is an efficient way of updating data and is mostly used when your data goes through frequent changes. That is if you're working on a data that has to be leveraged or changed on a daily basis, you can consider reference model. That is, which is basically one of the biggest advantages of using normalized data where you have to model large data sets that follow a certain hierarchy and you have to, where you have to represent multiple many to many relationships. So that is where we use uh, embedded model and reference model. All right. Uh, as we know, MongoDB is a NoSQL database program that controls document oriented data instead of a relational data made, relational data model, which comprises of rows and columns. Now, the speed of MongoDB is one of its characteristics as it handles a huge chunks of unstructured data. So in order to perform a certain operation, MongoDB may use operators to carry out particular tasks in order to return queries more quickly and efficiently. So in today's session, we'll be taking you through all about the MongoDB operators. What are they? the different types of MongoDB operators that are used, its functions with the help of some examples. So without any further ado, Let's get started. So what is MongoDB operators? Operators are basically special symbols or keywords that tell a compiler what mathematical or logical operations to perform. The operator improves MongoDB functionality by enabling the developers and programmers 
to construct sophisticated queries to communicate with data sets that are appropriate for their application and perform certain complex tasks to retrieve the data. Now, in general, we use the find command or method to fetch the data from collections using the query operator. Also, we need to use the prefix uh, which is the dollar sign before the query operator. So, let us just quickly understand the syntax of the operators in MongoDB. The syntax is followed as db dot name of collection dot find and within the parenthesis we have to mention the field name and mention the semicolon and then we have to mention the dollar symbol with the help of the operator that we want to use mention the value and finally we use the pretty uh, method so let us just quickly uh, go through all these uh, terminologies so that we'll have a better idea now the name of the collection is basically according to the query operator we used in our query. This parameter is defined as the collection name from which documents have been retrieved. Next, we have the find method. Now, data can be retrieved from collections using this technique. We can also retrieve particular documents from MongoDB by using the find method with a query operator. Next, we have the field name. According to the query uh, parameter we used in our query, this parameter is defined as the name of the field from which we are retrieving data that is what we are trying to uh, retrieve data from our collection is basically the field name next we have the query operator name which must be used to retrieve the documents from the collection in accordance with the query operations next we have to mention the value the value is nothing uh, more than the field value that we used uh, with the query operator to conduct logical or any mathematical operations and so on and finally we have an optional uh, tag which is pretty now since mongodb output is generally is in an unstructured format so we can display our output using this technique in a structured format and this is also optional guys so if there is a requirement uh, to show the uh, data in a proper structured way you can use the pretty uh, statement so that was all about mongodb operators guys so let us just move ahead so let us now understand the different types of operators in MongoDB. Now, just like uh, any operators in other programming languages, MongoDB operators are used to perform specific relational, mathematical or logical operations and produce the final result. Operators in MongoDB are, you know, broadly classified into three types. The first one is query and projection operator. Next, we have update operator. And then finally, we have aggregation pipeline operator. Now, in MongoDB, the default for queries is to return all the fields in the matching documents. So, basically, a query and a projection operator is used to perform certain calculation, wherein a projection query is used to specify or restrict the data result returned in query result. Now, by specifying a projection query, you can specify the fields you want to return or exclude. Now, similarly, we have other query operators, which we'll be discussing in a while, which are used to perform certain uh, complex calculation on the data that you're retrieving from the documents next we have the update operator which basically updates the value of all the fields of the documents which is matching the specified condition and finally we have the aggregation pipeline so it basically provides the competent results of, as a result of processing the data records and document so it is similar to that of aggregate functions in sql wherein it you know aggregates all the values within a document and performs certain aggregation uh, operation like you know some maximum minimum and so on so these were some of the main uh different types of operators in mongodb so let us now just uh get into detail and how they are further classified into various types now query and projection operator further classified into various other types such as comparison operator logical operator array operator element operator bitwise operator evaluation operator and finally we have geospatial uh, operator now it is time taking to get into all of this stuff and explain each and every operator guys so let us just uh, focus on the main operators that are frequently used in mongodb so firstly let us discuss about the comparison operator guys now the comparison operators are basically used uh, to compare two expressions and retrieve data from the documents that is the documents that are that we have stored uh, that is the all the data from the collections which are basically the group of collections is basically a document in mongodb that is stored in the mongodb database now we have several such comparison operators in mongodb now as explained earlier we have to use the dollar sign with the help of 
operator that we have been uh, mentioning. So basically the operators uh, take the dollar sign and then we have to mention the operator that we have taken. So let us just uh, discuss some of the operators here. The first one is EQ, which is basically the equal operator, which matches values that are equal to the value specified in the query. Next, we have dollar any, which has a full form of not equal to, which is opposite of equal and matches all the values that are not equal to the value specified in the query. Next, we have GT and GT, which is basically greater than and greater than equals to. Uh, this operator basically matches the value that are greater than the value specified in the query or that are even greater than or equal to the values value specified in the query. Next, we have the LT or LTE that is less than or less than equals to. Again, as the, uh, it, the word goes, it is similar. Again, it matches the values that are less than the value specified in the query or it matches with the less than or equal values specified in the query in the document. And finally, we have the in and NIN, which basically matches any of the value that is existing or not existing in an array specified in the query. I know it is a bit of confusing. So let us just uh, understand this with an example here. So consider this example on your right hand side where you can see this image which is basically a format of a document that is stored in a MongoDB database guys. So let us say I have a, you know a collection named orders of let's say a stationary item database. Now I have further different three different documents that are present in uh, this collection. So basically a group of documents is basically a collection in a MongoDB database. So I hope you've understood uh, what is a collection document and what is a database. So if you want to know more about it, we have a dedicated video on what is MongoDB where we've uh, explained clearly on all these terms and how it exactly works. Make sure you check that out, uh, which will be quite helpful and I would highly recommend. So as you can see, we have basically three documents here. We have a ID of three different uh, people who have purchased certain products from a stationery and have different IDs. So we have three customers here, Rahul, Pranav and Kirti. Now, if I say, if I want to perform comparison operation for this, uh, let us just understand how equal and not equal operation performs. So basically, uh, I'm taking an example here, which is db.orders.find, where payment mode is equals to card. So basically, uh, the compiler finds all the documents that is present in this collection, where the payment mode is made through card which instead of cash so basically we have here uh, the details of two uh, customers who have used the payment mode as card which is customer rahul and customer kirti so in this way it will return these two uh, following documents and similarly we have any which is not equal to and i'm taking another example which is db dot orders fine order total is not equals to 600 now as you can see in the image we have the third document of customer Kirti whose order total is 600, right? So it basically evaluates this and returns the result which has an order total which is not equals to 600. That is basically the first two documents. That is, it will retrieve the data from this document of the first, uh, you know, two documents which is of customer Rahul and customer Pranav whose order total is basically 2450 and 5800 respectively. So that is basically what is a comparison operator using EQ and ME which is equal to or not equals to. All right, moving ahead, let us now discuss what is GT and GT which basically uh, derives as greater than and greater than equals to. Again, let us consider the same, uh, you know, collection, uh, same example that we have taken earlier. Now the first uh, query is basically for GT that is DP dots order find order total is greater than 3000. All right. So we are basically performing a search query wherein we want only uh, those documents whose order total is greater than 3000. Now, if you look at the image, we have only, uh, I guess, one document, which is of customer Pranav, whose order total is 5800, which is more than 3000. And similarly, we have for greater than equals to, which is db.orders fine, order total GTE uh, 2450. So basically, we should retrieve uh, the document whose order total is more than 250. Again, we have two documents here, right? Now we have a document of uh, customer Rahul and the customer Pranav whose order total is 2450, which is equals to 2450 that we have uh, mentioned in our query. So basically, uh, the details of the documents of customer Rahul and customer Pranav 
whose order total is greater than or equals to 2400. All right, moving ahead, let us now understand what is LTA and LTA, which is a negation or complete opposite of greater than and greater uh, than equals to. Now, in less than, we have taken an example, which is again order total, which is less than 2000. Uh, so, I guess we have only one record again here of customer Kirti, whose order total is 600. And similarly, less than or equals to 500. Now, I guess we have only one document again of Kirti, which is order total is 600. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, less than or equals to 500, right? So, we don't have any uh, you know, document of the customers which is less than or equals to 500, guys. Sorry, uh, just uh, pardon me for my mistake. I didn't check. So, we don't have any customers whose order total is less than or equals to 500. So, it will basically, uh, you know, retrieve a null value. So, that were some examples of comparison operator. Let us move ahead with logical operators now. So basically logical operators return data based on the expression that evaluate the following condition to either be true or false. Now in general, we have four different types of logical operators in MongoDB, which is and, or, not, and not, which is again similar uh, with any other programming languages where we use a logical operator and similar to that of SQL as well. Now the, basically the and operator returns all the documents that match the condition of both the expressions specified. And OR operator returns all documents that match the condition of either expression specified. Next, we have the NOR operator, which returns all documents that do not match the condition of either expression. This is basically an opposite of OR operator. And finally, we have the NOT operator, which basically returns documents that does not match with the query expression in a document. So again, let us just understand with an example by considering the same example, uh, which is uh, the order collection. Now, for, for ex first example, I'm taking and operator, which says DB dot orders find and address city is either Delhi or payment mode is cash. Now, if I look into the uh, collection here, I have only one such document where city address city is Delhi and payment mode is cash that is the details of customer Pranav. So it will retrieve only the document of Pranav here. Next, if I consider the OR operator, which is DB dot orders find OR city Jaipur or order total is less than or equals to 100. So we have Jaipur uh, city whose uh, I think it's of customer uh, Jaipur. Yeah, it's of customer Rahul. So it will retrieve that one and it will also retrieve those documents whose order total is less than or equals to 1000. Now we have only one document of Kirti whose order total is 600 which is again less than or equals to 100. So basically the first document and the third document will be retrieved in our query in a final resultant set. And finally we have the NOR operator which says the city is either is not either Delhi or payment mode is cash. Now other than city Delhi and the payment mode cash that is we have a uh, Pranav whose payment mode is cash and it also belongs to series. So basically it will uh, remove the document of this person customer uh, Pranav and it will fetch the first and third documents that is uh, the, I, the customer Rahul's and the customer Kirti. So those were some of the uh, logical operator examples we have used. I hope you've understood. So moving ahead, let us now discuss some element operators, guys. The element query operators are basically used to locate document, you know, based uh, on the fields of the uh, document. Now, what that I mean is, so basically every document has a field, right? Now, for example, let's say in the previous example, I've taken ID, customer name, order total, and so on and so, which is basically a field. And now these fields have further values or elements to its name. Right, so the element operator basically uh, finds all the documents based on the fields of the document that you are trying to search for. Now we have basically two uh, element operator, which is exists and types. Exist operator basically returns documents that have a specific field. Now, if I let let us take an example. Let's say I have an uh, you know collection employees, and I want to find the employee age as a field i want to find if there is a field called employee age and his age is greater than or equals to 35 so i've taken this example which is db.employees find employee age exists true 
GTE 35. So if there is any field in our collection of employee age and is greater than 25 or greater than 35, it will retrieve those documents. And similarly, we have the type document, type operator, which returns document if field is of only a specific type, specified type. Now, uh, if I take an example here, let's say if I'm trying to find a field uh, employee age again, and it is of double, uh, double integer type. So if I want a particular, you know, field data type, I can use the type uh, operator here. So this was, that was all about element operator guys. And let us move ahead and finally discuss one of the main used operator that is array operators. Array operators in MongoDB are basically used to query documents that include a field of arrays. Now we basically again have three different types of operators used in uh, MongoDB. The first one is all operator. It returns documents from a collection if it matches all the values in the specified array. Next, we have the size operator. It returns documents from the collection to match an array with a provided number of elements in it. Next and finally, we have lm match, which returns those documents that match specified condition within each array element. Now, I, I know it is a bit of confusing, so let us just move ahead and understand with an example here. Consider the same uh, example again, uh, where we have three documents here. Now, for first example, I've taken the all operator which is an array operator so what i'm trying to find is i'm trying to find a element of value which has you know a notebook and a paper so the query is followed as db.order.find orders item all notebook and paper so if you look into the image i think we have only uh two documents where we have this fields uh having notebook and paper that is the first customer and second customer if you look into the item name we have notebook and paper in the first uh, document and second document also we have item name notebook and paper so it will retrieve these two documents and next we have the size so the size basically retrieves the number of array elements that you want in your resultant set now the query is followed as db.order.find where order items is of size 4 now if you look into three all the three documents that are present here we have only one such document where it has four elements now if you look at the first document of customer rahul order items we have four different uh, you know fields that is he has placed an order on notebook play, paper general and postcard now in contrast if you look at to the other two uh, documents where we have only notebook paper and postcard for pranav and we have only notebook and postcard for kirti so which is against or uh, which does not satisfy the size operator so it basically retrieves only the first one which has four elements or fields so i think that was all about the array operators guys i hope you uh, understood about all the query and projection operators and its different types now again we have uh, several mini operators like geospatial uh, comment operator and so many but which are not that significant in its usage uh, but anyways if you want us to cover uh, in our further tutorials let us know wherein we'll uh, try to cover a more uh, you know detailed version of it with a hands-on experience uh, with the MongoDB database as well and finally let us discuss uh, what is update operator guys and basically mongodb offers a variety of field update operators to update the values of the fields and documents matching the specified condition so it is basically similar to that of ql dml command which is an update uh, command which is used to used to update the values in the columns now similarly in mongodb there might be a possibility that you have to update some values and that is where we have the update field operators now there are again various such of update operators so let us just go in through one by one we have first one as current date which is used to set the value of a field to current date either a date or a timestamp next we have inc which is basically increment it is used to increment the value of the field by the specified amount next we have the min and max which is used to update the field if the specified value is less than the existing field value or it is greater than the existing field value Next, we have the MUL, which is uh, a full form of multiply. It is used to multiply the value of the field by the specified amount. And finally, we have the rename. As a name suggests, this operator is used to rename a field uh, within a, a document. So that was all about the operators in MongoDB, guys. 
I think we have covered most, almost all the important update operators that are used frequently on a general basis. I think this is quite enough for you to perform all the complex operations that you undertake uh, to, to retrieve certain, uh, you know, documents or values in your database. What are regular expressions in MongoDB? Regular expressions are used to match specific patterns in a document. It is basically nothing but finding strings within a document. Now, it's possible that you won't always know the precise field value to search for when retrieving documents from a collection. So, in order to help with data retrieval based on search values that match a specific pattern instead of the whole uh, word or a string, regular expressions can be used. It comes with multiple options also, so we can customize our query to check if a field contains a string or not. Now, why we use regular expressions? Now, there are many reasons, but these are some of the important uh, factors on why we use regular expressions, just like in any other uh, languages we use, right? So, even uh, we discussed regular expressions in SQL also in our previous tutorial. So, if you haven't checked that out, make sure you uh, check that out on our channel on SQL playlist. Now, the first reason is obvious that it provides patterns or a sequence of characters for matching text and defined search patterns. Now, like I said, instead of searching the whole uh, value in a particular field, you can just write a simple pattern that you are aiming to search for. Now, it retrieves any unidentified field in a document easily as well. And finally, it queries databases to find a smaller subset of data within a collection. So instead of retrieving all the fields again in a document, you just you can uh, retrieve only a portion or a part of data from that collection using regular expressions. Now this can be achieved with the help of the regex operator. Now what is regex operator? The regex operator provides regular expression capabilities for pattern matching strings in the queries. So in, in simpler terms, using this operator, one can search for the given string in a specific collection. So if the exact field value is unknown that a, a user is looking for in the document, this operator can turn it handy. Let us now understand the syntax of the regex operator. Now we have various uh, different types of syntax. Uh, the first one is a generic syntax where we are using a delimiter, which is uh, the syntax is followed as db.collectionName.find and within the parenthesis mention the field name that uh, you are using that you want to find a subset of data or the uh, you know, a specific pattern that you are searching for and then mention the regex keyword and then the pattern. Now if you look at uh, the pattern, inside the pattern I have mentioned the delimiter. So which basically means that you can like find any pattern of a string value. Let's say if I want to find a person's name uh, who has, let's say, RA in their name. So I can just uh, simply put a delimiter and inside that I can put a, put the two, uh, you know, strings, which is RA. So for example, it can match Rahul and, and any other names uh, in the same way as well. So in that way, you can use the regex operator without using any... Uh, without using actually uh, the regex pattern. Next, we have another, uh, you know, syntax of the same uh, regex operator, which is mention the field and mention the regex operator using the dollar sign. And let's say if you want to find a specific character. So we use circumflex or to the power, uh, which is a meta character to match a string at the beginning. And we use a dollar sign at the end to match a particular string that ends with a particular value. And next, we also have uh, another, uh, you know, type of syntax for uh, regex operator, which is field, mention the field name and the regex keyword and mention the pattern. It can be anything. It can be a generic one where you can use delimiters or you can even use uh, the circumflex or the uh, dollar sign. And apart from that, we can mention the options as well. Now, we have various different options like S, uh, I, X and M. Now what the S option does is it allows the dot character to match all the characters including the new line characters that you are entering in a document. Now we use X as an option to ignore all white space characters in the regex pattern. Next we have I which is used to match both upper as well as lower case patterns in the string. And finally we use M in order to specifically search for the circumflex and the dollar sign inside the string. So if these are not used, these anchors match at the string's end or beginning. Now, this is a bit confusion for you guys. So let us understand, uh, you'll understand it in a more better way when we get into the execution part. So I hope you understood what is regex operator. So let's just understand how regex operator works with a simple example here. Now, let's say I have uh, a collection 
let's say its name is orders and within the orders collection i have three different documents here of three uh, different customers like rahul pranav and kirti now let's say if i want to find uh, you know the customer name who has ra in their name now it can be at the starting it can be middle or it can be elsewhere or the, in the end i mean so for that i'm just using a delimiter uh, and i'm mentioning two uh, string values that is r and a so it will only match rahul because we have ra and similarly we have pranav who is also having r and a uh, strings uh, characters in in their name we also have kirti but she doesn't have ra so it doesn't match so we only have will get the output of only these two documents now similarly let's say if i take another example wherein i am writing another query which is db.orders.find and i'm mentioning the field name payment mode and i'm finding for a particular string here which starts with ca which is the payment mode in the document should be should start with ca now we have payment mode as card cash and again we also have uh, card and cash are basically the two types of payment mode so it will basically retrieve all the three documents so let us now understand another example here now let's say i've written a query which is db.orders find payment mode uh, sorry uh, i think there is a mistake here uh, so let's say if the orders item uh, i'm taking the field as order item and i'm mentioning the regex c word again and here i'm mentioning dollar ok that means the item name in the orders item the item name should end with ok so we have different item names here like notebook paper general and postcard now only one item name which is notebook which has ok in the ending right so the dollar symbol basically matches the string in the end so since it has ok uh, the two uh, specific strings in the end of the uh, you know document so it will only match the notebook so since we have notebook in all the three documents again we can retrieve the three uh, documents in our final output so this is how regex operator basically works so let us now directly jump into mongodb shell for execution part and see how it gets executed with some more different examples so as you can see uh, the database mongodb shell has started so let us just use the uh, show dbs in order to display the uh, data, uh, database that are present so we have the simply code one which we'll be using again so i'm just using simply code one and let us now see the collections inside this we have the employee collection so let us just use that so in order to find the data that is present we will use the db dot collection which is employee dot find command so it will display all the documents that are present so firstly let us discuss a simple example where we'll uh, simply uh, use the delimiter operator in order to find you know the first name of the employees in our, our documents whose name can have li okay so then uh, we're just providing a pattern here which is li so the query would be db dot employee dot find open the brackets square brackets and within the flower brackets mention the field name that is first name and then mention the delimiter which is this and our, our pattern that we are trying to find is li right so mention li and again close the uh, brackets and enter so all right so we can see some of the documents have been retrieved let's say if you take the first document here we have the first name valli and his full name is patabala so you can see we have characters li at the end here so similarly if you take the next document we have shelly Sim again we have li at the end and if you take this example we have julia whose name has li characters in the between and next we also have williams who has li in between again so these are the five documents that are received so irrespective of whether irrespective of the position in which they are it basically retrieves all the uh, documents that has li as a substring in the uh, document so in this way you can use uh, the regex operator also simply without using the regex uh, you know keyword so let us now understand another example guys so let us say uh, i'm trying to find a specific pattern where i want to find the first name of the employee whose name starts with sh so in that case what i'll do i'll write a simple query as dot db.employee.find 
open the brackets mention the uh, field name which is first name and again now we'll write the regex keyword here since we are particularly finding a pattern which says that the name of the employee the first name of the employee should start with only s and h so mention the dollar symbol mention the regex keyword and semicolon and then within the uh, double quotes mention the words or the uh, pattern that you are trying to searching for so i am keeping it as s and h so let us close the inverted commas let us close the flower brackets and and finally the square brackets i think we need to mention two flower brackets so i think we are good to go so let us just execute the statement all right so as you can see in the resultant set we have some documents being retrieved so firstly if you look at the uh, document of this one whose the employee whose first name is shelly so it's starting with sh next we also have uh, employee id 123 whose first name is shanta again starting with sh and similarly we have employee id 205 whose first name shelly starting with sh again so you can use the regex operator in this way to only find a particular pattern now let us take another scenario here so if you look at this previous example now we are mentioning uh, the pattern as capital s and h so it is case sensitive right so it is only displaying the records of those employees whose uh, first name is starting with capital s and the second letter which is small h so let's say in in a different scenario we want uh, all the employees name whose name is having uh, let's say capital s as well as well as capital h so in that case you need to use the options uh, you know command so let's say again if i am trying to find the first name of an employee uh, whose uh, first name starts with j u so it can be capital j or small u so in that case you need to use the options and the option that we are going to take is which is basically i so i'm just going to uh, execute this statement so just follow it with me db dot employee dot find and within the uh, square brackets open the square brackets and the flower brackets first name and open the flower brackets again mention the dollar sign mention the regex keyword again semicolon now the pattern that i'm searching is ju it can be anything so we are just going for case insensitive here now for that we have to basically use the options command here so mention the dollar sign options is the keyword and mention the colon and within the bracket uh, inverted quotes mention i so what basically this i does is it will retrieve all the records irrespective of whether they are in uh, upper case or lower case so let us just close the flower brackets again and let us execute it so as you can see we have only uh, one uh, record or one document that is being retrieved which is of julia nair now if you look at the command that we have taken is small j and small u but in the resultant output the uh, the the document is that which has been retrieved is capital j and small u so in this way you can use the options uh, you know command you have to find all the documents irrespective of whether they are in a smaller case or upper case so that was one another scenario guys so finally let us look into another scenario where you want to find you know a specific document starting with a particular uh, substring or sub or a pattern or a value and ending with a, pro, a particular value so firstly let us take uh, an example of uh, you know this document wherein we'll search for the job id which starts with ac so in that case the following query would be db dot employee dot find mention the flower brackets so we are taking as job id which is our field name mention the regex keyword again 
So the pattern that we are searching for is so circumflex. You have to mention this uh, symbol which is a meta character, and the job ID should start with A and C. So it is must. So this condition basically checks for all the job IDs, the name of job IDs starting with A C. So let us just close this and enter. All right. So in our resultant output, we have two different uh, documents present. So if you look at the first document, we have job ID as A C M G R, and next to the second job ID, we have A C Accountant. So this was another scenario where we are using, uh, you know, where we are finding documents. Only uh, with using with the help of the regex operator and a search uh, pattern, wherein we are only finding the job ID of those employees whose uh, job ID name starts with AC. So that brings us to the end of today's session, guys. I hope uh, you've understood uh, all about MongoDB regex operators and how to use them. Did. Now, projection in MongoDB is a special type of feature, guys, that is used to select only a certain part of the data without selecting the entire data present inside the document. So, more on that soon. But before we get started, uh, let us discuss the agenda for today's session. First. We start the tutorial by understanding what is MongoDB projection and then we will understand why we use projection in Mongo. And after that, we will have a how projection works in MongoDB and its syntax usage. And next, we will discuss projection queries with the help of certain examples. And finally, we will execute those examples in MongoDB server. I hope I made myself clear with the agenda. Right. What is MongoDB projection? Now, MongoDB projection helps to return the specific fields from the query or you can say from the MongoDB collection. Now, by default, when we query any collection in MongoDB, we iterate all the fields in documents. So, as you know, MongoDB is a schemaless database which is a NoSQL database and has a different structure to that of relational database. Now, the tables in relational database are called as collection, rows are called columns. It, we may not want all the records from the collection, but a few of them in the resultant set. So in that case, we use MongoDB projection using projection document, which is used to limit the amount or fields in the data present in that document. So in a nutshell, if I would say projection means selecting only the necessary data rather than selecting the whole of the data present in the document now similarly add to that of where conditional clause that we use in sql suppose if uh, i have a document which has 10 fields and you need to show them why we use a popular no sql and open source document oriented database which allows for highly scalable and flexible document structure which is faster than relational database because of its efficient storage and indexing uh, techniques and being a no sql database it is designed to handle large amounts of data so DB will process a lot of unnecessary data and you want when you want to retrieve specific information from a large number of records. So to overcome this problem, we use projection query. Now, some of the reasons now when using projection to remove unused or unused fields, the MongoDB server will have to fetch each document into its memory and then filter the results to return. Uh, actually reduce the memory usage, but can save the significant network band for query results depending on the data model and the fields projected in your documents and it only returns indexed query results without fetching the full documents now which is basically the main use case of projection which basically eliminates all the fields that are unnecessary for the user and particular fields within the document then he can use the projection query operator and finally filter the data without impact the overall database performance now by, by default is return all fields and matching documents so if you need all the fields returning full documents is going to be more efficient than having a server manipulate the result projection however then to improve performance and uh, that is one of the main uh, consideration when we are using MongoDB projection. So these are some of the reasons uh, on why we use MongoDB projection. 
All right, let us now understand how MongoDB projection works. Now, in general, to retrieve the data from the uh, documents, we use the find method, uh, which retrieves data from all the fields within a document without any filtering. So let us now understand the syntax of MongoDB projection operator. Now the syntax is followed as db.collectionName.find and within the parenthesis mention the uh, field names that is I'm taking here field 1 and its corresponding value field 2 and value 2. Now the values that I'm talking about is if field value is set as 1 which is a boolean expression uh, which is equals to us it will basically show the data in that field field value is if the boolean expression it hides the data in the field so let us understand this with an example guys i the, only then you will get a clear understanding of it now i have let's say a collection uh, of uh, certain documents let's say the collection name is orders and i have three such documents here which has various fields like id customer address payment mode email uh, order total and order items. Now, if I want to display all these documents, uh, what I'll do, I'll basically write a query using the find method, which is followed as db.orders.find. So it will basically retrieve all the documents without uh, restricting any of the fields that are present in our collection. Now, let's say if I want only particular field that I want to display in my resultant set. Now, let's say if I have uh, the payment mode and the order total field and I want only them to display in the resultant set without displaying all the fields that are present in each of the document. So in that case, I'll write a query as db.orders.find and inside the parenthesis, I'll mention payment mode colon one and order total is one. Now, since I've set the uh, field value to one, it will only retrieve those values and similarly for order total also, it will retrieve only that particular field value. So this will basically be the output of our uh, resultant set. That is, it will show the ID object, the payment mode of the uh, three documents and similarly the order total of the three documents. Now, by default, we have the underscore ID, which is a default value, which we cannot uh, change it. So if, if at all, if you want to override and change it, you can mention it to zero. Now, let's say uh, I'm taking the same example here. Now, instead of just writing payment mode to one and order total to one, I'm adding another, uh, you know, constraint or I'm using, I'm projecting another field, which is of ID and I'm setting it to zero. Now, if you see in a result and set, we do not have the ID field. So in this way, you can use projection in order to restrict certain fields from your resultant table set without actually retrieving all the data that is present in your documents. So let us now jump into Mongo shell and execute this example and see how it is working. So as you can see, uh, Mongo shell has been started. Now, I don't want to get into the details of all of it. Uh, we'll cover uh, in a separate tutorial where we'll understand how to create uh, a database and how to create a collection in MongoDB separately, guys. Stay tuned to the channel for that. So we'll just cover uh, how we'll implement MongoDB uh, projection with certain examples here. Now, the basically, uh, in order to retrieve the databases that are present in our MongoDB, we have to use the command as show DBS. So it will list out all the databases that are present. We have admin, config, local, and simply code one. Now I have already created uh, the simply code one in hindsight before itself, so that we can save a bit of time. And I've also created a collection in that. So before you see the collection and the documents that are present in it, you have to use uh, the simply code database. So for that, we'll use the simply code one as our command. So as you can see, it is show, uh, saying that switch to DB simply code. Now, mm -hmm. if you want to find all the collections that are present in database, you have to uh, basically write as sh sh show collections. So it will list out all the collections in that. Now, as you can see, I have a collection that is of employee here. So for example, uh, we'll consider this same uh, collection. Now I have this below collection named as employee with uh, let's say certain number of documents in that. Now if I query the collection in Mongo the shell, I, if I write a command to it to return all the documents or fields from the matching documents by default, it will basically it will return all the documents. So for that, I will use a statement like which is of db dot 
mention the uh, collection name that is employee dot find so find method is used to list out all the documents so you can just see that we have a lot of documents in our resultant set uh let me just scroll and uh, go to the top so as you can see we have different documents a number of documents and it has different fields like id employee id first name last name email phone number hiring date job id salary manager id department id and so on so you can see we have a lot of documents so let's just count how many documents we have uh, for that you can use the uh, count statement so db.employee.count so you can see we have a total of 50 documents present in our employee collection now if you look at our resultant set after we used the find method you can see it has returned all the fields of the document from the collection now but what if i want to fetch only a particular field like let's say first name last name email or even their salary how will we do that now the answer is using mongodb projection we will project specific fields to return from the query now, so before proceeding to MongoDB projection, guys, let's recall how we fetch certain fields from, you know, a traditional SQL database so that we can have a clear understanding. Now, let's say, suppose the collection uh, employee is a table in SQL and let's say all the fields like employee ID, first name, last name, so on are its columns. Now, I want to fetch the only, uh, the let's say, first name, last name uh, from the table. So in that case, what we'll write, we'll basically write a query as select first name comma last name from a table that is employee right i hope uh, i'm clear with this so it is similar to that in mongodb wherein we are executing this query as uh, using projection so let us now see how we do projection here so let's just uh, consider as an example here now let's say i'm writing a command as db.employee.find and let's say if I want to fix all the documents uh, of all the employees whose department ID is 30. So in that case, what I'll do is department. So it is says a case sensitive guy. So make sure uh, you write in the capitals or whatever the field is written as. So mention the column and within the double quotes mention 30. So close the uh, parenthesis and close the square brackets as well. So it will basically list out, as you can see, all the documents of the employees whose department ID is 30. So we can see we have employee ID uh, of the employee 114, 115, 116, 117, 118 and 119 whose all their department is 30. Now again, even if I'm returning a particular a field or a condition, it is also, you know, retrieving all the fields from all the documents. Now, I don't want that. Now, I want only a particular field. So, what in that case, we will project certain fields without returning all the fields from our documents. So, let us see how it works. So, the query is followed as db. Mention the collection name employee. Find open the uh, square brackets and let's say uh, I want to retrieve only the first name first name so I'm setting it as one as we discussed earlier if you want to uh, retrieve the particular field you have to mention one and similarly I want to mention I want to retrieve the last name as well last name column and one and also let us take another field let's say uh, salary right we have salary also let us just retrieve that as well one all right close the parenthesis and close the square brackets and enter so we do not have any output here guys that is because we haven't mentioned the parenthesis uh, before the find method so let me just uh, copy paste and we'll see how it is So before, after the find, we'll have to mention the uh, parenthesis again. And then I think we're good to go now. 
So as you can see in our resultant set, now since we have only mentioned the first name, last name and the salary, it is only displaying the results, only the, only certain fields that is the first name, last name and salary in our resultant set. Now by default, this ID object is, uh, you know, retrieved uh, with the uh, command. So if you want to eliminate that as well, you can uh, keep the ID to zero. So let us just uh, execute that. So let me just copy this again. Paste it and mention another uh, criteria that is the field. Now the field should be the field that is of ID should be zero. So close the parenthesis. So let us just execute this and we'll see how it is the output. So as you can see now only we have the first name, last name and salary of all the employees. So we have just basically eliminated the object ID as well. So if you want uh, only uh, the first name, last name and salary in your output, you can just uh, mention the field names and mention one if you want to display in a resultant set. And if you want to uh, display, if you do not want to display those certain fields, you can mention as zero. So in this way, you can use uh, the projection query operator in order to project only certain fields from all the documents. So yes, I guess that was uh, all about the uh, MongoDB projection, guys. Uh, now, projection query operator can be quite useful when you are handling a lot of unstructured data. Let's say if the database has like 10,000 or even a million records. In such case, if you want to return a specific number of fields only, now a document can have a, any number of fields like 10, 20, 30, 40 and so on. So in some cases, if you want to retrieve or uh, specify only certain number of fields in your resultant set, in that case, projection operator can be quite useful. And I know it is quite confusing at the beginning. So it just need, you just need more practice to understand this in a more better way. So that brings us to the end of today's session, guys. Uh, I hope you have understood all the topics and uh, concepts covered in. So sorting and limiting are one of the necessary database operations. It helps to simplify and the readability of the data and sort the data as per the user requirement. Now, when you're working on huge chunks of data in a database, both sorting and limit operations can be quite a uh, handful to understand and visualize data in order to get meaningful information out of it and retrieve only the specified number of records accordingly as per your need. So in this tutorial, you will learn all about the sorting and limiting concepts and how it can be implemented in MongoDB database. So before getting into the execution part, let us quickly understand what is sorting in MongoDB. Sorting is the ordering of data in an increasing and decreasing order based on set of relationships between the various data items present in the database. Now sorting can be done on any entities having information like ID, name, age, address, or any data type having numbers or string values. Now sorting improves the readability and consistency of the data displayed from the database. So in a nutshell, sorting is done just like in any other database or programming language that involves arranging data into some meaningful information to make it easier to understand, analyze or visualize. Let us understand its syntax. The syntax is simple. It is followed as db.collectionNameFind.sort and within the parenthesis mention the field and the order. So let us understand how it is. Now for sorting your MongoDB documents, you need to make use of the sort method. So this method will accept a document that has a list of fields and the order for sorting. So for indicating the sorting order, you have to set the value one or minus one with the specific entity based on which the ordering will be set and displayed. So if the order is, uh, is one, it will basically uh, sort the records in ascending order that is in an increasing manner. And if you mention the order as minus one, it will basically sort sort the uh, data in a descending order that is in a decreasing manner. So one indicates organizing data in ascending order while minus one indicates organizing in descending order. So that was all about the sorting in MongoDB. So let us now understand how sort method works in MongoDB with an example. 
now consider uh, collection name orders now if i just run a uh, command db.orders.find i'll uh, get this uh, collection which has three documents so it has uh, details of three customers like rahul uh, pranav and kirti right so let us now run a query where i'm using a sort method here which is followed as db.orders.find and within the parenthesis i am basically uh, projecting the query uh, id so that we will not have it in our resultant set so and also i'm sorting the data based on the customer here so i'm mentioning customer as one so that means it will basically order in the uh, ascending order so this will be the output guys now the output is now first we'll have the customer uh, details of kirti because the letter alphabet k uh, starts first in the alphabets uh, from a to z next we have pranav which starts with p and then we have rahul which starts with r so this is a simple example on how sorting method works in mongodb now let's say if i want to sort multiple fields in a collection so in what way will i be able to do it now let us consider an example here let's say i have uh, a pet info collection here and we have various records or you can say documents and we have uh, like various fields like name of the pet type and its weight now let's say if i want to sort multiple fields uh, within this collection so i would write a query as db dot the collection name which is pet info dot find dot sort and next i am sorting this collection based on its type its weight and finally the id so type i'm giving it as one which will basically do in an ascending order which is in an increasing manner whereas i'm doing uh, the sorting on the weight field as minus one which is in decreasing order that is in descending order that is from highest to lowest and then i'm also uh, sorting the field uh, id as uh, ascending order that is i'm giving it as one so when i run this command in mongodb shell this will uh, this would what be a basically basically the uh, output of the collection right so let us just understand how it is working now first i am uh, sorting the data based on the type now the sorting is done based on the priority that is given that is first you have given the uh, sorting input as type then weight and the id so it will run the sorting based on this sequence only so if you look at the first uh, record of the document we have uh, the cat data that is the we have three uh, records of cats uh, having the same uh, type right so we have lily millie and oliver which uh, is of type cat so basically it will arrange those in ascending order since we have c which is the starting or the uh, alphabetical order order of the alphabets uh, which comes uh, the c comes first then we have dog next we have kangaroo now since we have uh, the same records or the same uh, record of cat that is repeating then it will check weight now since we have given weight as minus 1 that is from descending order that is why we have the record of lily whose weight is 12 at the first place next the uh, details of millie whose weight is 8 and finally we have oliver whose weight is 7 so this means that if there are multiple pets of the same type those pets are sorted by their weight in descending order now if there are multiple pets with both the same type as well as weight then those pets are sorted by the id field which we have given to sort them in ascending order now if we hadn't included the id field in the sorting process then those pets of the same type and the uh, sorting process then those pets of the same type and weight could appear in any order guys so without having a sort field on a unique field such as the id field it would be entirely possible that uh, the result would come back in different order when we run the query each time so i hope you understood how the sorting works when we want to uh, sort multiple fields within a document so let us now understand what is limit in mongodb the limit method in mongodb is used to limit the number of records this method takes only one number type of argument which is basically the number of documents that you want to display in your resultant set similarly which we used to do in sql also wherein if you have like thousands of records you use the limit clause in order to restrict a certain number of records and specify only certain records in our resultant set now the syntax is followed as db dot collection name dot find limit and value now in the value you can give as per your choice let's say if i give the value as 5 it will uh, display the first 5 records 
uh, or the documents from that collection and similarly you can also uh, use the projection where you can uh, display the fields as per your requirement by giving the values and also the limit value and simultaneously you can also sort the data and the limit uh, and limit those uh, collections or limit those documents in the collections as well and the syntax is followed as db dot collection name dot find dot sort field order you can give uh, multiple field names uh, in the sorting uh, you know parenthesis and mention the limit method and you can give the values that is number of uh, records that you want to fetch in your resultant table so let us now understand again how a limit works in mongodb now again let us consider uh, the orders collection here now let's say if i want to limit these collections now if i want to retrieve only the first two documents from this then the query would be db.orders.find limit and within the parenthesis i'm mentioning as two so this would uh, is this would be the output wherein you will get the details of rahul and pranav which are basically the first two documents which are present in our collection order all right now what if you want to sort and as well as limit the data now what i'm doing here is i'm basically projecting the id field so i'm keeping it as zero so that we do not have this in our resultant set next i'm sorting uh, this collection orders based on the customers so i'm giving customer as one which will basically res uh, re sort the uh, documents of the customers in an ascending manner that is from uh, lowest to highest and then i'm limiting these documents for only two values so uh, when i run this query this would be the output so customer i'm basically sorting in ascending order so first we'll have kirti and similarly next we have pranav in an alphabetical order which is following the uh, alphabetical condition starting from a to z and since i'm also using the limit clause here up to two values it will only retrieve the first two values so this is how limit works in mongodb guys i hope you've got a better understanding on how limit works you know consider the, considering this simple examples so let us now jump into mongodb shell uh, with a proper execution and see how it gets executed so as you can see mongodb shell has started and let us consider the simply code database again so let us write the command as use simply code one which will basically uh, select the simply code one database and let us see what are the collections present in it and we have the employee collection so let us just retrieve the data that is present in this so i am using the find method dp dot mention the collection name and mention the find method so it will retrieve all the data that is present in it so we have uh, data like employee id first name last name email phone number hiring date job id salary manager id department id so firstly let us discuss some example choosing the sorting uh, technique guys uh, i think we already have uh, employee ids in uh, alphabet i mean in sorted order so let us just take another field uh, let us sort the uh, manager id field here so the following query would be db dot employee dot find mention the sort and within the sort mention the uh, field name which is manager id so I am giving uh, the order as one, which will uh, sort the order in ascending order. So close the parenthesis and let us execute this. So basically you can type it to retrieve all the records that are present. So let us just understand how it is working. Uh, let me just scroll back. We have so many records guys. So. It's better we use the project field uh, so that we can have a clear understanding. So next time we'll use that. So this is our query which we have executed. Now, now since I've sorted the manager ID in ascending order, uh, which I have given the order value as one, as you can see, uh, since we do not have any manager ID for this employee, uh, Stephen King. Next, we have the manager ID as 100. And next, similarly, we have 100, 100, 100, 100 and so on and next we have 101 and 108 so as you can clearly see 114 as well uh, so you can clearly see that our data has been sorted in ascending order when we are using this sorting technique so let us now understand how we can do that with another you know sequence that is let us keep it as minus one so in that case what it will be is db dot employee find 
So I'm going to project some of the fields because uh, I don't want all these uh, you know unnecessary fields in my resultant set. So I'll just uh, opt them out. So I don't want ID field. So I'm keeping it as zero, and I want first name my resultant set. So I'm keeping first name. Next, I want last name as well. Keeping it as one. And next, uh, last name. Uh, and let's say uh, finally manager ID only. Okay, manager. ID. Let's keep it as one. Close the parenthesis. Now mention the sort uh, keyword. Open the parenthesis. Mention the field that you want to sort in the way that is manager ID. So it is important that you mention manager ID in the projection field, guys. So if you do not mention and if you are sorting manager ID without uh, explicitly calling it. So you will get an error, it won't uh, display. So it is important that you mention the manager ID in the projection field also. Close the brackets. I think we are good to go. Let us just uh, recheck our code. Uh, okay, 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 right. So I think there is an error in the manager ID, guys. So let me just copy this. You know. So you might have a technical error, so make sure you give the correct name of the field's name, otherwise you'll get an error. So I think we are good to go now. So let us just execute this statement and we'll see the output. So as you can clearly see that in a resultant set, uh, we are only fetching the first name, last name and manager ID since we have projected some of the fields uh, in a resultant set. And I'm sorting the data based on the, uh, based on the manager ID field and since I've given it as one, it will... Uh, sort the data in ascending order that is from lowest to highest so if you can see the first manager id is 100 so list of all the employees whose manager id is 100 has been shown next we have 101 103 uh, similarly if you type it we'll have the rest of the records as well so you can see next 108 114 120 and so on 122 123 201 205 so in this way you can sort multi uh, various documents in order of how you want to display or show them in your resultant set all right i hope you have understood this till now uh, let us now sort multiple field guys so let me just copy this query now again like as we discussed earlier in uh, in our presentation sorting multiple fields is not a big task it is just simply that you have to add the uh, multiple fields here so manager id as well as let's take salary also so what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort salary in uh, descending order. So I'm mentioning it as minus one. And also let us uh, project the field here as well. So salary has one. All right. So let us execute the statement and we'll see the output. So as you can see in a resultant set, after sorting the data uh, based on the fields of manager ID and salary, if we look at uh, the output, now since we have sorted our manager ID in ascending order, since we have specified one as the order, it will uh, basically sort the order in ascending order, that is from lowest to highest. And salary, we have mentioned the order as minus one. So it will do the opposite of that. That is, it will sort the data in descending order, that is from highest to lowest. So if you look at the resultant output here, guys, now since we have no manager ID for this, which is uh, taken as, let's say, the least value or zero. So it is displaying first. Next, we have the salary minus one. So if you look at to the manager IDs uh, of the next, uh, like let's say four. Now since we have the manager ID 100, which is the lowest value, and we have four same or four or more uh, same values, then it will move on to the next priority that we have given to sort our uh, document that is salary. So first, now we have 82,000 as our salary that is from descending order. It will uh, basically sort the data in uh, descending order that is from highest to lowest. So we have 82,000, next we have 80,000, next we have 79,800, next we have 6,500, 58,000, Next, we have 1700, 1700, similarly, and so on. So, in this way, you can uh, sort multiple fields using the sort method as well. 
I hope you've understood how the uh, sort method works uh, in MongoDB, guys. Uh, using the single field or using multiple field sorting, how you can uh, basically arrange the data based on your need. All right, let us now uh, discuss some examples using the limit clause. Again, limit clause is uh, very easy, guys. It is used to restrict or specify only certain number of records in a resultant set. And the uh, syntax is followed as db dot mention the employee name, db dot employee dot find dot let's say limit. Uh, I want only five records of the uh, you know employee collection, so I'm mentioning as five as my value. And when you enter, uh, when you <coughs> press the enter, you can see the resultant output has only five uh, five documents: one, two, three, four, and five. So this is a simple example of how you can use limit. Now you can also use the limit using the sort uh, method as well. So let us just copy this, and we will see how it gets executed. So let me just paste it here. Now I'm just adding the limit uh, method here. I want only let's say the first four. Okay. Now what I'm doing is I'm first basically projecting some of the fields that is the uh, required number of fields that I want to fetch in my resultant set. Then I'm basically sorting this documents in the uh, manner of manager ID salary in order of ascending order for manager id since we have given one and in the order of descending order for salary since we have given at minus one and i'm limiting the resultant uh you know output to only four records so when i press enter you can see we have only the first four records so we have no manager id again next we if we consider the manager id here 100 for adam fripp whose manager id is 100 and next two also we have the same manager id here guys so now the next uh, thing is it will go on to the salary like we discussed earlier. The salary is uh, sorted here in descending order from highest to lowest. So we have 82,000, next we have 80,000, next we have 79,000. So similarly if you can uh, let's say let's limit to an another example let's say if I am limiting to 10. Alright so in that case it will basically fetch the first 10 records. So as you can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 six seven eight nine ten so all of them are basically uh, the records of the employees whose manager id is 100 and it is basically arranging all the details of the employees whose salary in ascending in descending order that is in the order of minus one which we have specified so that brings us to the end of today's session guys i hope you all have understood all about the sort and the uh, limit method that we use in more. a good indexing strategy is essential for ensuring that your you know database returns your results as quickly as possible now just like any other relational databases where we perform indexing similarly indexing in mongodb is also a way to organize information so that the database engine can quickly find the relevant results more on that soon but before we get started let us first discuss the agenda for today's session in today's tutorial, we'll be going through different concepts wherein we'll cover what are indexes in MongoDB and then we'll understand why is indexing used in MongoDB and up next, we'll discuss how does indexing work and then we'll understand how to create an index and after that, we'll be going through different types of indexes used in MongoDB and finally, we'll end this session uh, with syntax and execution in MongoDB shell. I hope I made myself clear with the agenda part. So let us just go ahead and understand what are indexes in MongoDB. So what are indexes in MongoDB? Now MongoDB indexes a special data structure on which the data is on which the index is created to hold the data of specific fields of document. Now in the absence of uh, you know fields in the fields and uh, indexing in MongoDB, there is a need to scan every collection document to select those. Uh, that match the query statement. Now this scan requires MongoDB to process a large volume of data and is highly efficient. So if there is no indexing done on a collection of let's say thousands of documents, your query will keep finding specific documents in order. However, MongoDB would limit and make it clear the number of documents to be searched within your collection if your documents have indexes. So with the help of indexes, when they are applied at the collection level, it can store the value of a specific field or set of fields ordered by the value of the field. So those were that is what indexes are in MongoDB. Let us now understand why is indexing used in MongoDB. 
Now, MongoDB's indexes make it unnecessary to perform a collection scan. Now, from that, what I mean is, a collection scan basically involves looking through every document in a collection that matches to your query that you have returned to find a particular uh, document or a field that you are trying to return. So, when you provide an indexing on documents, let's say on a database that you have like uh, thousands or 50,000 records, you can just simply put an index which will improve the search efficiency as well. Now, any collection in MongoDB can have one or more indexes and those indexes can be made on one or multiple fields and even though a MongoDB database can hold a lot of data, you need a good indexing strategy to quickly and effectively access the data you require from it. And finally, indexing is a necessary operation in MongoDB which automatically brings search efficiency in various executions of statements. All right, moving ahead, let us now understand how to create an index. Now, creating an index in MongoDB is done by using the create index method. So let us just quickly go through the syntax. Uh, so the syntax is followed as db.collectionName.createIndex is the keyword and make sure the i in index is capital otherwise it will throw an error. Within the parenthesis mention the field name that you want to create an index on and next we have one or minus one. So now this following syntax shows how to add an index to our collection. So let us assume we have you know same uh, like employee collection which is an example which has various fields name like employee id name salary or so on but for this i'm creating an index on employee name and i'm specifying as one now the one parameter indicates that when the index is created with the employee name field value they should be sorted in ascending order now please you have to note that it is different from the you know hashtag id which is the by default id which is uh, you know created when you are creating a document so the id field is used to uniquely identify each document in the collection which is created automatically in the collection by mongodb and the document will now be sorted as per the employee name and not the id field so i hope you've uh, understood how to create an example you will get a clear cut idea when we go into the execution part in mongodb so Make sure to watch the video till the end guys. Alright, moving ahead, let us now discuss the types of indexes used in MongoDB. Now there are mainly three types of indexes in MongoDB. The first one is single field index. Next we have the compound, compound index and finally we have the multi-key index. Let us discuss uh, about each of them in detail now. Now we know that a field in a document in a collection can be indexed individually. So as the name suggests, single field index is used to create an index or only a single field in a document. So below is an example and the syntax for single field index uh, on a uh, tape on a collection named as orders. So the syntax is db.collectionName.createIndex and within the parenthesis field name. So you can either index them in the order of ascending or descending by mentioning one or minus one. So I've considered an example here of orders a collection where I've created an index on a field called price and I'm mentioning as minus one. So it will basically index in descending order that is from highest to lowest. Next we have the compound index. Now a compound index is formed when multiple fields are combined into a one single index. So a compound index is generally an index that holds a reference to multiple fields within a collection. So for example I have taken another uh, collection i mean the same collection of orders and i'm creating an index where i'm uh, creating index for multiple fields here which is for price and for customer name so again the syntax is same which is db dot mention the collection name dot create index which is the keyword and within the parenthesis you can give as much as many as you know field names to your name to your sorry to your collection so i hope you have understood what is compound index as well so and finally we have what is uh, multi-key index. Now MongoDB supports a multi-key index for each element inside the array for an array field. So these elements consist of you know scalar fields like string values, integer values or even nested objects. Now the uh, syntax is same. You just have to mention uh, the collection uh, name and mention the create index keyword and within the parenthesis mention the field name which is of only array type. So multi-key index, you know, automatically creates a multi-key index on an array by knowing its structure. So therefore, you need not additionally define a multi-key index in such case. So no additional definition is required as such. So let us understand with an example here. Now, 
let's say I have a document here, uh, different documents, like I have three different documents in a collection of orders, which has various fields such as ID, customer address, payment mode, email, order total and order items. Now, if you look at this collection, I have order items, which has an array values. For example, we have for first ID uh, for customer Rahul, we have four different array values of order items, like item name, notebook, an item name paper, item name journal, item name postcard. So if I want to create a multi-key index, I'll just simply write a query as db.orders.createIndex and within the parenthesis, mention the collection, uh, mention the field name that is which is order items and on which you want to perform multi-key indexing. Now I want to perform uh, indexing on price which is a array value within a collection, right? So that is why I'm taking as order items dot price and the order in which it will index is ascending. So for that, I'm giving the parameter as one. So with that, we have covered all the three different main types of uh, key indexing indexes that we generally use in MongoDB. So let us now switch into MongoDB for execution part and see how they actually perform. Now we do not uh, clearly see that how the indexing is going, but it will definitely improve the search efficiency. If you're working on, you know, more than, you know, let's say thousands and thousands of records. So let us now jump into uh, MongoDB shell for execution part. All right. So as you can see, MongoDB shell has started. And firstly, let us see uh, what are the databases that are present. So for that, I'll use the show DBS. And we'll again use the simply code one our DBS that we have all previously used. So use simply code one. It says switch to simply code. Now, if you want to find all the collections that are present in that, you just have to write show collections. So we have one collection which is employee. So we'll use that. So in order to find the values or the documents that are present in this collection, we'll just uh, write the uh, DB command, which is DB dot employee dot find so it will just display all the values type it for all the values so as you can see we have various different documents in this so we'll just perform a simple index now we'll just create a single field index now which is basically a normal field index that you create so the uh, query would be db dot employee create mention the ind create index keyword and within the parenthesis uh, so let us just create, uh, you know, an index on salary field here, right? So mention the salary field, mention the hyphen and we will uh, index this in ascending order. So I'm giving the parameter here as one. So let us execute the statement. So when you execute the statement, it says salary underscore one, which is basically means your index that you have created, which is has been successfully executed. So now that you've created your index and if you want to view uh, what are the indexes that you've created, you need to use the get indexes keyword. So let us just find again. So I'll use the statement db.employee, which is a collection name. Now you need to use the get indexes. Make sure the I is a capital. Otherwise you will find an error. Get indexes. And when you enter uh, the end, when you enter this and you'll find this a uh, list of following uh, indexes that you have created. Now I have already created, now, as I said earlier in the tutorial, the ID field is automatically created uh, within the, you know, database, which, uh, you know, automatically creates the index for the uh, underscore ID. But additional to that, I've already created email uh, index on our, uh, you know, employee table. And just now I have created the salary index also. So you can see the list of all these, uh, you know, uh, indexes that you have created. Now, let's say if you want to you know, delete or drop any of the index that you have created. So in that case, you have to use the drop index. So I'll just, uh, you know, write the statement again, which is db dot employee dot uh, mention the keyword drop index. Okay. And within the uh, parenthesis, mention the index that you want to drop. So let's say if I want to drop the email, I find it unnecessary now. So I'll just uh, write uh, the email, uh, you know, key, key, which is a field and I'll mention this uh, one and I'll just close the bar parenthesis and I'll close the brackets as well. So as you can see, it says, okay, 
you know this it says n index is uh, is three and okay one. That means you have finally you know dropped the index. So we'll just use again this you know get index uh, and see whether it is successfully deleted or not. Let's just copy paste here and let us enter. So now you can see that we have only two fields, which is the uh, underscore id, which is you know, by default, which is the index that I've created by the database itself. And additionally, we have the salary index that we have created earlier. And successfully, we have deleted the email index from our collection or the database. So I hope you've understood till now. So that is what, uh, you know, index is about, you know, you just create index to uh, improve the search efficiency. Now behind the uh, database, the performance optimization or the efficiency can be achieved, which cannot be viewed outside. So I hope you understood how to create a single field here. Well, let us now move to compound index and we'll see how to create it also. So I, uh, as discussed earlier, you can use multiple fields in a MongoDB document to create a compound index. So I'll just create, uh, compound index on another fields so i'll just create index and within the parenthesis okay let us now create a you know index for let's say job id job id i am giving it as minus one the order mention the comma and uh, let us create an index for let's say department id as well department id and i'm giving this a uh, parameter one it will basically index in the ascending order so close the parenthesis so as you can see it is saying job id one department id one that is me that means you have successfully created the index so let us just uh, confirm whether they have created or not so let us copy paste again so now, as you can see, we have another two indexes that we have created, which says, you know, job ID and for department ID as well. So this is how you can create a compound index in your MongoDB database as well. So in the compound, uh, in the above compound index that will, we have created, the MongoDB will first sort by the job ID in the descending order. Since we have provided minus one as the parameter, it will basically sort all the documents in the descending order then with each uh, department id it will sort in ascending order since we have provided the parameter as one now the index would create a similar st a data structure for the department id also which basically sorts the data in the ascending order so that brings us uh, to the final which is multi-key index now i don't think we have you know array of fields or the array of data in our document documents so that we can perform uh but for now i think i hope you understood how to implement multi-key multi-key index as well it just supports supports indexing of array of data so when you create an index for a field containing an array mongodb will create a separate index entries for every element in the array data so i think we have already almost covered all the topics that we have uh, discussed in our agenda and i hope you guys have understood as well uh, so that brings us to the end of today's session guys i hope you've understood what are indexes and how they are used you know to uh, search the data in a efficient and a more quick way so defining indexes are important you know for faster and efficient searching of documents in a collection and these indexes can be created by the uh, using create index method. So I'm just recapping what we have covered uh, and indexes can be created on just one field by using the single field uh, index method or multiple fields using the compound index and you can even uh, create indexes on array of fields using the multi-key index as well. What is advanced indexing? Now we all know what indexing is MongoDB, right? Which is an essential component which improves the performance of the data retrieval speed in the database. So MongoDB indexing is a special data structure on which the index is created to hold the data of specific fields of documents. And in the absence of indexing in MongoDB, there is a need to scan every collection document to select those uh, that match the query statement. Now. In our previous tutorial on indexing in MongoDB, we have just covered the basic, uh, you know, indexing techniques like on single field and comp and compound uh, fields, right? So now, what if the database is working on array of uh, fields within a collection, right? 
so let's say if I have a student's database and in that I am working on sub documents that is documents that have array of fields in them. So in such case the indexing becomes quite difficult. So if there is no indexing done on a collection of thousands of document your query will keep finding specific document in order be it a single field uh, multiple fields or even array of fields. So it becomes quite difficult you know, to retrieve the value. So indexes are applied at the collection level and it can store the value of specific field or a set of fields. So before jumping into why uh, I mean how exactly advanced indexing works on you know array of fields let us understand uh, you know why why we need advanced indexing you know in addition to the normal indexing that we do uh, in MongoDB. So for that let us jump into my uh, MongoDB compass for explanation. So as you can see MongoDB compass has started and in our database simply code one we have two different collection that is employee and new employees here. Now if you if I click at the new employees it basically opens uh, the document fields. Now you can see we have like almost around 33,000 documents and we have one index which is basically done on the ID field. If you look at go to the indexes page we have the ID field which is already indexed. Now if you consider uh, these many documents right these huge tons amounts of documents like we have 33k and if I try to uh, find a particular document let's say uh, I want to file uh, a name you know based on the name I am trying to field. Uh, I think we have different names here right so let's just take department here right so we have department field so I'm just finding value like let's say uh, I'm trying to find all the documents which has police as the department name so I'll just write police and try to search it. So close the brackets and let us try to find. So it will basically find all the documents or uh, within the collection that has department as police here. Now if I go to the explanation of this right let's just click on explanation. Now if I uh, look the query performance of this uh, document or the query that I've written for uh, you know to find the uh, details of all the uh, you know employees or the people working in a company and the background I'm trying to find what all uh, the documents that I want here right. So if you look at here we have a total of 32,928 documents and in that we have documents returned are 13,590. Now it indirectly impacts the performance guys. Now if you see we have 33,000 documents it is searching each and every document where the department uh, is police. So and after searching each and every record uh, uh, record it is basically retrieving all the documents. So we have around 13,590 which is close to around 14k and if you look at the actual query time it is around 23 milliseconds. So that is quite a huge uh, you know amount of time for a database to process such information. Now let's say if I have like millions like 10 lakhs or 15 lakhs of documents in such case the time taken is more. So in such case we will basically create an index here. Now we all know how to create a single index and a multiple index. So let's just create an index and we'll see how it actually affects the uh, you know uh, the query performance. So I'm just creating an index on department field and I'm basically uh, indexing in ascending. So I'm just basically one I'm keeping it as one. So as you can see uh, we have created successfully uh, the index for the department uh, field here. So let us now try to uh, find uh, the data that is the department of that is the employees or the uh, people working as a police. So and if I try to find this and if I go to the exp again explanation part. So you can see now we have a total of 13,590 documents. Now instead of searching all the documents that is 33,000 we can directly reference refer only those documents that are required to us. So you can see index key examined only 13,590 and you can see actual query execution time has reduced a bit more like 17 ms. I think that is also a quite huge but I don't think uh, that is you know uh, that can affect actually. So you can see this is how index works. Now let's say if I create multiple index uh, let's say if I'm trying to find multiple uh, you know fields 
so in that case let us see how it actually impacts all right so let us now understand how it works for a compound field so when you are trying to uh, index uh, multiple fields let us see how the query performance does so let us now uh, find uh, you know the details of the employees whose department is police and let's say the job titles is sergeant so in that case i'll basically search for department field where the department is police and put a comma and I'm, the job title that i'm searching for is basically sergeant so mention sergeant okay close the brackets and let us now find the documents so if you look at it will only display all the uh, details of employees whose basically job title is sergeant and department is police so let us now understand how it is executing so let us explain uh, click on the explain button so you can, you can see that uh, the documents it is examining is basically the all the documents that is present in the collection that is 32928 now out of that it is returning 12 uh, 296 so as you can see it is a time taking process it is going through each and every document now thing is we only have only around 1300 documents where the department is police and the job title is sergeant so instead of that what i'll do is i'll basically index the uh, both department as well as the job title as well so let us just create another index here so firstly for department create index so let us create another index for job title and let us create an index again so as you can see we have created the index successfully so let us now try to find the documents all right it will find that it will fetch all the documents and let us now uh, basically uh, click on the explain and see how it does so as you can see now the documents that is that it examined now is 296 which we have seen earlier that all the details of employees whose department is police and the job title is sergeant so after creating an index it is only searching only those documents whose department is police and sergeant as you can see the actual query execution time is also reduced drastically from almost 432 milliseconds to almost 16 milliseconds so it will also vary like if you click again it will change to 6 milliseconds now that it has find the details so it keeps on changing so index basically provides the user to efficiently uh, navigate through that data which is required by them instead of searching the whole data so, so now you might be wondering why we need advanced uh, technique now let's say if i have uh, sub array fields in this documents so in that case i need to query those documents quickly right now it will take more time than single field or a compound field now that is where we use a, a advanced indexing to uh, index sub uh, array fields or sub documents so let us now understand how advanced indexing works and why we have uh, you know went through all that uh, scenario on mongodb compass where we have understood how indexing works for a single field as well as compounding field and the need for advanced indexing now let's say i have a document of students uh, let's say i have their student id their name age courses now for courses field i have a other additional uh, you know array array section where i'm uh, mentioning the course id course name and course credits so in that case we have an array field here right so in such case we will use advanced indexing now advanced indexing is basically just another process where we are using another technique right so let's say if i have 20 million such uh, records right 20 such million uh, documents present in my collection it will take a lot of time so this is where we need to use indexing process again so let's say if you are indexing an array field the syntax for that would be db.collection.createIndex mention the array field name that is and the order so i am creating an index on courses right uh, which is an array field there so the query would be db.students.createIndex courses and mention the order that is one now you can also further uh, you know index sub document fields right now instead of just uh, uh, indexing the array field you can also index the sub document field so let's just understand the syntax here that is db.collection.createIndex field name dot sub document field name and the order now why we are doing this now suppose that we want to search documents you know based on the course id course name or even the core uh, course credits now since all these fields are part of the courses sub document field right which will 
will create an index here on all the fields of the sub, -doc sub document. Now, in this example, I've created an index field on a sub document which is course ID. Similarly, you can also create for course name as well as the course credit also. So, the query is followed as db.students create index courses.course ID and I'm mentioning the order as one. So, once the index is created, we can search for any of the sub document fields utilizing this, uh, you know, query. Now remember that the query expression has to follow the order of the index specified that is either 1 or minus 1 otherwise you will get an error. So in this way we can use uh, a technique which is advanced indexing in order to query the array fields as well as sub document fields. Now in addition to that we have some other advanced indexing techniques which is uh, another three types of uh, indexing techniques in MongoDB which is First one is geospatial index. Now MongoDB uses 2D index and 2D sphere to increase the efficiency of database queries while dealing with the ge uh, geospatial coordinate data. Next we also have text index which provides uh, support to text search queries on string content. So basically text indexes can include any field whose value is a string or an array of string elements. And finally we have hashed index. Now basically hashed index keep tracks of the entries with hashes of the values of the index field which is almost always the uh, underscore id field which is created by default in all the collection. Now this kind of index is primarily necessary when you are sharding data to distribute it evenly. Now if you want to learn more about sharding we have a dedicated video on that as well. So make sure to check that uh, on our channel. And that brings us to the end of today's session guys. So in this way you can use uh, advanced indexing uh, to create an index on you know multi key compound uh, you know fields as well so let's say if you have a document with an array field you can just create indexing for an array field creating an index on an array in turn creates separate index entries for each of its fields so it will basically separate uh, create an index to an array field so it will help you to find the documents with which are having any array field values as well so i hope you understood uh, all the techniques and how we implement advanced indexing in MongoDB. MongoDB you will most likely use the find method or command for a variety of queries. Now however as your queries become more complex you will need to learn more about aggregation in MongoDB which is used to perform various complex operations. So in this tutorial we'll be covering the fundamentals of creating aggregate queries in MongoDB and how to use various expressions in MongoDB aggregation and furthermore we'll introduce the most important stages of aggregation pipeline along with examples of how to apply each one to this pipeline stages. Alright, firstly let us understand what is aggregation in MongoDB. MongoDB processes the data records in the database during an aggregation operation and returns a single computed result. It actually groups multiple documents present in a collection, applies an aggregation operation to it and then provides the user with a single result. Now, MongoDB offers a wide range of aggregation operations. Just like many other database systems in relational databases as well, MongoDB being a NoSQL database also provides with the same functionality. This enables you to filter data as you might with a query as well as grouping data, sorting data into a particular order or reorganizing for returning the documents in the collection. Now, this is just similar to the SQL wherein we use the group by clause in our aggregation function with the help of certain uh, operations like count, average, sum, minimum and value to perform complex aggregation operations. In the similar way, MongoDB aggregation is also similar to that of the SQL aggregation method that we follow. So I hope you understood what is aggregation in MongoDB. Let us now understand why we use aggregation. Now data from different sources is gathered by an aggregation method which are then processed to a single outcome. Now to perform an aggregate function in a relational database, the database management system typically extracts data from multiple rows of the same table. But in a document oriented database like MongoDB, the database will gather information from various documents in the same collection. So it basically group values from multiple documents together to a single resultant value. Now next one is it fetches a lot of nested data to perform complex operations now when using a database management system you must run an operation known as a query right each time you want to retrieve data from database however qu queries only return the information that is already present in the database you will frequently need to carry out another type of operation which is known as aggregation in order to analyze your data 
in order to find patterns or other information about the data so if there are if there is a complex operation that is needed for the data that is present in the uh, documents you need aggregation and finally it filters and sort documents and analyze data changes now uh, MongoDB being an SQL, no SQL database, the data model will frequently change as the data that is being, you know, uh, inserting into the uh, database might change over the time. So in order to analyze this unstructured data, it becomes quite important that you uh, make a proper, you know, filtration and sorting of these documents to get a proper insights for your businesses and as well as your, you know, requirements. So in that case, aggregation can be quite useful, which simplifies, you know, the complexity of the query that you have written and fetches the data in no time. So these are some of the main reasons on why we use aggregation. Now, aggregation uh, in MongoDB is performed using uh, aggregation pipeline stages with con consists of four different, uh, you know, methods. The first one is match. Next, we have group. Next, we have sort. And finally, we have project. These four combinedly are known as aggregation pipeline stages, which perform aggregation as per the requirement. Now, firstly, when you take a collection and the first thing you need to is if you want to match only a certain fields, you know, within your documents to perform aggregation, then you can use the match uh, method. Next, we have the group. Now, just like the group by clause in SQL, you can use the group, uh, you know, function here as well in order to group all this similar or uh, the related uh, type of data in your you know, uh, pre present in your collections, that is the, the data that is, that is present in your documents to, in order to retrieve the similar kind of data, you can use the group. Next sort, again, sorting can be done in any other way, like from ascending order or descending order. Next, we have the project. As we discussed earlier in our previous tutorial, project is used to, uh, you know, remove the unnecessary fields that you want in a resultant set. And finally, after you know, matching all the four uh, pipeline stages, then you get the resultant output. So let us understand this uh, with an example wherein we'll discuss how aggregation works in MongoDB. Now, as discussed earlier, the firstly, the match condition, uh, you know, specifies only the related documents that you want to uh, consider. So for example, I have a collection name orders here and I'm performing, uh, you know, an aggregation uh, operation here. So first I've mentioned the match for status A. So I have like four documents here, if you see in the orders, like for diff four different customer IDs, we have the amount and status. Now for, I want to retrieve only uh, those documents whose status is A. So for that, I'm using the match command here. So match command only retrieve the one that you have specified here, which is status A. So we have only three records that have the status as field and their value is A. So we have sorted initially with the match command. Next, we want to group the uh, uh, values in the order of their, let's say, IDs. And then, so if you look at here, we have two similar IDs, which is A123 and B212. So what group does is, it will match all the similar and related uh, fields together and produce a result. So you can see the A123 and B21, B212 are separated into a different groups. And finally, what I'm doing is I'm sorting. I'm sorting and I'm applying an operation here with sum. So what it does is it will basically calculate the total amount here. So if you look at uh, the first ID A123, the amount is 500 and 250. So the resultant output would be 750. And finally, we have the customer ID of B212, whose amount is just 200. So in this way, the aggregation pipeline works in a methodology of wherein it matches the values that is the similar values from the documents then you can even group the data that you want to uh, show in your resultant output and you can perform various operations uh, using the aggregate functions like some minimum average with the help of sorting as well so this is basically how aggregation works in mongodb so and finally as discussed earlier uh, just like similar to sql we have the same uh, five or the main five uh, aggregation operations in SQL, which is the first one is sum. It basically adds up the values of every documents of a collection. Next, we have the average, which computes the average value of every document of a collection. Next, we have minimum or min, returns the minimum of all values from the collection. And next, we have max, which is opposite to that of minimum, minimum which returns the maximum of all values from within the collection. And finally, we have an additional, uh, you know, operation which is a push operation since mongodb is non uh, relational database we also work on the array of elements so in order to add the values to an array in the associated document within 
uh, a collection you can use the push operation as well now this might be a bit confusing for you guys now so let us jump into mongodb shell for execution part where we'll, we'll perform uh, different operations using the aggregation pipeline stages and see how they are getting implemented and also perform a detailed analysis on the uh, data uh, the collection that we have and we will uh, bring out some inferences using the aggregation operations using uh, various expressions like some average minimum and maximum so without any further delay let us jump into mongodb shell so as you can see we have opened the mongodb shell uh, command prompt line so let us just uh, use the command show dbs to find out the database present so we have different uh, databases like admin config local and simply code one we'll use the simply code one as usual so use write the database name use simply code one now let us see the collections that are present in the table so we have the employee collection again so let us write the command using the db dot find db dot collection name dot find which is employee dot find so it will retrieve all the values that are present in this collection so we have uh, different fields like employee id first name last name email phone number hiring date job id salary manager id and department id so all right let us now perform the aggregate uh, operations in a sequential way firstly we'll look at the match aggregation uh, you know stage where it will match the related fields that we want in a resultant set now let's say if i want to match the department id whose uh, all the employees who belong to the department id let's say 100 so in that case the following query would be db dot employee dot mention the aggregate keyword here which is a must otherwise it will throw an error uh, open the parenthesis and mention the square brackets and use the dollar symbol to write uh, the statement for match and put the colon and open the parenthesis and mention the department id uh, field which is uh, on which we are basically you know uh, matching the records so mention it again the colon and within single quotes mention the department id name so since we have taken as 100 i'm just taking it close the uh, flower brackets two times and again mention the square bracket once again and close the parenthesis all right so this is the uh, basically the query that we have written here which is db.employee.aggregate and we are using the match aggregation method here wherein we are uh, matching all the records of the employees whose department id belongs to 100 so let us now enter uh, i think there is an error here so we had a error in the syntax guys uh, so as you can see in the output we can see only those records of the employees wherein it is showing uh, the records whose department id is 100 so we have the employee id 108 109 110 111 and 112 113 and all of them have their employee uh, department ids sorry uh, department id is 100 so i hope you understood this so let us now uh, go through the next stage of aggregation pipeline with, wherein we will group uh, the values now so for that the following query would be db dot employee dot aggregate which is the keyword again uh, open the parenthesis and mention the double square brackets open the flower brackets and use the dollar symbol again uh, write the group keyword and open the flower brackets again and mention the id here so i'll explain why we are taking this here again so firstly let us just write the you know command and then i'll explain to you guys that why, why we are exp uh, implementing that so i want to group all the basically the department ids right so i am taking department id so mention the dollar symbol and mention the field name which is the department id close the flower brackets twice mention of uh, a double bracket square bracket as well so when you enter uh, you can see the list of all the department ids that are present in our collection so we have various i uh, department ids like 60 10 30 70 40 110 150 20 98 and so on so now you might have a doubt that why we are using the id field here 
Now we are using the group states to group the input documents by the specified you know ID expression which returns a single document containing the all the cumulative values of all the uh, department IDs that we have taken here. So in this above example only the group stage is specified in the pipeline whereas the group uses the ID field to calculate at the uh, value for all the input documents as a whole. So the expression ID uh, colon uh, the dollar symbol department ID creates a distinct group on the field department name. Since we don't, uh, we didn't calculate any accumulated values in our document, it returns the distinct values of department uh, IDs that are present in the table or in the uh, document. So in this way, you can use the group aggregation method as well. So this is how you can use the match and group stages wherein you can combine both these as well. So next, let us look at how to create an aggregation uh, operation using one of the expression that we have like count, average, sum or minimum. Now let's say if I want to count the total employees in a particular department, in that case I will basically use the match statement wherein it will uh, group all the uh, values of the employees whose department ID is in a particular uh, you know uh, value and then it will count the total number of employees in that group. So for that the following query would be db dot employee dot aggregate uh, open the open the brackets and uh, square brackets as well and then mention the flower back brackets and then use the dollar match uh, group stage wherein we are matching uh, you know the department ID let's say department ID of uh, 60 so in that case it would be department ID I am taking the value of 60, mention in the double quotes and close the brackets, put a comma and then basically we are counting right. So I will use the count function here. So put the dollar sign, mention the count keyword and let's say the statement would be total employees in department. 60 right so mention the uh, put these close the uh, brackets as well square brackets second so when you press the enter in a resultant output it states that total employees in department 60 is 5 so similarly you can check for uh, various other departments as well so let us just uh, verify if it's showing correctly or not i'll just copy paste this and let's say for 100 i want the total number of employees present in the uh, department 100 so in that case i'll just mention it i'll just change the values and let us now print the enter so as you can see in the resultant set or in the output you can see the total number of employees in department 100 is 6 uh, wherein we have the total number of employees in department 60 is 5. So in this way you can use the various aggregation stages using the match, group and as well as sort as well uh, and perform various aggregation operations like sim, uh, sum, aggre uh, minimum, maximum as well. So I think we have covered most of the concepts that we have discussed in our you know tutorial so that brings us to the end of today's session guys i hope you understood uh, what aggregation methods and how they are used in mongodb so let us understand what is mongodb replication now the database replication is the process of copying data from a database in one server to a database in another one ensuring that the same data is available on more than one mongodb server now the main purpose of replication is high availability and data redundancy. Now data is kept durable by having several copies or replicas stored on physically separate servers. Now replication is that process of generating redundant data in order to integrate and protect data accessibility and durability. Now by generating multiple copies of your data across servers, replication enables you to increase data availability. This is especially helpful if a server fails or your service is interrupted or if there are any hardware failure issues. Now if your data is only stored in a single database, any of these events would make data access impossible. So if there is any breakage or failure of system or server failure, in that case you need a recovery and backup option. However, thanks to replication, your application can remain operational even if your database server fails 
while also providing disaster recovery and backup options as well. So that is what MongoDB replication is all about. Now why we need replication in MongoDB? Now there are various factors that we can take into account on why we need replication but these are the main reasons uh, why we need replication. Now the first one is replication provides high availability of data. Now as discussed earlier the main purpose of replication is to provide high availability and data redundancy by storing the data in multiple server rather than one. Now this data is available 24 by 7 to the user even if there are any issues with the uh, you know server side or any database uh, failure as well. Now it also protects from any single server loss or hardware failures and service interruptions. So now data replication is must to keep your data protected right. So it ensures not only the high availability of data but also the ease of access especially in the event of any unexpected errors such as, such as a system crash, hardware or software based errors and etc. And finally replication ensures that data is always available to every client. Now no matter the problem is the re what replication it does is it basically shifts the data into multiple uh, servers or multiple locations wherein the data can be available in each of any server that is present in the database rather than only a single server side where the data is stored. So let us now understand how does replication work in MongoDB. Now this diagram of MongoDB replication is shown in the uh, image which I guess you guys are visible where a client application always communicates with the primary node and the primary node replicates the data to the multiple secondary nodes here. So we have a client application uh, wherein the data that is being read and write operations are taking place from MongoDB server and the driver as well. And we have a primary server here which basically does only write operation, write and read operation both as well. And then from there it creates a replication of the same database server into a secondary server. Now when I talk about server here we have different nodes. Now replication you know is done through a replica, replica set process which in simple words it's a group of MongoDB process to keep the same data across different servers. Now we'll be discussing what replicate set is in a while. So but a replicate set basically must have certain number of nodes. Now as you can see in the right side of the image we have various multiple nodes that is servers. Now in that we, we need at least one primary server in order to perform replication on the data that is present in a database. The rest all can be secondary data. Now a replica set must have three nodes at least. Now one of them must be primary and the rest secondary ones. A replication structure can have up to almost 50 nodes. So let us now understand what is replicate set that we have been talking about. Now MongoDB manages replication using replica sets which are a collection of related MongoDB nodes. Now a replica set requires a minimum of basically three MongoDB nodes that I have discussed earlier. One of which should be considered as the primary node that receives all the right operations. And the, on the other hand the, the rest of the remaining ones are considered as the secondary nodes which will replicate the data from the primary node. And if in case if it, there is a failure at any level of uh, you know node structure or if, if there is any possibility of a failed node is recovered it actually works as a secondary node again but not as a primary node. So if you look at this diagram again here now basically we have an application and then we have a primary node here right. Now the primary uh, node is the member in which the replica set receives write and read operations but read operations can be pointed out to secondary nodes as well which changing uh, the con configuration at the moment to perform the query. Besides the replica set uh, we can have only one uh, primary node at most as discussed earlier and then the replication is done on the secondary node. So the secondary uh, node is where the data is replicated to maintain a copy. A replica set can have one or more secondary nodes here guys. So basically the clients cannot write data to secondary ones only they can read from them. That is what a replicate set is all about. So let us just quickly recap what we have uh, covered here. Now to perform this we need a minimum of three nodes which is required and in this operation of replication MongoDB assumes one node as one, of, one node of the replicate set as the primary node and the remaining as the secondary node. So from within the primary node data gets replicated to secondary node and again in case of any failure or any system error the new primary nodes get elected in case there is an automatic maintenance or failover. 
Now, if you can see in the second diagram, we have an heart symbol here, guys, which is basically known as heartbeat mechanism. So each node is connected to all the other and a heartbeat mechanism is in place to call any other node. So the heartbeat has a configurable time for pinging the nodes and the default is 10 seconds. So if all the nodes respond with an acknowledge to the heartbeat, the cluster or the server, the, the nodes where the the nodes are present it continues to work and if one of the nodes crashes the primary node for example an election takes place involving the remaining nodes and when a secondary does a secondary node doesn't receive a response to the heartbeats after the configure timeout it calls for an election so this takes place until the primary node which has been uh, failed is recovered so next let us discuss what are some of the benefits of replication now as discussed earlier, replication helps in disaster recovery and backup of data. It basically improves application reliability. Now, uh, by spreading your data across multiple machines, you can ensure that your application's data continues to be available even in the event of any hardware failure on any given machine or server in the replication group. It also, uh, the replication also minimizes downtime for maintenance. Now, since we are, uh, you know, transferring or locating our data into various multiple servers, it basically minimizes the downtime for maintenance also. And we can also achieve load balancing as well using replication. We know that MongoDB works on a lot of unstructured data and it keeps on piling up on and on. So if a, let's say if a user is working on one of the database and which is having a particular server to its name, while a lot of people also can work on the same server. So that can cause, you know, a breakage or failure sometimes. So in order to achieve that load balance, you know, to handle number of people and number of people that are working on the same database, we can basically replicate the data that is present in our database to different servers and from which we can eventually achieve load balancing. Now, on the other side, we have certain limitations as well with the usage of replication also. Some of them are higher costs and time constraints. Now, maintaining consistent data across, you know, disparate or various locations is often taxing in terms of resources. Now, if you maintain duplicates of the same data in various locations and distributed database systems, which results in great greater storage as well as processing uh, costs as well, which ultimately results in time constraints while executing and handling the duplication process, which needs committed time from an in-house team or a people that are working on that database to ensure that the copy data is consistent with the source data. That is, all the data that is being copied from the primary node is actually same as that is being copied into the secondary node. And finally, redundant data is being stored in the secondary uh, server or secondary node, right? So it basically takes more space and server processing is also required which takes a lot of time so those were some of the limitations or you can say disadvantages of a replication in mongodb and that brings us to the end of today's session guys uh, so let us just quickly recap what we have discussed in the uh, today's session now mongodb replication is one of an important process which makes data available across multiple data servers so instead of just store, uh, storing a data at a one particular site you can basically shift it to across multiple data storage locations. Now, data redundancy and uh, availability and load balancing are one of the important factors that we've discussed in replication, which are important, you know, for maintaining such a huge uh, database, you know, data that has been constantly changing and ever evolving. MongoDB also supports replication with the help of replica sets. As discussed, uh, replica sets are basically a combination of various MongoDB instances each having a single primary node and multiple secondary node. Now, this process is done on a keyword that is heartbeat mechanism, which is a method of finding out the current state of the MongoDB node in a replica set. Now, the heartbeat signal basically matches or verifies whether the data is being generated in the primary node and it is further are displacing into the secondary node. So replicate set selection is used to find out which MongoDB node should be the primary node. And finally, we talk about scalability, performance and high availability, which are the paramount uh, factors 
in a MongoDB replication. Now, when I talk about scalability, guys, uh, scalability as the data volume increases, the complexity of accessing data and working with data also increases. So, we, replication in place, multiple data copies are available, allowing users to not only increase their data but also recover any previous version in case of any errors or failure. Performance is also very important when you're replicating certain data. Now when data which is available across multiple servers, it not, it not only makes accessing data easier, but makes recovering from unexpected and sudden failures much easier. So replication uh, basically ensures data availability and security all the time. So with replication in place, there's no need to worry about data failures your data is you know safely stored in other locations so in situations where your primary source of data fails you can e easily access the same up-to-date data from a secondary reserve or the data that is stored in secondary server which highly promotes data availability and which is another in today's session we'll be going through mongodb sharding concept and we'll understand how it is implemented the use of it and how exactly it is performed and we'll finally understand the advantages of sharding in MongoDB. So without any further ado, let's get started with today's topic. So firstly, what is sharding in MongoDB? Now sharding is a method for distributing a single data across multiple databases, which can then be stored on multiple machines. This allows for large data sets to be split into smaller chunks and stored into multiple data nodes, increasing the total storage capacity of the system. So for example, let's say I have a database which has, you know, 2 million users uh, that are running on my database frequently. So the single machine has a capacity to only uh, hold 2 million records in that. Now, for instance, my business is growing and with the ever increasing demand of data, the data is being piled up in, in more, uh, you know, numbers. Now, for example, the 2 million has been raised into 3 million and in that case, the operations on that database can be quite difficult because there is a huge traffic of data that can be, uh, you know, applied on that database. For in that case, I can basically split the data database into two different, you know, instances where I can make two machines or I can uh, basically store the data in two different servers wherein I can have two different capacities. Now, let's say I've divided the 2 million to 1 million and 1 million. Now, I further can have a total capacity of total 4 million that is 2 million and 2 million in each database so this is what a uh, sharding is based upon sharding basically distributes the process and stores a single data set into multiple databases now the purpose of any database distribution is to enhance the scalability of the applications uh, and sharding is an excellent way to keep the data safe across different resources in mongodb Database sharding is an achievable by breaking down big data sets into simple subdivided data sets across multiple instances. Now this single database cannot handle a database with large data sets, right? As it requires large storage and bulk query operations can use most of the CPU cycles, which slows down the processing of the system. For such scenarios, we need more powerful system. So now one approach is to add more capacity to single server, such as adding more memory, and processing units or adding RAM on a, on the single server, then it is basically known as scaling. Now we can do scaling in two ways. First one is we have sc vertical scaling. Vertical scaling basically refers to adding more resources. For example, adding a new CPU or increasing the RAM or, e or instead adding a new disk size to your server based on your demand. And next we also have horizontal scaling. Horizontal scaling involves adding more and more processing units of physical machines to your server or databases. So it is basically used to divide a large data set across multiple systems and serve a data application to query data from multiple servers. This approach is basically called as horizontal scaling and MongoDB handles horizontal scaling through sharding. Now let us now understand why we exactly need MongoDB sh uh, sharding guys. Now we learned that in our previous uh, tutorial about replication, wherein we learned that replica sets gave us the ability to hold data in multiple databases and thus given us a certain level of fault tolerance and data duration. And however, this approach has certain limitations as previously mentioned guys, all write operations in replication go to the primary nodes. As you can see here, we have the primary node here. It is going to the uh, secondary node 
and all the write operations are basically done on this primary node and all the read operations are basically processed to the secondary node which makes it the uh, you know crucial thing of any system right the, this means that if the system grows this primary node will be overused so in that case eventually it will be limited with hardware limitations like ram number of cpus and disks and etc so in that case it it is quite difficult you know that a database can be of efficient way to uh, you know address the demand or process the data within the database so that is where mongodb sharding comes into picture now since it is a limitation of uh, replication that is where uh, as i said sharding comes into play when there is when database may struggle to handle more and more data and the query traffic increases in that case you need to distribute the data into simpler or uh, secondary multiple machines now another reason is mongodb instance is unable to manage write operations as i said earlier uh, the database in replication you know you're basically copying or duplicating the data from one uh, mongodb database into another in that case it becomes difficult for one single database to manage all the write operations right so in that case we need sharding next memory cannot be outsized enough in case your la if your data set is large for example if the da if the database is working on large data large data sets in that case memory cannot be you know over uh, settled or you can uh, incorporate uh, memory you know if if the data data set is too large and finally which also impacts the uh, database maintenance also and vertical scaling is nowadays too costly and in that case mongodb sharding comes into picture so that those were some of the reasons why we need mongodb sharding so let us now move ahead and let us understand how mongodb sharding works now before mongodb sharding uh, the working of Mongo, mongodb sharding we need to understand the mongodb sharding architecture now implementing the concept of sharding can be done with the use of clusters so when i say about clusters sharding clusters are basically the combination of multiple shards mongo's processes and configuration servers so if you look into this image we basically have an app server wherein we have various routers and we have a mongodb mongo's instance of mongodb mongo's process and we also have configuration servers or config servers which are basically the replica sets and we have different shards where we, uh, we are basically trying to you know break down uh, a single huge uh, database into further uh, you know shards or simpler pieces now this is done with the help of a sharding key now on sharding a mongodb data set a shard key is automatically created by default the shard key basically can be in form of an indexed field or indexed compound field that will be used to distribute the data among the shards generally the shard key is used to distribute mongodb collections document across all the shards where the key consists of a single field or multiple fields in every document so that brings us to the main part which is how mongodb sharding works now now mongodb uh, sharding works by creating a cluster of all these mongodb instances consisting of at least three servers which we'll be discussing in a while so the shared cluster or the mongodb sharding cluster consists of three main components which is basically shard mongos and config servers now when i talk about shard a shard is basically a single mongodb instance that holds a subset of the sharded data shards can be deployed as a replica set to increase availability and provide redundancy now the combination of multiple shards creates a complete data set for example uh, if you are trying to break down uh, let's say a 5tb data set which can be broken down uh, further into four shards each combining of 100 gb of data from the original data set so that is what a shard is all about now next we have mongos mongos acts as a query router providing a stable interface between the application and the sharded cluster the this mongodb instance is responsible for routing the client's request to the correct shard and finally we have the config servers configuration servers basically store the data and the configuration settings for the whole cluster so if you look at it, uh, look at this diagram uh, we have a router which is having a mongodb instance and we have configuration servers wherein we have primary secondary servers in that and also we have shards where we are basically dividing again into primary and secondary 
So the application communicates with the routers, which is basically the Mongos, about the query to be executed. Now the Mongos instance consults the config servers to check which shard contains the required data set to send the query to that shard. And finally, the result of this query will be returned to the application. So you need to uh, understand that it's important to remember that the config servers also work as replica sets here. That is why we have primary and secondary, uh, you know, nodes here as well. So this is how basically uh, how MongoDB sharding works. Now the idea is to have basically uh, multiple replica sets with multiple primaries uh, that will divide data and load it among themselves. And each of these replica sets is basically called a shard. But multiple shards are not enough to achieve the proper functionality of this kind of system. So and that brings us to the final uh, component or final uh, you know thing to our uh, session which is basically the advantages of sharding. So in database sharding the gives a, a lot of advantages now one of them is increased storage capacity. So when data gets distributed across the shards in the cluster each shard contains a subset of the total data in the cluster and on increasing the data volume the additional shards grow which leads to expanding the cluster storage capacity. Sharding also increases the read and write throughput uh, in the database also guys. Now in MongoDB the read and write workloads are easily distributed across the shards in the sharded cluster. It allows each shard to process a subset of the cluster operation. So both the read and write performance can be directly scaled horizontally across the cluster by increasing the shard count and which again ultimately results in high availability of data. Now with an uncharted database, uh, an outage in one database shard has a caliber to uh, you know impact the entire application and lose, lose its functionality or even completely stop it. However, with a sharded database, if there is complete unavailability of one or more shard replicas, only a few parts of the application or the website which is available to some users. However, the other shards continue their operation without any concern. And finally, sharding facilit facilitates horizontal scaling. Now, one more reason, uh, you know, developers love database sharding is that it facilitates horizontal scaling, which also means scaling out your uh, databases. This means it allows you to have parallel backends and carry out tasks simultaneously without no, with no hassle. Whether the focus is on writing or reading operations, scaling out can add a big advantage to enhance the performance and also eliminate complexities. So these were some of the main advantages of uh, sharding guys. So that brings us to the end of today's session. Now you might wonder how sharding and replication are different from each other. So whenever you're thinking about sharding or replication, you need to think in the context of you know, the write and the update operations that you're performing on your database. So if you don't need to scale write, uh, write processes, then, then replication as it's fairly simple is a good choice for you. On the other hand, uh, let's say, you know, if your workload is mostly on write operation, uh, most of the times, then at some point you'll hit a, uh, you know, a write operation that is compulsory needed for you in any, in any case, right? So if write request comes, um, comes then Mongo basically blocks other write requests, right? So these are all the write request blocks until the first request will be done. So if you want to scale this write operations and want to parallelize, then in you in in such case you need to implement sharding. What are relationships in MongoDB? The MongoDB relationships are the representation on how different documents present in a collection are connected logically to each other in a database. MongoDB relationships helps in various different factors right for example it relationships enforce data integrity in relational databases and it also establishes between documents which can help refine the database structure as per your requirement now we know that mongodb is a low sql database and has a lot of unstructured data so in order to properly confine all the documents into a proper format and refining them into a proper structure is quite beneficial, not just in terms of saving the data, but it also affects the performance and makes execution time also shorter. And finally, it basically links important entities in the database. So that is what relationship in MongoDB is. Now, there are different types of MongoDB relationship here, guys. 
we have embedded and reference method so data relationship can be achieved through these methods wherein embedded documents uh, relationship between data is by storing related data into a single document structure now let's say if i have a collection and i have two different documents now as the word suggests which is embedded i am basically storing these two different documents into a single document structure which is known as embedded a document relationship and similarly we have a document reference method or simply reference method which is used to store the relationship between data by including any links or references from one document to another now we will understand this with an example here now if you consider this embedded model uh, you know collection which i have here let's say i have uh, you know a details of a person whose name is pranav whose id is 118025 his contact details are there his phone number his email address now this is basically one document right now similarly i have another document wherein i'm having his grade details that is his subject which is cs203 and the score that is the grade that he have achieved is b now instead of having two different uh, documents in the collection i'm basically merging them that is i'm embedding both of these into a single document so this is what embedded mo model does it basically combines two or two uh, documents into a single document structure and similarly i have reference model now reference model basically links two or more documents right now let's say i have again uh, a student collection here which has uh, of rohan whose uh, contact details his email id phone number and grade are being displayed here so let's say i have uh, let's op a collection and uh, in that i have three different documents which is student contact details and grade now instead of having three separate uh, model uh, three separate documents i can simply combine these or i can link uh, with the help of user id i can basically combine the contact details as well as the grade into a single document so this is how reference model works that is by referencing or linking two or more documents into a single document structure so that was all about reference model and that is main difference between embedded and reference now we have this two embedded and document reference relationships and these can be achieved by three different methods that is we can have one to one relationship one to many relationships and in document reference relationship can be achieved through many to many relationships now let us now understand what exactly these are all right so one to one relationship basically if you have any one field it can only have one value in such case it will consider as one to one relationship between any data that is present in the document and if you consider one to many now as the name suggest one to many so when one field has multiple relationship between the data in between documents that is stored in the collection of a database in that case in such case one to many relationship model can be used and similarly we have many to many now let's say i have uh, you know three uh, different you know document structures wherein i have two or more entities within a document and having let's say a array of uh, details present in a single uh, collection or in a document so it can have multiple relationship right so in in that case we need to use many to many i hope this is clearly understood uh, we will get into detail by uh, each of them we will consider each of the relationship model and understand how it is different from each other with an example now so firstly we have the one to one relationship guys now one to one relationships are created by linking two documents from different collection using a shared key that is sharing the object id of one collection to the other uh, which is a property of the same value now often the best way to create this relationship is to have the child collection query which is the key value of the first collection now object ids which basically are created by default in mongodb are commonly used to make this connection although it can be of any other type now let's say i have another uh, example here which says that i have a users collection which has id uh, by default name john and age is 40 and i have address collection as well which has id which is by default again and the address details like street name as church street number i'm having 1421.0 city as new york now what what one to one relationship does is it links to different documents right so in order to combine these two i need a a common property or a common key that is done by using the object id here so if you look at the result the resultant set of the document has been combinedly showcasing the details 
of the user as well as his address. So you can clearly see that we have the object ID, the details first here. Next, we have name John, age 40, address. Again, in address, we are basically documenting or uh, adding the data of the address in the same document itself. So this is one-to-one -one relationship. Let us now move ahead and understand what is one-to-many relationship. So one-to-many relationship is another relational model we use, which is created by linking a document in one collection to multiple documents in other collection. So let's say I have a, you know, an example of a collection here. Now this is basically widely used, you know, to increase is to use increasingly and you know where there are more array values within a table. So in such case, you can you can use one to many relationship. Now, for example, I have an author's collection which says uh, the name of the author is J.K. Rowling, and we have two different books, and for that we have object IDs as well. So in other collection, we have the details of the books now clearly, which is ID again, a name of the book is Philosopher's Stone, and next we have another book collection, uh, the data that is of Chambers of Secret. Now, in order to combine this, now one to many is basically with the reference of author collection, I'm basically connecting, uh, you know, two different book collection into a single document. So we have multiple documents in the books collection, right? And we have a single author collection. Now I'm basically clubbing these two, I'm creating a link between these two collection and I'm creating a single document. So if you look at in the result, resultant set, I have the name of the author that is J.K. Rowling and the books and their IDs and the details of their books. That is the name that is Philosopher's Stone and Chambers of Secret. So in this way, you can also use one-to-many relationship model in order to properly structure your data based on the requirement. And similarly, we also have many-to-many -many relationship here, guys, but I'm not going to discuss it. Let us know in the comment section below uh, and let us know what can be a good example of many-to-many -many relationships. And that brings us to the end of today's session, guys. Now, while embedded uh, data type, uh, embedded document model is ideal for one-to-one -one and one-to-many relationship, and referenced uh, data uh, document model is ideal for many-to-many -many relationship. Now, denormalization, de which is embedded, whereas normalization is the name given to reference relationships. Now, establishing uh, a good relationship between documents can aid in the refinement of the database structure, as we discussed earlier which can overall impact uh, can impact the overall performance of the database and can ex uh, reduce the execution time in the database as well so i hope right. so what is gridfs in mongodb gridfs is one of the powerful specifications of mongodb that helps to store and retrieve large scale files so it is a specification for storing and receiving files larger than 16 mb limit of base on documents now these files can be structured or unstructured and they include documents, audio files, images, recorded video clips, binary files, etc. Now, GridFS is similar to a file system for the storage of files, but MongoDB collections are used for storage of data and files using GridFS, which has powerful features to store the files of any format, including files that are even more than 16 MB in size. So in classical implementation, there is a file storage system of 16 MB, but MongoDB GridFS can store and retrieve files beyond this limit too. Now MongoDB GridFS features allow for the storage of large files as we discussed earlier. So in order to store very large files, it is not necessary to load the entire file into RAM. Instead, chunks of the files are steamed to the database. So these files can be again of any format. It can be an audio, PDF, movie, and then they are converted into smaller chunks and they are streamed into the database. So each chunk is limited to 255 KB in size. This means that the last chunk is normally either equal to or less than 255 KB. So it is the chunks are partitioned into smaller 255 KB files. And when you read from GridFS, the driver reassembles all the chunks as per the user's requirement when they are needed. This means that you can read sections of a file as per your query range, such as let's say listening to a segment of an audio file or you're trying to fetching a particular section of an image file. Now, because as discussed earlier, files are separated into smaller parts, it is easier to access, you know, specific areas of a file which saves memory tasks such as loading the whole file. Now, let us now understand why we use GridFS in MongoDB. 
So as discussed earlier in MongoDB, we use GridFS for storing files, which is which are having you know size larger than 16 MB. So in some situ situations, storing large files may be more efficient in a MongoDB database than on a system level file system, and that is a reason we have uh, some reasons, right? A particular you know significance of using GridFS. One such reason is if your file system limits the number of files in the current directory in the Mongo database, you can use GridFS to store as many as files that are needed. Now the second reason is when you want to access information from portions of large files without having to load the files into the memory that is without calling the whole uh, you know data into the RAM, you can use GridFS to recall sections only of particular uh, you know specific sections of files without reading the entire file into the memory and finally if you want to store and sync files and metadata across distributed system so when you want to keep your files and the data automatically synced and deployed across a number of systems and facilities you can basically use gridfs so mongodb can distribute files and their metadata automatically to a number of mongodb instances in the database so these are some of the reasons on why we use data, uh, GridFS in MongoDB. So let us now move ahead and and understand how exactly you know GridFS works in MongoDB. Now GridFS stores files into two collections. Now these two collections are basically known as chunks and files. Chunks basically stores the binary chunks and whereas the files store the files metadata. So if you look at this diagram uh, which we have uh, in our presentation that you are looking at, we have let's say a large file, it can be an audio, it can be a video file or anything. And let's say we have, we are dividing, we are using GridFS in order to, uh, you know, convert into a chunk of files. Now when you are basically converting into a chunk of file, it basically converts into file metadata and the a smaller segments of data which we call as chunks. So we have fs.files collection, fs.chunks collection. So basically GridFX stores files in two collections, right? Now it places the collection in a common bucket. So you can see we have fs bucket which comprises of fs.files and fs.collection. So it places the collection in a common bucket by prefixing each with the bucket name. So by default GridFS uses two collection as you can see which is fs.files and fs.collection. You can choose a different bucket name as well as create multiple buckets in a single database. Now the full collection name which includes a bucket name is subjected to your requirement and your and the need of the uh, file that you are working on. So let us now understand what is GridFS chunks collection. Now the each document in the chunk collection represents a distinct chunk of a file which is a a smaller segment of the initial or the original file which represents a distinct chunk of a file as represented in grid effects. So the syntax of is, I wouldn't say it is, uh, it has a syntax, uh, the basically it stores the data in a format of ID, files ID, in and data. So basically a document from the chunk collection contains these following fields. Now the chunk ID, it is basically the unique object ID of the chunk. Now just like how when we store a data, it automatically creates a default ID in our MongoDB database. Similar for GridFS also, we have an ID that is being automatically generated. Next, we have the chunks.files ID. Now, this is basically the ID of the parent document as specified in the files document. Next, we have n. Now, chunks.n basically is a sequence number of the chunk that is being you know stored into the collection. Now GridFS numbers have uh, chunk numbers starting with 0 and so on. And finally we have chunk.data. It is basically you know the data that uh, it gives a different serial number to the data that we have inserted into our JSON document. Next we have the GridFS chunks collection. Oh, sorry, there's a mistake. We have next GridFS files collection, right? Now we have discussed what is, you know, chunk collection. Now next we have the files collection. Now each document in the file collect represents a file in a GridFS. And similarly, just like uh, the chunk collection, we also have, you know, a format and different fields, uh, you know, when we try to store uh, collection, uh, GridFS, you know, collections in our database. So some of the fields that are, we, that are present in the collection are ID, length, chunk size, upload date, file name, content type, aliases and metadata. So documents in the file collection contain 
these following fields now for example the id again the, it is the unique identifier for this document and the id of the data type chooses for the original document next we have the length which is basically the size of the document in bytes next we have the chunk size which is basically the size of each chunk in bytes now basically gridfs divides the document into chunk size of uh, you know as discussed earlier which is default 255 kb each next we also have upload date which is the date the document was first stored by the gridfs and next we have the content type it is basically uh the type of you know file that you're basically adding to uh, you know database to store information related to the type of gridfs files and we also have optional uh, field like aliases and we also finally have metadata which is an optional field which may be of any data type and can hold any additional information you want to store so i hope you understood what is gridfs and what how it actually performs what are chunks and how it is dividing into sub you know segments like you know chunks and files so let us now get into the direct execution part and see how it gets executed now now other than the theory of what uh, you know gridfs is it is also important to understand how we can use gridfs to store large files and you have to uh, remember that as the syntax is an important aspect of executing the gridfs in the mongodb so the one thing that you have to remember is uh, in order to query or to insert a file into gridfs it is not executed through mongodb shell guys but it instead of uh, you can use you know windows or linux or mac command prompt now before doing that also you need to basically download some you know mongodb database tools uh, which i'll be showing now so if you are using windows just uh, go to google and type mongodb database tools all right now when you scroll down a bit you'll have this you know download mongodb command line database tools click on that Now after clicking that you will be you know redirected to another page which is basically the mongodb database tool documentation which will basically show everything about uh, you know various database tools that are available so on the left side you can see various database tools like mongo dump mongo store based on dump mongo import export and so on now we are concerned with mongo files which is the database tool which we are going to use in order to store you know data through uh, you know grid files so just click on that and if you want to just go and understand what mongo files is you can just read it a bit uh, so just click on installation here it will redirect to the installation page now we have three options for linux mac os windows click on installing the database tools on windows and uh, so it will basically tell you what all to do here installation process it can be installed with an msi installer or download as a zip archive select the tablet depending on a desired installation method so we'll be basically using the msi installer only so open the mongodb download center here so i've already downloaded it on my system so i'm just basically showing you again what uh, on how you can install this click on download it's basically it shows the version again just install the latest version platform is windows and the package is a zip folder click on uh, download it will take some time based upon your uh, you know internet speed it will just take some time so wait for it now once you are done just extract the file now as you can see we have a folder which is uh, mongodb database tools and inside that you have a folder named bin open on that now as you can see we have the list of all database tools that we have you know downloaded successfully now we are only concerned with mongodb files right so just copy paste this and now what you have to do is go to the uh, c drive where mongodb is installed it is basically in program files click on program files search for mongodb click on server 6.0 and you will find the bin folder click on that and just basically paste the whole folder or the mongo files here so as you can see i've already pay uh, you know copy pasted the same in my uh, bin folder here so just click on that and again you will be redirected to bin here click on that again so you can see we have the list of all the uh, database tools that we have installed it on our system so this is basically the location where you have to uh, you know uh, copy uh, the entire files otherwise it will throw an error right so we have mongod mongo file successfully installed here let us now uh, try to understand how to insert a file you know with a simple example so you can see i have 
uh, you know, a PNG file, which is an image, which is a uh, document one. We also have a video file, which is MP4 file, which is MongoDB replication, it says, right? So let us now uh, try to insert into uh, our database. For that, just click on right, right click in the same uh, folder. You will find open in terminal. Click on that. So it will open the Windows partial. This is where you have to write the uh, command prompt line. All right. So the above syntax, the syntax that you have to uh, write for this is basically by using the put keyword, which I'll be showing you now. So we'll be just uh, experimenting with one simple example that I've ten with a simple image file that we are going to insert now. Uh, as you can see, we don't have any specific collection for GridFS files, but as we know, MongoDB has this feature of creating new collection when we insert a document into a non-existing collection. So the following query for inserting a file in GridFS, unlike the insert operation where we'll insert file through Mongo shell, right? Here we'll use the, again, the window partial terminal. Now the query to insert uh, data into our database is mention the Mongo files. Mongo files is the keyword and after that put mention the file name. Now the file name that we have taken is document one, right? So mention document one dot and the file type, which is of JPG. So the above query is basically this query is a standard format for inserting any file into GridFS. We have basically navigated the terminal to the location where Mongo files, which is a database tool uh, is being saved. So our query begins with the keyword, which is Mongo files, followed by the storage option, which is put keyword, and it specifies the database where the file is to be stored. And here our database name is name is generally named as GridFS only. And at the moment we don't have any database with such name, but it will be created. So let us just execute, click on enter. All right, it is throwing an error. Oh. So as you can see, it says we have an error here. It says the command Mongo files was not found, but does exist in the current location. Windows partial does not load commands from the current location. If you instead type, okay, now instead of typing Mongo files, uh, let's just copy this and see if it is working or not. Mongo files, again, mention the keyword put and mention the document also. I mean, the document name that we're trying to insert, which is document one dot JPG. All right, let, let us now click on enter. I hope it should work now. I'm not sure. So I'm not sure why it is uh, throwing an error, guys. So let's just take uh, another example. Uh, we also have MongoDB1, which is again a JPG file. Let us try to uh, add that. Now, basically, if you want to insert data, you have to store uh, the files in this bin folder only. Otherwise, it will throw an error. So make sure you keep an eye on this because, uh, you know, adding huge amounts of data can take a lot of time. So if you are trying to uh, insert data, which is not specifically in this folder, then it will basically throw an error. So make sure you keep an, uh, an eye on that. So let's just uh, try to add another folder the file dot uh, so the keyword is dot under sla uh, slash mongo files put uh, the file name is mongodb one dot jpg and semicolon so I'll click on enter well all right as you can see in the status it is connected to mongodb localhost and it has had it grid file mongodb one and i think it is successful now so let's just go to uh, you know, MongoDB shell now, and let us see whether or not it is created. So just, let's just go to, uh, let's open MongoDB shell. So as you can see, the shell has started. So now in order to find uh, whether or not the GridFS file is created or not, you have to use the db.fs.chunks.find command. So we can see all the chunks present in the FX collection, uh, by using this command so let's just try to find it so the command is db.fs.files.find so click on that so as you can see it is retrieving the id length chunk size upload date file name and the 
metadata which we have discussed in the earlier uh, you know in the presentation slide on what are the different fields that we get so we can also see uh, the chunks present in the fs dot collection related to the stored file with the following code using the document id in this which is this uh, this object id right so i'm going to use this and try to find how many number of chunks that it has created for this mongodb1.jpg file so the command the query is db.fs dot chunks dot find and inside that open the flower packets and mention the files id field which we are trying to find okay mention colon and mention this uh you know object id that has created which is 639 and so on this right just copy paste that and copy it here and mention make sure it is in single quotes all right let us just close the brackets and the flower brackets as well There is an error. Sorry, I just put another square bracket. So I'm not sure why it is showing, but uh, in, in in most of the cases, the query will return the number of documents that is the whole uh, you know mongodb1.jpg file was divided into how many chunks of data, like for example, 20, 30, and so on so in this way you can use gridfs to store large amounts of files which are more than 16 mb in size in your mongodb database now just to cross verify uh, go to mongodb compass and see how uh, the data in the uh, database has been created so you can see mongodb compass we have a test database that is uh, created and we have the fs dot chunks dot and fs dot files which basically stores the appropriate information of the uh, date the data that we have uh, created in our database right so you can see in fs dot chunks we have id files id n zero which basically uh, you know stores the data in sequential manner like starting from zero one two three and so on and next in fs dot files we also have id length chunk size upload date file name and metadata so that was pretty much all about gridfs and uh, mongodb i guess we have covered almost all the concepts now, GridFS is basically a gift for developers who wants to store huge files in MongoDB. So, if you are someone who is trying to, uh, you know, store data of audio files, image files, or videos files, which is of more than 16 MB, which is the threshold value of MongoDB, which is acceptable rate, on upon which only you can use GridFS. So, in that case, GridFS storage system allows developers to store big files and retrieve only a certain amount of uh, those files whenever needed. And as a result, GridFS is an outstanding MongoDB features that can be used with variety of applications, which makes it an extremely useful tool for modern applications like a NoSQL database like MongoDB. Firstly, let us understand what is MongoDB MapReduce. MapReduce function is widely used to access large data set into a handful of aggregated results. And MapReduce command is used to execute this function. Now, as a result of this, the data is independently mapped and reduced in different spaces before being combined in the function and saved to the specified new collection. This MapReduce function was designed to work with large data sets only. You can perform aggregation operations like max, uh, sum and average on data using MapReduce, which is similar to that of group by in SQL. So, it works independently and in parallel with data aggregation. Now let us understand what are the key parameters in MapReduce. MongoDB provides a MapReduce feature for aggregation purpose. Now generally there are two phases of MapReduce. In the first phase, each document is processed and emits common and redundant part of the document to pass a unique record for the next phase which is the map function. Next we have the reduce function. In the second phase, all the unique parts get together and aggregate to produce a single result and finally we have the query. In this, we'll pass the query to filter the result set. So with the help of MapReduce, user can perform like sorting, filtering and document modification. 
So let us now understand the syntax of MapReduce. The syntax is followed as db.collection.mapreduce and within the parenthesis mention the keyword function and again open the square flower brackets and mention the keyword emit and as we already discussed that MapReduce works on the key value pair so mention the key as well as the value that you want to uh, you know perform aggregation on the data and then we have function again we have to mention the uh, key and values this is basically the reduce operation this is the reduce function we are going to perform here and then mention the return keyword and the reduce function that you are going to perform it can be you know any aggregation uh, you know uh, process and it can be average sum or maximum and inside that we have uh, certain keywords like out query sort and limit so basically if i look if you look at the first part here the collection name it is basically defined as the retrieve documents from the collection by using the map reduce command so we can process large volumes of data using this map reduce method in mongodb so next we have the map reduce keyword it is basically a data processing technique which is used for large data and useful aggregated results of large data in mongodb and next we have uh, the, this first part is the map function guys and next we have the reduce function in this you'll get a clear cut idea on when we get to the execution part so just uh, have an idea on what uh, exactly we are doing here so next we have the out keyword here out is basically uh, specifies the, the that result location of the map reduce operation in mongodb and we can set output as a primary member and on the secondary member we can only set an you know output for this next we have query query defines the as the selection of selection criteria of a document in mongodb so you are basically telling uh, the uh, you know operation basically on the you are filtering the data on which you want to perform aggregation and next we have an optional uh, you know commands like sort and limit as you know sort is used to sort the documents from collection this option is mainly useful for optimization and also next we have limit limit is a specified method that limits the total number of documents in the resultant output so i hope you understood the uh, basic syntax of uh, map reduce model so let us now go ahead and understand how does mongodb map reduce works now every input document in the map reduce operation gets the map face treatment from mongodb that is documents in the collection that match the query condition so key value pairs are output by the mapping function now this map function is used to group all the data based on the key value and next we have the reduce function reduce function is used to perform operations on the map data so the data independently is mapped and reduced in different spaces and then combined together in the function and the result will save to the specified new collection so the reduce phase which gathers and condenses the aggregated data is used by mongodb for keys that have multiple values and the outcomes are then kept by mongodb in a collection so in a nutshell if i have to tell that basically you have to mention the mapping function first you have to define mapping function next you have to define the reduce function to further condense or process the aggregation result now the output of the reduction reduce function could op optionally go through a finalized uh, you know function wherein you are performing the complete you know map reduce function so let us just understand this with a simple example here so let's say i have a uh, certain collections uh, named as orders as you can see on the left side we have four different orders having customer id amount status so we have uh, let's say i think we have two different uh, unique customer ids which is a123 and b212 now i'm basically querying this based on the status that is a and d right so it is querying and it is filtering the records based on this so you can see a123 amount 500 status a next we have again which is a123 amount 250 which is status a again and we also have a123 but the status is d so it is not considering into the into our resultant equation and also we have this b212 which amounts 200 and the status is a so the query is basically filtering the resultant set in our output next we are basically mapping the function we are mapping based on the customer id here so we have two different uh, customer ids which is a123 and b212 so we are and then we are performing the reduce function based on the amount right so it is reducing the value into uh, a123 and b212 
two values that is 500 and 250 for beta 12 it's only 200 so finally if we look at the output we are performing a sum aggregation here and you can see in the final resultant output our uh, you know uh, document which we have uh, saved in a new collection is being retrieved as id a123 value is 750 that is 500 plus 250 and also b212 which is value 200 which are which are saving in a new collection named order totals so this is how exactly map reduce works which is again a uh, similar to that of aggregation you know pipeline method uh, i'll let you know what exactly uh, you know how map reduce is different from aggregation pipeline and when you should be using which method now before going to uh, into that let us go into the execution part and see how uh, map reduce works in mongodb shell so as you can see mongodb shell has started so firstly uh, let us uh, see the databases for that i'm using the show dbs command so again we'll be using the same uh, simply code database so use Simply code one, and let us now see what are the collections present in this database. So it will list all the uh, different collections present in this. Uh, I mean documents that are present in this collection. So we'll be using a uh, marks, uh, you know, collection uh, for this uh, to perform map reduce. So let me just uh, retrieve the values that are present in this. So db dot marks dot find. All right, when you press the enter it will retrieve all the records so as you can see we have uh, various fields like id name subject and marks so we have like id 101 name ravi maths 94 and similarly we have different subjects like science history maths uh, english and so on so we'll be performing map reduce on this collection and see how it how it exactly performs now what we are going to do is we have to apply a map reduce operation to this marks collection to group them by uh, let's say subject and then add the marks scored in each subject. So to process this each input document we have to define the map function first. This map function basically refers to the document that the map reduce operation is processing in that function. And for each document the function maps the marks field to the subject and outputs the marks and the both subject and marks together so let's understand how to uh, write the how to define uh, the map function first and the query is written as var and mention any keyword here it can be map here or you can even uh, keep it as mapping function mapping function one you can define as per your own choice equals to mention the function keyword close the uh, square brackets open the square uh, flower brackets and mention the keyword emit and in that we have to write the function which is used with this dot so we are performing aggregation on subject and marks right so we have to mention these two parameters here so mention subject comma this dot marks close the square brackets flower brackets and mention the semicolon and press enter all right we have now defined the mapping fun function first so next we have to uh, define the reduce function so the reduce function uh, syntax is also similar mention var again mention uh, the uh, param i mean the function name as per your own choice i'm just taking here it as reduce equals to mention the function keyword again and you have to pass two parameters here since you have uh, passed subject and marks for uh, our uh, you know aggregation function so just pass any two values it can be of any name it can you can take it as key and value or you can even use subject or marks so i'm just using the subject and marks again here subject comma marks and mention the uh, open the flower brackets and you have to return this parameter right you have to return this function now i want to perform let's say uh, the aggregation operation like let's say sum so i'll write array dot since it is a, a document and we have various fields i'm just writing the array here array dot sum and inside that mention the parameter which you are performing uh, the summation which is basically marks right so just close the brackets and close the flower brackets as well and enter all right now we have also uh, defined the reduce function now we are left with 
uh, only map reduce uh, operation right so let us now perform the map reduce operation so the syntax for that is db dot mention the collection name that is marks which we have taken mention the map reduce keyword make sure that r in reduce is in capital letters otherwise it will throw an error and in that pass the uh, both mapping and reduce function names that you have taken so we have taken it as map comma reduce so it can be any name that you have chosen it can be like mapping function one or as i said earlier it can be any name but make sure you're passing the same value that you have taken and mention the comma again and in the flower brackets now we have to mention the keyword out as we discussed in our syntax previously and now we can give any uh, you know collection name you know to your output uh, resultant set it can be of any uh, choice so i'm just uh, naming it as the result here I think it will be good to go. So let me just execute the statement. All right. Uh, it is throwing an error. Collection dot map it is is deprecated user aggregation instead. Okay, I'm not sure uh, why it is uh, showing that, but we can see result. It is saying okay one. That means it has been successfully executed. So let us now and uh, see whether it's whether or not the aggregation function that is summation has been performed or data set or not so for that i'm again using the find command uh, db dot mention the uh, collection name that you have mentioned inside the parameter and map reduce operation db dot result dot find enter uh, as you can see we have total four subjects and the summation values are showing as 93 96 i'm not sure why uh, it should perform the summation operation so let's just check for history we have 93 and for history again 96 all right so it is showing simultaneously i mean side by side uh, it shouldn't be like that i'm not sure why it is uh, showing in this way so let's just uh, try to perform another operation and see whether it is showing for them as well I'm just performing an average, uh, you know, operation here. All right. Let me just check. Okay, we have that passed out. Uh, let me just uh, perform the map reduce function as well. Just copy paste this, and you can just change the name as result one. Okay and click enter i think it's created so let us find again db dot uh, which is again result one dot find uh, well i think uh, there is some issue with the back end of the mongodb database i'm not sure why it is uh, throwing an error like this because average value should be like uh, this average of 40 let's say 93 and 96 right 49 and 47 it's showing in a different way for maths it's 98 so it's average it's 49 and for uh, 94 it's 47 and the combined value we have to get but i'm not sure why it is uh, throwing that error so we'll get back to you guys uh but the syntax and the execution is uh, the same you i think there is no mistake in the uh, syntax that you have written here it is same there might be some issue with the backend, so we'll just get back to you uh, again. So stay tuned for that. And well, I think that's all about map reduce. We have discussed almost everything. Uh, you know what map reduces, its syntax, how it works, and how uh, you know how it is used. You know instead of aggregation. And that brings us to the main question on, you know, which method you have to be using, whether it's aggregation pipeline method or it is map reduce, you know, function. Now, complex queries are difficult to handle in aggregation framework. It can be useful, but I would say it is not recommended for complex queries. Whereas if you take small data sets, small data sets will take a long time to load in map reduce. And even large data sets will take the same amount of time to process. Now, whether or not the data set is small or large, it will take the same amount of time to execute. So as a result, large data sets should be handled using the map reduce functions always and it is a an recommended option. The map reduce function can handle, you know, large data sets more quickly due to its, uh, maybe it's, its flexibility over, you know, large data sets. So you can always use this uh, while you are, you know, handling large uh, volumes of data 
and on the other side you can use the aggregation pipeline to handle small data sets you know for a regular usage when you're performing small calculations that is present in your you know uh, documents that is present in your collections i would say so this is how uh, both aggregation and map reduce are different from each other and when you have to use them and I hope you understood that as well. As you know that MongoDB relationship represents how multiple documents are logically connected to each other in MongoDB. It provides two types of relationships namely embedded and referenced. Embedded documents capture relationship between data by storing related data in a single document structure. On the other hand, reference models store the relationship between data by including links or references from one document to another. Now, to implement a normalized database structure in MongoDB, we use the concept of reference relationship. That is, if you look at the left side of the uh, screen here, you, you can have an example where it is a reference model where we have student collection and inside we have ID and then we have another uh, you know document contact details where we are referencing using this student document, right? So in that way, we can use reference model for that. So we use this concept of reference relationship also referred to as manual uh, references in which we manually store the reference document ID inside another document. Now, what if the data that you're trying to search isn't present in different uh, collection or in different database? And that's where you have to use dbrefs. dbrefs are references from one document to another using the value of the first document ID field, collection name and optionally its database. DBRFs basically allow you to uh, more easily reference documents stored in multiple collections or database. So if you look at this example, I have a user collection here and a post collection here. In the user collection, I have ID, name, post as my fields and I'm trying to fetch those from the post collection, which is another collection in in that case, right? So if I'm trying to retrieve data from another collection, which may be present in another database, in such case, you have to reference the database that you're trying to search for and that is where we use dbref so and that brings us to the main part what is you know mongodb database references mongodb database references allow you to more easily reference documents stored in multiple collections or database so relationship between documents can be represented using this uh, dbrefs which offer a standard format and type so if a database needs to communicate with a variety of frameworks and tools present in mongodb database the dbref format offers common links for representing the data between the documents however in cases where a document contains references from different collections in that case we have to use mongodb dbrefs so it basically represents a document rather than a specific reference type. And if you're trying to uh, find data in more than one collection, in such case, you have to use MongoDB database references. All right, I hope you understood what it is and let us now move ahead and understand uh, the various parameters that we use, you know, while writing, you know, database reference syntax. First, we have the $REF keyword. Now, REF field basically holds the name of the collection, whereas where the reference document resides. Next, we have the ID field. The ID field basically contains the value of the ID field in the reference document. And finally, we have the optional DB, which contains the name of the database where the document or the reference document resides. So in MongoDB, these are the three important fields which should be used in order to implement DBREF's relationship as follows. Let us now understand the syntax of MongoDB database reference and how it is exactly used. Now, let's say if I have an address collection here, which I'm basically uh, creating two different fields, which is ID and city. So the command is the db.address.insert and ID is 145 and city is Bangalore. Next, we have another uh, document, which is db.address.insert, which is the ID is 124, city is Delhi. So firstly, we have inserted two documents in our address collection. Now, let us move ahead and see and how we can implement this using another uh, you know collection which is which might be present in different database now let's say if i have another student collection and i'm in that i'm inserting records wherein i'm inserting records of uh, student details like id i'm providing as one is first name of the student is rahul here so as you can see here inside uh, you know the address id which is the database reference field which is part of the document 
or the collection student collection present in this collection we are using mongodb reference approach to refer the address id present in another collection which we have taken from the address collection here after defining three fields which are basically ref id and optional db so the ref is basically we are providing the field which you want to reference have a provider reference to the collection that you are trying to connect here so earlier we mentioned the id and the address in the address collection right so i am referring to that that's why i am providing the collection name as address and id as 105 and database is optional you can keep whatever you want i am just taking simply it as simply code one and similarly we are again inserting another document and again we are referencing it with the dbref uh, dbref field which is again address id and for reference i'm taking again address collection and id as 124 and db dot simply code now you might have a question now what exactly and how exactly mongodb DB, uh, dbref works here now the syntax is followed as var student db.student.find1 which we use in order to uh, find the data now i'm trying to search the first name with the name of rohan so i want to get the details or the address of this student whose name is rohan so for that i'm querying as var student address equals to student.address id and after that mention the syntax as db in the within the square brackets student address dot dollar ref dot find id where student address dot id now what does it mean so i'm basically connecting both the uh, address collection and the student collection and that is what i'm referring here student address dot reference and student address dot id so in order to get the address of uh, the student rohan you have to basically uh, provide a reference to both these uh, collections so that is what i'm doing here so when you execute this statement this will be the final output now for rohan we have uh, the id which is 145 and his city the address is bangaluru so this is how exactly dbref works in mongodb and that brings us to the end of today's session guys in this tutorial we have revised the concepts of data relationships in mongodb for the with the likes of manual references used for data modeling in the mongodb and compared it uh, against the concepts of mongodb dbrefs where the former is used when the references are to be made to the documents present in the same collection so you can use manual references when you are trying to make references in the same documents or which are present in the same collection and the other uh, you know part which is mongodb db refs approach is used when the references are to be made to the documents present in different collections and in different database now the main question comes is why is no longer mongodb dbrefs concepts is not used it is deprecated uh, all around the world and it is not a suggested method when you are trying to uh, work on this mongodb database and that is the reason also mongodb documentation recommends manual references unless you have documents referred to in multiple locations or the collections in a database so when you have multiple collections for your references to target we would highly recommend it's still easier to store the object id and collection name in the own object without specifying or with a special name of dbrefs and that won't break if someone insert the field out of the order now all the dbrefs haven't been deprecated in mongodb as such and the functionality is unlikely to go away but hopefully you can see there are good reasons on why to use and how to avoid this function that we have discussed in this tutorial how to use covered queries and analyze those covered queries and the performance that it creates while you query a mongodb database so which helps us to query data more quickly so without any further ado let's get started all right now what are covered queries now we know that in every database including mongodb indexes play a crucial role mongodb queries are executed more quickly when indexes are used as you know we have discussed in our previous tutorials on mongodb indexing so if you haven't checked that out make sure you check that out on our channel we have a dedicated playlist on various mongodb concepts as well wherein we have covered mongodb indexing as well so you make sure you check that out now indexes basically provide users with an efficient way of querying data so if you ran a query to find specific documents let's say in a collection of uh, thousands or lakhs of documents without any indexes mongodb would have to search the entire collection in order to find the requested document in your query however mongodb would use indexes if you had them to reduce the number of documents that needed to be searched in the collection now there is an additional 
you know part of indexing that is covered queries so you've probably heard that column indexing is an excellent way to improve query performance by reducing the number of disk access that are required now covered queries is basically a mongodb specific application of field indexing in which all the query columns are already indexed now it basically avoids collection scan just like the uh, normal indexing so it allows the database to search through less document to satisfy a query without an index mongodb has to scan through all the documents to ensure it has answered the query correctly now covered queries are extremely fast because mongodb does not have to examine any other documents other than the ones that have been indexed so it only examines document in your query that you have provided the indexing uh, that you have provided the fields that are already indexed and finally uh, fetching data becomes uh, much faster using you know covered queries because uh, covered queries return results from an in index directly without having to access the source document and are therefore very efficient as well now there are cases when you have to consider when to use covered queries now covered queries are only used when all the fields in the query are part of the index so let's say if you're trying to find uh, any field in your query it should be a part of index that you have already created only then covered queries can come into picture or can be used in a more efficient way next is all the fields returned in the query should be of are in the same index now it can be a composite index it can be a multi key index but make sure that the fields that you are returning in your query should be in the same index and finally no fields in the query are equal to null that is field value should not be null in in such case covered queries will not be uh, followed now before getting into the execution part let us just consider a simple example on how query uh, covered queries works in mongodb so let's say i have a collection here which has uh, three different documents uh, of uh, various customers like rahul pranav and keerthi and the orders that they have placed and the various personal details like address their payment mode email order total order items we have an array field here wherein we are storing uh, various fields in ordered items like item name like notebook paper general or postcard and even their price and the quantity of the items so we have three different documents present in our collection here now if i want to create a simple index let's say i'm creating an index on orders item field wherein i'm creating a particular index on the price here so and also payment mode i'm creating an index so the query would be db.orders.create index orders item dot price i'm mentioning one that is in ascending order the index is created in ascending order and also for payment mode i'm creating an index now generally what you have to do is uh, what you do in general for indexing or while querying your uh, data that is present in your collection is you just mention the customer or let's say if i am trying to find the customer name here that is rahul if i consider this example here it says db.orders.find customer rahul orders item dot price one payment code one now we are we are providing the all the index field that we have created that is orders item dot price and payment code but the query that i'm trying to find is the data of customer here that is rahul which we have not indexed so let's say i'm just having three uh documents here now if there are let's say 10000 docu uh, 10000 documents that are present in collection and maybe we have more than one rahul in such case it becomes difficult right even the indexes uh, is become an anomaly here it is not as fast as what we have thought here now instead of that i'm just taking another query now let's say i have created index on orders item dot price and payment mode right now what i'm doing is i am trying to uh, return the data or i'm querying for a uh, data wherein i am trying to find the payment mode is equals to card now if you look at clearly into our you know uh, index query that we have created payment mode is already included in the query index right we have already created earlier and i am trying to find it in the same way so i am trying to find payment mode card which is again a uh, already created index which is payment mode so in that case instead of looking through all the uh, data present in documents it will simply look at only the ones which are already indexed and that is the main advantage of uh, you know covered queries it returns results from an index directly without having to access any source document and 
it can be more efficient uh, more than just indexing right so i hope you understood how you know covered queries are actually working in mongodb and let's just uh, go into mongodb shell now and get into the execution part and understand it in a more clear way and also finally we'll analyze you know how this query is working and how it is different from indexing in mongodb so as you can see mongodb shell has started so the first command would be is basically the show dbs which will allow us to show show all the database that are present in the mongodb database so we have the simply code uh, one database so we'll be using that only right or uh, use simply code so it says switch to db we are good to go now let us see the collections that are present in this uh, database so we have different collections like collection name employee marks and new employees so let us just consider uh, all uh, con i mean a collection that we've already created here which is employee so let's just find the, the uh, details or the documents that are present in this collection so i'm using the v dot employee dot find command for that so when you enter it will display all the records uh, or the documents that are present in this collection all right now let us now create a covered query now creating a covered query is similar to that of how you create an index uh, so the query would be db dot employee dot create and mention the create index keyword make sure the i is capital otherwise it will throw an error so let's just uh, create and covered index on the fields let's say we have manager id and department id right so we'll be creating uh you know covered query that is on this two fields so mention the field name that is manager id keep it as one comma and department id as well as well close the brackets all right and click enter so as you can see it says uh, manager id uh, underscore one department underscore id underscore one that means you have successfully created you know covered query on these two fields that is manager id and department id so now let's query or read data from this covered index so for that we'll again use the find operation so let's say i'm trying to find you know a particular uh, manager id uh, details right so let's say i want to try find the details of employees whose manager id is 123 in such case i'll use a query that is db dot employee dot find and inside the brackets uh, let's say manager id is 123 that i'm going to search for close the brackets and mention the indexes that you have created here which is again manager id which is one comma department id which is again one here close the brackets i think we're good to go so click on enter so as you can see in the above query when we find document where we are trying to find manager id which is 123 covered index which is on manager id as well as department id is already loaded into the ram and as we know that so as we know that manager id is already present in a compound index that is why it reads very quickly and we avoid scanning of too many documents in database so this is just a basic example on how to create a covered query so let's just create a you know another field where we understand how covered query exactly works now let's say i'm trying to create an index on the first name let's say first name as well so let's take the query as db dot create index I'm just copy pasting it here and let us uh, create you know uh, another index for our you know collection for this so it will be first name here all right first name close the brackets so as you can see our query has been successfully created now let's say i'm trying to find the employee details uh, using this uh, you know index that you have created now 
so I'll just so let's say I'm trying to find an employee uh, whose first name is Shelly now by default since I've created index on manager ID as well as department ID it will be directly indexed and display in our result and set so make sure you keep uh, the first name field also because we have uh, created the index for that as well so mention first name as one comma all right i think we are good to go now let's just uh, see the result for this so there was a bit error in the first time that we we're trying to retrieve uh, now shelly which we have taken uh, her name in all caps uh, which is not exactly present in the same way in our uh, you know collection so make sure uh, you keep the name as exactly which is present in our database which is capital s and the rest of them are small caps here so when i try to uh, find the you know result and set for this the final output is the first name which is her name shelly and we are getting the manager id as well as the department id that she belongs to which is manager id is 101 and department id is 110 now if you look at this query covered index will not be available when you use this following query which is db dot employee find first name which is shelly and we are mentioning the indexes that we have created for first name manager id department id because when we find a document where first name is shelly which has covered index on uh, basically the first name manager id and the department id which is already loaded into the ram but by default uh, you know underscore id is also present here that is the field that is not present in the covered index is also being displayed so despite of you know manager id department id present in our compound index we cannot avoid scanning of too many documents in our database so we need to exclude uh, you know underscore id as well if you're trying to use covered index so make sure you include underscore id in your uh, query as well so the query now that would uh, you know followed as with the help of uh, you know indexes that we have created make sure with the first name keep the id as zero only then top so i'm mentioning underscore id after the uh, department id keeping it as zero so let us just find it now so as you can see we are only retrieving first name shelly manager id and department id and finally uh, underscore id is being eliminated or dismissed from this so that was all about covered index guys now you have to remember that covered index does not work when field on which we are trying to cover in covered index is an array or an embedded document that is when you are trying to retrieve data from a sub document or a field that is present in an array field in such case covered index won't work so let us now try to understand how to analyze this query now the performance of indexing is very crucial for our database performance right so we need to understand how it is being executed you know in the back end as well so for that we'll use the explain command here so for that the query is same guys just copy paste the query that you have uh, you know created and after that mention the explain keyword or uh, which is the explain command here So there was a bit issue or uh, error in the uh, you know copying this code guys. So I'm just copying paste uh, the query that we have written here, which is a db dot dot find first name Shelly, first name manager ID, department ID, and all the indexes that I've created on. And finally, you have to mention the explain command here. Now analyzing queries is very important aspect of measuring how well or the effective the database and the indexing design is. So for that I'm using the explain you know command here which basically provides information on the query indexes that you have used you know the performance uh, that is the time that it has taken to execute your query and other statistics. So it is very helpful when analyzing how well your indexes are optimized uh, you know while you are using an indexing or a covered query. So let's just uh, see how it works here click on enter. So you can see it is displaying all the details of you know the performance or the optimization of the query that has taken place in the background here so you can see we have various fields you know listed in all this here you can see the namespace index filter set as false and all that now we are only concerned with here is this stage input stage is ix scan that is 
index scan the short form for this is index scan so basically that we have performed a index scan on the query that we have uh, you know created in our resultant set so it it basically says another condition where you'll find this is a collection scan that is co lls and scan so you may find that that is you are not providing any index instead you are finding all the documents one by one simultaneously using a collection scan that is another uh, you know scenario in which we consider you know the type of scanning that we have done here and you can also see that index name that we have uh, created that is first name and it's multi key it's it's false unique false partial false and so on so it basically indicates the number of you know documents that have matched that are returned here it indicates the total number of documents that we have scanned and indicates the total number of documents or index entities that we have scanned here all this you can find using the explain operator here firstly let us discuss what is atomic operations in general now in context of any database atomic operation means that you either commit to the entirety of the transaction occurring in the database or have no transaction at all so it is basically a complex series of database operations in which either all or none of the operations are being performed while you're conducting any transactions or you're trying to uh, you know perform any operations on your data now essentially an atomic transaction ensures that any commit you make finishes the entire operation successfully or in case of any lost connection in the middle of operation due to power failure or any other external uh, you know factors the database is rolled back to its state prior to the commit being initiated so it makes sure that partial changes will be rolled back if there is uh, any system failure as such now this is important for preventing crashes or outages from creating cases where the transaction was partially finished to an unknown overall state now we all know sql provides you know asset properties uh, concept wherein you can perform transactions on your multiple tables right you can perform various operations like insert update and delete on your tables and even if there if there is if a crash occurs during a transaction with no atomicity you can you can't exactly know how far along the process was before the transaction was interrupted but by using atomicity you can ensure that either the entire transaction was done on your you know uh, table or none of it was done so as you know it follows the various atomic asset properties like atomicity which is either all the operations inside a transaction take place or none of it you know does take place and we have consistency now consistency means the data must be consistent before and after the transaction now let's say if you are performing a transaction uh, from an account a to account b for example if account a has transferred 500 and let's say if uh, the account b has overall 1000 in his account now if you are performing this transaction now after the transaction is done the account b should have 1500 right now in case of any failure or you know the multiple errors even after that it must be consistent so next that is where we have isolation transaction gets successful in case of system failures that is what we were talking about no matter what the circumstance or the deciding factor of what has happened to your data it should maintain consistency that is transaction should be successful in case of any system failures and finally we have durability durability means changes made to the database must be permanent now you might work on a database wherein you have created a temporary change but a transaction is something which is you know successfully happens when you are you know making a database changes permanently and that is what asset properties also say that you know changes made to the database must be permanent now coming to mongodb what is atomic operations in mongodb and how can we achieve that now we know that mongodb does not support transactions in a database therefore in the application uh, of your database pay attention to this point whatever the design we do not ask mongodb to ensure data in integrity but mongodb provides many atomic operations you know such as saving a document modify update and delete as per a requirement which are basically the atomic operations that are done in mongodb database so either this is the so called atomic operation to save the document to mongodb or not save anything at all so basically mongodb maintains atomicity by keeping all related information in a single document which need updation now while performing any uh, you know changes or the updation on the documents if there is an error 
it should either update all the documents or it shouldn't update anything at all. Now, if you take, let's say, a limited number of documents while processing, let's say I have 100 documents and I have successfully, you know, updated 50, but the rest 50 are not updated and because of some external failure or system crash or crash failure, anything. This might occur due to any external factor, but that is not the case where we expect our database to, you know, exactly work in that way. We want it to either update all the 100 documents or just uh, not update any of them. Now, this can be very useful uh, and very, uh, I mean, becomes crucial when you're working with a large number of documents in your collection. Let's say if I have 20 million, uh, you know, such documents in my database, it, it becomes quite difficult, right? So in that case, what atomic operation does is it keeps the related information that you want in a single document, which is an embedded type of uh, document that saves all your data. Now, there are some constraints, you know, that we have previously discussed that, you know, for a database, for a NoSQL database like MongoDB, atomic operation uh, or atomicity is not that easy to achieve. So, at MongoDB does not support for multi-document atomic transactions. So, if you want to maintain atomicity uh, on your database and while performing, you know, while performing and saving data on multiple documents, it is not feasible. Now, also MongoDB allows atomic operations just on a single document so in just a in one collection if it has a single document only then you can achieve atomic operation so atomicity is only maintained or executed at the document level now like sql which uh, you know achieves atomicity at the table level here in mongodb it is achieved only at the document level and not the whole collection you know level all right, so let us now understand how exactly this works here. Now, let's say I have a customer details collection wherein I'm having a document here, as you can see. So, which the above document is basically an embedded document here. So, as you can see, right, uh, where we have the embedded, the customer information according to the item purchased in the item bought by field. Now, the single document will help us to check whether the item is available in stock or not when a customer places a new order through item available field. So if an item is available, then we'll subtract the item available field by one and insert a new customer name and date of purchase details in the item bought by field where we have the details of all the customers of the document. So in this following example, you can see we have the uh, a particular ID, let's say we have taken as 1899 and the item name is iPhone which comes under the category of smartphone and then we have given warrant, warranty period as one, city Bengaluru, country India and the store name or the branch is Koramangala. So total we have a total of 999 units in the uh, Koramangala branch here and at present we only have 148 available items and the list of all the uh, details of customers who have purchased iPhone from this store has been, you know, embedded into the item bought by field where you have list of all customers like Rohit who purchased uh, one quantity of iPhone on 26 September, similarly Kirti who purchased two items on 26 September and so on. So for, just for our understanding, I've, I've just given the four uh, details. Now let's say if I have to, you know, add someone you know who's trying to purchase another one in such case i have to update this document here so how can we do that now for that we have different commands to perform atomic operations so first we have this set command set command is used to specify a key and update that particular field and if the key does not exist it will only create a null value next we have inc inc or increment it can be a numeric value of the document uh, with a document field in order to increase or decrease an operation. Next we have push. This value is added to the field to go inside the uh, document. It must be an array type field only then it will accept the value that is it can be an embedded which is basically an array field. So if the field does not exist a new array type will be added. And next we have the pull which is the opposite of push that is it is used to delete a field from an array of value which is equal into the document. And finally, we have the rename, which is used to modify the field name if necessary. So let us now understand the syntax and let's try to understand how to perform the, uh, you know, updation on this field here. 
So in this following example, we are going to use the find and modify command in order to perform the atomic operation on our uh, you know collection here. So this basically command helps to search and update the document simultaneously and it it's, it's an operation on a document and it tries to achieve atomicity that is if the find condition matches a document the update is performed on that document and all the concurrent queries and additional updates on that uh, document are not affected until the current update is totally complete. So the syntax is followed as db dot now let's say our uh, collection name is customer dot details find and modify and inside the brackets the query would be query mention the id which is 1899 which we have taken item available. So we are checking whether the item available we are giving the condition as greater than zero. So if and only if the item is greater than zero only then we have to update and then we are incrementing the value that is in the item available we are incrementing by decreasing the value in the total number of items available that is by minus one and then we are pushing the value that is we are inserting the new record into the orders bought by uh, field wherein we have the uh, customer details. So I am pushing uh, this details of customer name let's say Ajay and the date of purchase is 1st October. So I hope you've clearly understood the syntax and how it goes. So let's just go to mongodb shell and see how it gets executed. So as you can see mongodb shell has started. Uh, we'll use the show dbs command in order to view all the databases present in our database. So we'll be again uh, using the simply code one database. So simply code one. All right, let us see the collection present inside that for that I'm using show collections. So as you can see, we have customer details which I've already created in hindsight. So we'll be using that. So let's just try to find what are the uh, details that are present in this. So db dot customer details dot find so as you can see, uh, we previously discussed the same example here and that is also what I've created in this as well. So ID is 1899, item name iPhone, smartphone, category, warranty period 1, city details, country, branch, item total, 999, items available, 147, item bought by. Now these are the list of customers. I'm just including only 5. Uh, I don't, I didn't have the time to, you know, insert all the uh, details of all the customers. It's, it's time taking actually. So just to understand for your basic, uh, you know, level, I'm just creating only four documents here. You know, I mean, five documents or the details of the customer. Now, let's say, uh, as discussed in the, uh, you know, uh, presentation. Now, I'm trying to add another customer whose name is Ajay and his date of purchase. For that, the following query would be db dot customer details dot use find and modify make sure the m is capital otherwise it will throw an error and inside that i'll write the following query which is the keyword query mention the id name which is underscore id which is equals to 1899 comma item available we have the item available field right so mention that item available is make sure it is greater than use the dollar greater than uh, operator is greater than zero only then our updation or the uh, transaction will be completed in this so close the flower brackets and now what we are trying to update the value right so mention the update and we are using the increment operator here so dollar inc put semicolon and now we know that if the item is purchased it has to reduce its count by one so the total item available is 147 here so i am decrementing uh, decrementing the value by one so it should become 146 so keep remembering and just uh, see that how it is reflecting in our resultant set now so item available should be minus one it should decrease by one value all right so close the brackets mention comma and now we are pushing the uh, customer details into the item bought by field so we have to mention that as well so dollar push mention the item bought by field wherein we'll uh, embed all the details of the customer item bought 
by mention the semicolon and inside the flower brackets mention the customer details customer name is let's say a j comma and mention the date as well so let's say i'm taking it as first october october 2022 all right and include the inverted commas and mention all the flower brackets that we have used right i think this is the query i think we are good to go now so press enter oh, i think there is an error so the error says that you know db dot customer details is find and modify is not a function i think uh, a also should be in caps i think we just forgot that so let me just copy paste it again and change that so instead of small a here for and i just keep capital a i think that will be fine so is there let's just check once again uh, I think we are good to go now. I think there's no more errors. I think it should be fine. Well, as you can see, it has successfully executed. Now, in order to find whether it has, you know, successfully updated what you're trying to find in our, you know, our document, let's just use the find command again. So I'm using db dot customer details dot find. So as you can clearly see that. Uh, see previously we had items available 147 now it is showing item available as 146 and it has also added the customer details which is customer name is Ajay and the date is 1st October 2022. So what we're trying to do here is here we first searched for the item with the ID which we have created which is 1899. Now when such item is found we are basically incrementing the item available field by minus 1. That is the logic behind this is if you purchase an item, it will reduce its count by one and updating the item bought by field, which is an embedded field, which stores the data of the customers, right? So by adding the customer name and the date of purchase of item, and then we are printing the overall purchase detail by using find and find method, right? And we can observe that the item available field has changed from 147 to 146. And also the new customer details have been added into your item bought by field so in this way you can create uh, you know you can achieve atomicity in a single document rather than multi documents that you can perform now we also have uh, two different options of doing this which is update one and update many as well so as the name suggests update one method modifies a single document in a collection whereas update many modifies one or more documents in the collection so let us know and uh, let us know if you want to create a separate video on uh, how to create that as well or type in the comments below if you can try that and we will see if you have the uh, you know knowledge on, on how to create uh, you know atomicity by creating update one and update many. So let us see if you can try to write the command for that. So make sure to write uh, in the comments below and we'll try to uh, answer your you know queries or uh, any doubts that you have gotten while writing the code well i think that is pretty much uh, all about the atomic operation in mongodb that we have discussed here which brings us to the end of the capped collections and see how it is different from a normal collections discuss its advantages and disadvantages and when should be using all right so what is capped collection in mongodb now capped collection is a special type of collection that has either a fixed number of documents in a collection or only a fixed number of elements in it it basically creates new documents by overriding the oldest documents in the collection and also capped collections have maximum size or document counts that prevent them from growing beyond the maximum threshold that has been available now all capped collection must specify a maximum size and may also specify a maximum document count as well mongodb removes older documents if a collection reaches this maximum size limit before it reaches the maximum document count 
So overall, the structure and functionality of a capped collection supports high performance and also the high throughput performance for applications and the overall performance of CRUD operations like create, read and delete operations as well. So let us now understand why we use MongoDB capped collection. But before we begin, we have to understand how it is different from a normal collection and how exactly they differ from each other. So basically in comparison to normal collection, capped collections are created in advance and are only of fixed size. Whereas the normal collections are created dynamically and it generally uh, or automatically grows in size to fit the extra data that we uh, need to incorporate in our database. So these capped collections on the other hand are designed to consume less space and are rotating. That means once allocated space is full, it will start writing from older documents again. And that is the reason it is called as a circular buffer collection or simply a circular correction, which means whenever the collection size is exhausted, it starts deleting the old documents automatically without explicitly providing any commands to the database. And some operations that are not allowed on a capped collections is that documents cannot be removed with a command like uh, you know drop collections and also updates that make document to grow in size are not allowed also. So that comes to the main point on why we use you know MongoDB capped collections. First one is in order to ensure the insertion order is maintained. So capped collection offer very high performance as we discussed earlier for CRUD operations because they preserve insertion order. So unlike normal collection which keep on adding uh, you know the data into its collection, uh, capped collections on the other hand make sure that once the data is completely full in the collection it will automatically delete and the insertion operation is done on the basis of uh, you know the first come and first serve basis. And next also we discussed auto removal of oldest documents. So in order to make room for the new documents you know into a collection, capped collection basically uh, automatically removes the oldest documents in the collection without writing you know scripts or expl expl explicit remove operations in our uh, you know MongoDB database. And finally it stores the catch data that needs to be refreshed frequently. Now we know that MongoDB is a huge NoSQL database and we have a lot of amounts of data that is being generated on a daily basis. So in the same way we need to process or you know retrieve that information quickly right. So there's a lot of catch, catchy data that is being generated on a fre uh, re frequent basis. So in order to you know store all that information capped collections can be a useful uh, tool for you. So these were some of the main reasons why we use MongoDB capped collections. All right, let, next let us discuss some uh, characteristics of capped collections in MongoDB. Now firstly, no delete operations can be performed. Now as discussed earlier, uh, if you are looking to delete a document from a capped collection, then basically you are looking into the wrong direction as we cannot delete documents from a capped collection. The old documents in a capped collection can only be deleted automatically upon insertion of the new documents when the allocated size uh, to the capped collection has been exhausted or the maximum limit has been reached. Next, all the elements in collection should have an equal size. So basically when you are creating a capped collection, capped collection you have to mention the size of that capped collection and each element will take the equal size of it. So let's say if you have allocated a size of let's say 100 bytes and you are trying to insert 4 records in that. So each uh, element or each document will take 25 bytes of size. So it shares in equal amounts of size uh, in the collection. Next it works as a queue and because of this no indexing is required. Now a capped collection does not contain any default indexes like in general uh, to the contrast of a normal collection which might seem strange. In addition to this even the ID field lacks an index for this. So MongoDB doesn't waste any time searching for a location to store a new document on the disk. Uh, let's say when you're performing an insert operation on a capped collection, it is possible for MongoDB to add the new document to the end of the capped collection easily. So the insert operations in capped collections run very quickly because there is no wastage in disk space organization and it is also useful to keep log files as well. So MongoDB as we discussed earlier maintains a running log of events you know, including entries such as the in incoming uh, connections, commands, uh, you know, the data that you are being provided and 
all other stuff you know into the database so generally log message log messages are useful for diagnosing issues monitoring your deployment and tuning your performance so in order to uh, keep all these log files and to access them in a frequent manner we use cap collections so these are some of the main characteristics of cap collections i hope you guys have understood so let us now move understand and discuss the syntax that is how to create a capped collection in mongodb now the simple syntax is db dot uh, now you can use the syntax that you use for a create uh, collection right so it is similar to that only db dot create collection mention the collection name as per your size and after that mention the keyword capped and then boolean now boolean here i'll discuss uh, next when we you know go through each of this next we have size mention the number of bytes and next we have max number all right so firstly we have the create collection which is a method to create a new capped collection right next we have a collection name it basically represents the collection name that you want to create uh, we can use any name for the, for our capped collection next we have the capped keyword and then we are specifying a boolean value here so we have to set capped option which is either true or false so if you have set the capped option to true then our collection will be created as a capped collection so in on the other hand if you have specified the capped collection option as false then the collection is created without any cap collection and finally we have the size size option will specify the limit of size for the cap size cap collection sorry so we can specify the size of our collection in bytes in general for cap collections so this parameter is actually mandatory when we have defined a, a collection which is of a cap collection type and finally we have max where you have to provide a number that is how many documents that you want to incorporate in your capped collections and when you want to uh, specify uh, or you know limit the maximum number of documents that are allowed in your collection size option will give preference over the max option in mongodb in general so that was uh, the basic syntax on how to create a capped collection and if you want to know whether your collection has been capped or not you can use this following command which can be uh, visible on your screen which is db dot let's say my uh, you know collection name is capped log collection and if you want to see whether it is created or not i'm using is capped keyword so this is how you can use these commands in order to create and view your collection which is of capped type in your mongodb database so if you understood how to create uh, this i mean the syntax on how to create a cap collection so let us now directly jump into mongodb shell for execution part so as you can see mongodb shell has started and firstly let us look at our databases which will be our first command which is show dbs so again we'll be using the same simply code one database in order to understand how cap collection works so let's let us see the collections that are present so simply code one uh, has various collections like cap the log collection collection name customer details employee marks and new employees so let us now firstly uh, create a capped collection so as we already discussed the syntax of uh, the capped collections so let's just execute it now so the uh, syntax is followed as create mention create collection keyword and inside that mention the capped collection name so let's just take a uh, log collection one so you can keep it a uh, name of your own choice so it's up to your wish close the uh, brackets and uh, open the flower brackets and mention the capped keyword and i'm specifying it as true that is we want to create a new capped collection all right mention it as true and comma mention the size so let's just keep let's say thousand bytes for our capped collection so this is how uh, you basically create a capped collection in your mongodb database click on enter so it will say okay one that means you have successfully created now we have only create uh, you know specified the size to our capped collection so if you want to limit the number of documents that you want to uh, you know insert into your cap collection then you have to mention the maximum size also so for that what we'll do is we'll provide the additional uh, you know max uh, constraint as well so after size mention the max keyword and 
just for our understanding i'm just keeping it a you know where for a simple number i'm just keeping three all right so since i'm keeping 10 three is the number of documents that the collection will collection will overall have so let's say if you're trying to insert another documents after you know inserting first three documents then it will automatically replace with the new one so let's just see how it will work but i think we have to change the collection name again here so i'm just taking it as log collection 2 and okay click on enter all right again it says okay one that means you have successfully created or not created but again let's just find out whether uh, you know collection is capped or not for that we have already discussed we have to use the is capped you know method for that so db dot mention the collection name which is log collection 2 dot is make sure the capped uh, c is capital so it is true so that means we have successfully uh, you know created a capped collection and it is not just a normal collection so let us now try to insert some records or uh, data into our you know this capped collection and see how it works so db dot uh, mention the collection name which is log collection 2 dot again you can use the insert command which is a regular one right so mention the open the flap brackets and let's say let's just take let's just insert a you know a normal a basic type of info let's take a name i'm just taking it as let's say rohan all right so close the brackets all right it is uh Okay, now you might find this warning. It says collection dot insert is depre deprecated. You use insert one insert menu or bulk write uh, as in your command, but it's just fine. You know you can also use just insert. It will work. As you can see, it has successfully created acknowledged true and it has inserted ID. So similarly, we will insert another two documents and see how it actually represents in uh, you know in a real time. So let's just take. Uh, another name let's say uh, Preeti all right and let us take another uh, by above just taking a random name so I think so we have successfully inserted three and since we have put a limit of maximum three I'm just inserting three and what will happen if you're trying to insert the fourth record we'll see how it works so let's just uh, display the records that are present in a collection for that i'm again using our uh, collection name and i'm using the find method here so as you can see it is successfully retrieving all the three documents that is uh, the details of rohan preeti and bayov now what if i'm trying to insert a new document here all right i'm just copying this and let's say i'm trying to insert a fourth document in this uh, I'm trying to insert a new document whose name is let's say Kiran so in such case and if I'm trying to find uh, the data again that is present in our you know log collection too which is a capped collection so you can see that we previously had Rohan, Preeti, Bhaivav now we have Preeti, Bhaivav and Kiran that means the older one which is uh, Rohan has been successfully deleted from our you know uh, collection here so we know that due to the circular and the fixed side nature of the capped collection there are restrictions to this op update operations so whenever you are trying to add a new data and if updating of any document in the collection results in the increase of the document size so previously we had three and now we are increasing it to four that is the size is increasing then mongodb will not update this document in that collection because documents in the capped collections are stored in the order of disk disk storage which ensures the size of a single document does not exceeds its allocated size on the disk so it, that is the reason why uh, it is basically based on the first come first of basis and it will automatically delete the old documents whenever you're trying to trying to insert a new document into our collection so this is how in general you know cap collection works i hope you understood that now let's say if you want to convert you know already present collection which is a non cap collection if you want to change it to a cap collection in such case you can use another query for that right so basically the query would be db dot uh, run command
men open the flower brackets and mention the uh, keyword which is convert capital to T O and capital cap capital C in cap keyword. All right, so let's just enter it. Now let us take uh, one collection here. Let's say I'm trying to uh, change this employee, which is a non-capped collection, into a capped collection. So I'm just specifying employee here. Okay, I forgot to mention the uh, inverted commas. So mention the inverted commas and again provide the size. Let's take a uh, size as 10,000 bytes. I mean, it's, it's uh, your preference. You can give it as per your need and maximum i want to uh, store only 100 uh, documents in this uh, you know cap collection so as you can say it is successfully saying okay one that means you have successfully converted a non capped uh, collection which is employee collection into a capped collection well i think uh, we have covered pretty much all about you know what is a cap collection how to create it its syntax and how it exactly works is authentication in mongodb and we'll show you how to enable authentication so that only authorized users can access the database and its co content present in various collections and documents in mongodb database so what is authentication in mongodb now authentication and authorization are two important concepts of any database authenticating users with your database is a critical security feature as well as the authorization now these two terms might be uh, similar but they have a different meaning to each other now when it comes to authentication identifying all the users who connect to the database is called as authentication on the other hand authorization is basically restricting actions on authenticated users that can perform any operations in your database which is known as authorization now similarly in uh, a no sql database like mongodb we do provide authentication for users in order to uh, curb some unrestricted activity from others uh, while performing you know mongodb operations so this is especially true when the database contains sensitive data such as users accounts for a website or company's data so basically when you enable authentication on your mongodb instance you can specify what user accounts are allowed to do and what level of access they have and what level of uh, you know activity they cannot have so this also means that you can restrict access to certain features to only authorized users working with no authentication can be okay for you know developing a uh, a development or testing environment initially but when you are in production with customers and the data stored inside is mandatory or which is of key importance it is important to restrict access to the database so that only a specific amount of users who have the authenticity or authentication to the database has the access to uh, you know cover all the operations within the mongodb database so that is what exactly is authentication in mongodb it is basically the process of confirming a client's identity that is it requires all clients to authenticate themselves when access control that is whenever the authorization is enabled to them now authentication in, is done in three different ways in three different stages now firstly we have to create a users so users who have access control enabled must identify themselves and are only permitted to take actions that fall under the permissions granted by the role assigned to them now before creating a user you need to have you need to enable access control enabling access control on a mongodb uh, basically deploys the authentication process and finally after giving access control you need to authenticate a user finally you need to provide the username password and the authentication database linked to that user which is required in order to authenticate as per that user now there are various commands you know that you can use to authenticate mongodb database so for creating modifying and delete deleting users within mongodb and configuration and con to configure authentication the core methods you need are db.create user this basically creates a user for authentication purpose Next, we have the db.update user and db.drop user. These two basically updates the details of a user account as well as deletes a MongoDB user account. And finally, we have db.change user password. It basically changes the user uh, passwords, your password used by the user account. So let us now understand how to create authentication in MongoDB. For that, we have already learned that we need to create a user and the syntax is uh, followed as 
db dot create user within the parenthesis mention the user keyword wherein i'm just taking admin and i'm giving the password as one two three abc now we have another criteria where we have uh, we need to mention the roles here and within the parenthesis i mentioned the role as user admin and the database that we are providing is admin database here now once you are uh, done with this it will basically say that it's okay one well, that means you have successfully authenticated but you need another step in order to verify whether it is created or not you need to use the auth that is db dot auth is a keyword wherein you are uh, verifying whether the authentication is done on the database that you have done or not so i'm just checking using this syntax which goes as db dot auth uh, mentioning the database which is admin sorry the user username that you have given is admin and the password we have given is 123abc so this is how you can create authentication in mongodb by using the create user method i hope you understood this so let us now jump into the execution part and see how exactly it is done so as you can see mongodb compass has started now firstly what we'll do is we'll create a database and inside that we'll create a collection and basically then we'll do authentication on this collection wherein we'll do some read and write uh you know restrictions you know for the new years new user who's trying to insert new documents into that collection so let's just create a database first uh let's take let's say i'm creating a student database so i'm keeping a student db and let's take a collection name as student details all right so let's just create it student db has uh, successfully created a database now you can go into this collection and let's just add some data for our reference and uh, for, let's see i'm just going to insert some simple uh document into our this so we'll add basically a field i'm just giving name and the name would be let's say rohan and i'm adding another field let's say age is uh, 25 all right so let's just insert this now we have successfully inserted a document into our collection student and details now we are done with this now let's just go to uh, mongodb shell and uh, get in with the commands now so you can directly open the mongodb shell or even you can use cmd uh, wherein you can open command prompt and you can give the command as mongosh which is basically a connection to mongodb shell which is a shortcut so I'll just wait for it and it will successfully open so let us now see what are the databases that are present in our database so we have various uh, different databases like admin company db config local simply core one student db test right so now you can create authentication on any database as per your wish you can even create uh you know authentication on admin database company db database so for a better better understanding we have considered here student db database so we'll basically use that use student db so student db now let's say show collections and we'll see we have the student details so let us now find the details for that student dot db dot student details dot find so we have inserted one document uh, which is of name rohan and age 25 so this is basically a normal uh, way of creating a document in a database right so let's just create uh, another uh, let's just insert another uh, document into this okay for a reference i'm just taking out a reference and we'll see how when you're trying to add or when you're trying to read or write some operations after authentication how it will impact so i'm just create inserting another one student it will not insert and within the flower brackets mention the single quotes name let's say name as uh pavan mention in single quotes close the brackets and let us take age as 28 close the flower brackets and enter so it will say it is successfully executed now let's just try to find this again so we have inserted two documents here now this is done now we have to create basically a a user for creating the authentication for our database now we'll see how to create that now since we already discussed i'm just copy pasting it here guys 
So as you can see, I am creating a user which is of username Rahul and I am giving password as per your choice as let's say 1, 2, 3, ABC and then I am providing the roles which is role as user admin let's say and the DB is student DB. Alright, so press enter. So there was a bit of error in the code guys. Now basically there are some certain you know keywords for role here. So for admin access you have to provide only as admin not as user admin and I am here taking the role as just read so that whenever you are trying to perform a read operation on that it will provide an authentication for our, that for our uh, database. So you can see it was successfully created and I chose ok and 1. Now we are done with this part. Now basically we have just created an user. Now we have to enable the authentication. So for that you have to find the mongodb.cfg file. So now where you will find that is basically in your uh, you know where you have installed your mongodb. So let's just navigate to that uh, path first. So open uh, the C folder where or the location where you have said I have saved this in C drive. So go to program files. Go to mongodb folder click on server click on 6.0 go to bin and you can see mongod.cfg so this is the file we want click right click and let's say open with notepad so once you open this you'll find a log a, like a description of all the configuration that it has when you scroll down a bit you'll find that hashtag security so remove this con a comment and uh, just write as authentication as enabled okay what this does is basically you're giving control access to your uh, database so, so that if any other user is trying to you know read your operations from your database he can uh, use this so let's just save this the program file or you don't have permission to save this location contact the administrator to obtain permission click on yes so we have successfully given the authentication where you have uh, provided the command line of auth authentication enabled. Now once you are done with this you have to restart your system. So for that you have to basically stop the services of MongoDB. Now for that what you will do is basically just uh, go to your uh, home page. Try to find for MongoDB. Scroll down a bit and I think you will find here. Uh, yeah so MongoDB server it's running. Click Right click on that. So we have successfully uh, restarted the MongoDB uh, server. So let's just go to uh, MongoDB Mongo shell again. Open CMD and type Mongo. All right. Now let's say show DBS and let us use the student DB collections. All right. Now we have student details in our uh, collections of student DB database. Now, since we have authenticated it, let's just verify whether it is created or not. So for that, I'm using db.auth, which you have discussed earlier. Open the uh, square brackets. So within the uh, inverted quotes, mention the username that we have provided as student DB only for our uh, database, and mention the password so we have kept as 123 abc all right so just close it and press enter so it says ok one that means you have successfully created uh, the authentication on your database now whenever you're trying to retrieve data uh, it will make sure that you know only a limited number of people having this username and this password has this uh, you know in order to open this collection so let's just try to find whether it is showing or not so for that i'm using the student details dot find command and you can see the details are being displayed for our uh, the user who's trying to uh, retrieve the data that is present in our student data student details database after uh, you know accessing the after getting the authentication from the database so this is how you can create authentication uh, on a user database you can even create on admin database or even you can create on test database and with that we have come to the end of today's session guys i hope you've covered everything pretty much about you know authentication in mongodb so authentication is like one of the most critical point of uh, you know any database in terms of security it will basically allow us to validate and verify the information of the user who is connected with the current instance of 
MongoDB. And if any user has no uh, privilege or association with the database collection, then his request will be automatically will denied. And this is where authentic authentication plays an important role. Without having a user relationship with the database, we cannot authenticate the user. User and role management in MongoDB and understand various commands that are used to perform these two technicalities. So firstly, let us discuss what are user management commands. Now user management commands are basically used to manage the user access to the database. MongoDB offers an internal method called db.createUser method that allows user to be added to the system. Now, unlike conventional databases like uh, SQL or relational databases, MongoDB users are connected to a local database known as authentication database. And additionally, unique identifiers include the authentication database and the user's name assigned to it. And consequently, if two users are created in different database but have the same names, they are recognized as two separate users. Therefore, rather than creating uh, the user multiple times in various database, one should allow a single user to have the rights or roles to the relevant database instead of creating the user multiple times in different databases. So let's say if one wants to create a single user with permissions on multiple database, we can give the access to that particular person. So that is basically what is user management is all about in MongoDB. Now that is done using various commands uh, in MongoDB database. Now first we have the most important one which is create user. This method basically is used to create a new user in your MongoDB instance. Next we have the drop all users from database. It is used to delete all the users from a database or the collection of uh, data that you have in your documents, right? And next we have the drop user command which is used to grant a task and its privileges to a user. Next we have grant roles to user. It is basically assigning a role and its associated privileges that can be uh, given to a user on a basis on a regular basis. And finally next we have revoke roles from user which is used to remove the access to the user role that we have given earlier. Next we have the update user. This method basically is used to update a user's data. And finally we have users info. So let's say if you want to return the information of the users that you have created, you can use the user info. So these are some of the major user management commands that we use in database. Now you will understand it more clearly when we get into the execution part. So for now let's just understand what this is. Okay, let's move ahead and understand what are role management commands now. Now roles grant users access to MongoDB resources by providing several built-in roles that enable the administrators or the users to control the access to a MongoDB system. Although these roles cannot describe the desired set of privileges, one can create new roles in a particular database time to time. So except for functions created in the admin database, a role can only include rights that applies to its database and those inherited from other roles and only the user who has granted this access has this, uh, you know, permission in order, in order to control and access the data from that MongoDB uh, database. So similar to user management, we have various uh, different commands here as well. The first one is create role. It is basically used to create uh, a role for the user uh, database and say what you can perform to that database. Next we have drop role. It basically removes the role that was set by the user. So which is the again the opposite of create role. So if you want to create drop a role that you have assigned to the user, you can use the drop role command. Next we have drop all roles from database. Now let's say if you have created a user and given let's say five to six roles to that particular user. Now for due to some external factors or reasons, if you want to delete all those roles at a time, you can use drop all roles from database command which basically removes all the roles that the users from the database has set up. Next we have the grant privileges to role. It is used to assign privileges to a role that the user chooses. And finally we have the update role which basically updates the role that was set up by the user. Now again these are some of the major uh, commands that we use in uh, MongoDB. If you want to learn more about these you can go to MongoDB or website and clearly understand what are the different commands that we are using. And we will basically uh, execute them in MongoDB shell and only then you'll understand how important and how they exactly get executed. So let's dive uh, directly into MongoDB shell. But before that, we'll just see a simple example where 
we'll understand how user and role management command works. Now I'm using a simple a database which is employees and then I'm creating a user which is the syntax is uh, followed as db.createUser and then I'm giving the username as Rohan123 and I'm giving the password 123abc and next I'm also giving the roles to this user that is I'm giving the read operation that is uh, the user who have the access to this database employees can only read the information that is he can just view the data but he cannot make any changes to this db employees table so i hope you understood uh, this so let us now directly jump into the execution part so as you can see mongodb shell has started and the basic command is basically to show the different database in our different databases present in our uh, you know mongodb instance so for that i'm using the show dbs command which will uh, bring all the which will retrieve all the databases like admin company db config local simply code one student db and test so we know that before we enable uh, access control you should create a user that can create users and assign roles to them once access control is enabled so this user admin will then use to create and maintain other users and role which needs to be assigned a suitable role to enable it to do, do so so you can have various roles like admin role you can give the read operation you can give write operation and you can simultaneously give read and write oper operations on uh, on the data that you want to uh, perform uh, the analysis or the changes you want to make so before creating a mongodb user actually it is worth thinking about the task the user is going to perform now let's say i have a database here let's say simply code one and i have a user who is who constantly uh, changes or updates data from the database then i can give the role to the, to that particular user is read write operation so by change, probably there will be several users with the same level of permissions also. So the smartest option is to create a role and assign it to each of these users. And by only changing a role, you will update the permission where all the users who has the access to it. Otherwise, a change to an access requirement for a group or, you know, uh, a group of users would need to be done for every single user every time. So the first step is to change context to database in which you're going to create this role. So let's just create a simple, uh, you know, role to a database. So for that, I'm using the uh, simply code database only here. So let's say use simply code one. So it is switched to simply code one. So when adding a new user to the specified database and for in our case, it's simply code one, we use the db.createUser method, which is the fundamental command. So it is important to note that adding users with option is much simpler than inserting a user document into a non-relational database. So the query is followed as db.createUser. user. Make sure the U is capital, otherwise it will throw an error. Open the brackets. And inside that mention the keyword user. So let's say I'm giving the username as let's take a row hand one, two, three, four, close the brackets and then mention the password PWD. So you can either give a password or you can give a password prompt. Password prompt is basically will ask you to enter the password every time you request access to this uh, database. So I'm just using the password prompt command here. And then you have to specify the roles that you want to create your, uh, you know, database. So let's say I'm just giving a simple role as let's take as read operation, right? So for that I'm providing roles and within the uh, square brackets, mention the role keyword semicolon and since we are concerned with read i am giving it as a read and then mention the database that you are giving the access to so the the database is simply code one all right uh, make sure it is in inverted commas again otherwise it will throw an error so I think uh, the code is done. Let's just execute this. Uh, again, close the square brackets. Make sure to check all the brackets are being uh, properly closed. Otherwise, it will throw an error.
we have a square bracket and then I think oops, again another this okay so it says enter password now you can give password of your choice uh, so let's say I'm taking one two three twenty dot okay so it says it is successfully executed let's just walk through what you have created here now to create a user who will manage a single database here which is the simply code one we can we are using the same command which is the db dot create user and in that uh, we are giving a particular username and then we are giving the roles to it so the first step is basically to specify the username and password which needs to be created and the second step is to assign a role for the user which in this case needs to be a is a, a general user not the user admin right so we are just assigning a role which is the read operation here this role basically allows the user to have privileges only to the database specified in the db option which is simply code one so the db parameter specified the database to which the user should have the administrative privileges on so the output basically shows that it was successfully created and it is asking for a password now you can generally give a password of your own choice or you can either just so give a password prompt and then you can enter the password so this is how you create a user now next you have to manage these users so for that you have to understand the roles which you need to define now there's a whole list of roles available in mongodb as discussed earlier now for this one we have given read now there is also read write there is also user admin which we give for administrative uh, you know privileges or uh, someone who have the who needs to be a database administrator who constantly works on that uh, database so for that we provide with that so then we have this again read role which basically allows you to read only access to databases and then there is read write also which provides read and write access to the database which means that the user can insert delete update commands on collections in that database so let's just create another uh, user wherein we'll create multiple roles and understand how it works here so again i'm just copy pasting this and we'll create another user and see so let's just change some of the uh, names here so let's take uh, the new user as user uh, one and let's take the password from same and then we will assign different roles now for different databases for this user okay now once we have created a read operation for simply code right now let's take another uh, database let's say company db so for that i'm creating another role which is read write okay so there is a small error so i'm just copy pasting the file which i've already created to uh, show you so i'm just creating a new user and then i'm uh, uh, creating a user name rohan123 and let's take the password as 123abc and the roles that i'm giving to this user are from various database so for let's say for simply code one i'm giving the uh, role as read operation and for company db i'm giving read operation and for student db i'm giving the read write operation so mongodb defines roles uniquely by combining the database with the role name and each role is scoped to the database you have created but mongodb generally stores all the role information in this collection in the uh, admin database so for instance the role and grant role actions on the database resource must ensure that the roles are created and granted in the database so let's just execute this and see the output so it says okay one that means you have successfully created a user now in order to see all the users that you have created in the simply code one you can simply use the show users command which will list out all the users that you have created so it says simply code one dot rohan one two three db simply code one and the read uh, roles that you have created is read write operations for uh, this database for read operation for company db read operation for simply code and so on and you can also show the roles as well separately so it will just show all the different roles so let's say role db owner db simply code one and like in a similar way all the operations all the roles that you have given uh, will be showcased here i think we have pretty much covered the basics of user and uh, role management commands in this what are mongodb session commands 
Now session commands basically allow you to provide specific instructions to the database through a command language using certain uh, commands. So we'll be learning uh, exactly what are the MongoDB sessions and various types of commands that are used in this criteria. So firstly, what are session commands in MongoDB? Now a session is basically is used to group together a series of operations that are related to each other, which would be executed with the same session options. Now, if you consider MongoDB, MongoDB shell does not uh, is not typically used to write and execute transaction. The majority of the majority of the time, external applications use transaction instead. So the application must initiate a session in order for any transaction it performs to be guaranteed with the asset properties like atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. So a session is a database object in MongoDB that is controlled by an application using a proper MongoDB driver, which can be used with various applications like C, C++, Python, Java, and other applications as well. So this basically enables the driver to apply additional configurations, such as enabling the use of transaction, whether you want to start a transaction or uh, you know terminate a transaction to even a group of database statement as a whole. So as a result, they will have a shared context and can be associated with each other using the session commands where it will process sequence of database statements. So that is what exactly the session commands are in MongoDB. So this can be performed using various uh, MongoDB uh, session commands. So we have typically five uh, session commands in MongoDB namely. Firstly, we have the about transaction command, which is basically is used to stop or terminate the ongoing transaction. Next, we have the commit transaction command, which is used to permanently save all the transactions done in the MongoDB database. Next, we have the end sessions command, which expires, it is to expire any ongoing sessions before the timeout. So in general, MongoDB has a timeout period of 30 minutes. So after that, it will automatically in the uh, session within a MongoDB instance. So if you want it uh, to done before uh, uh, the computer automatically does to you, you can use the end session command. Next, we have the kill all sessions, which is used to terminate all the sessions, right? As the name says, kill all. Next, we have the kill all sessions by pattern. Now you can even uh, terminate a session or stop a particular session by using a specified pattern. So if ever, if the pattern matches a specified, uh, you know, character that you mentioned in your server session, in that case, you can use kill all sessions by pattern. Now we'll be understanding each of them uh, in a more depth with its syntax and how it works. Now, apart from this, we have the basic and the generic type of session commands in MongoDB, where we have refresh sessions, kill sessions, and start session also. So the refresh session command is used to update the end use time for the specified session by extending the active state of the session. So if you're working on a particular uh, transaction and if you want to, uh, you know, refresh it, in that case, you can use the refresh session command, which will basically extend the uh, period of the session that your the, the ongoing session is happening. Next, we have the kill session. So if you want to, uh, you know, exit or terminate only a particular uh, spe specified, you know, uh, session for the user in such case you can use the kill sessions next finally we have the start session command as the name suggests the start session command is used to start a new logical session in the mongodb database now the constraint here is you must be authenticated to run this command that is proper authentication should be given to the mongodb database otherwise it does not enforce so if the deployment does not have any uh, authentication or authorization a created uh, has no owner and can be used by any user over any connection. So these were some of the uh, types of session commands that we use. So let's just get into detail with each of the uh, command here. So the first one is what is about transaction command. So the about transaction uh, command or the method tells MongoDB to undo all the modifications made throughout the transaction and restore the database to its initial configuration. So it basically terminates all the uh, multi-document transaction and rolls back any changes made by the operations within the transaction. That is the transaction basically ends without saving any of the changes made by the operations in the transaction. 
Now the abort transaction command must be run within a session and run against the admin database only. And another constraint is it will terminate any transaction before it can get executed because one of the operation caused an error. So to run the abort transaction, the command must be uh, run against the admin database and run with the start session initially. So let us understand the syntax for this. The syntax is followed as db.admin command and within the brackets mention abort transaction and we are given a boolean value that is 1 that means true. Next we have the transaction number it can be of any type so I am just specifying the long. Next we have the right concern mention the document name and then I am giving auto commit to false. Next we have any comments if you want to uh, display in uh, for the reason why you are aborting the transaction you can specify it here. So when a transaction aborts all the data changes all the data changes made by the right transactions are discarded without ever being visible to the uh, visible and the transaction eventually ends automatically. Next we have the what is commit transaction command. Now commit transaction ends the transaction by saving the changes made by the operations in the multi level document transaction. So you can say this is basically an opposite of abort transaction command which will basically ensure that it saves the changes made by the operations in the multi document transaction and ends the transaction as well. So again you are to run the commit transaction you must run it against the admin database uh, using the db.admin command. So the transaction is same again which is similar to that of the abort transaction uh, instead of abort transaction mention the commit transaction keyword here and specify it as one and the rest all the uh, fields where you have the transaction number right concern uh, auto commit comment will all have the same uh, you know criteria. So the right concern basically uh, tells you that when committing any transaction the session uses the right concern specified at the transaction start. So let's say when a transaction commits and all the data changes made in the transaction are saved and visible outside the transaction which which means a transaction will not commit some of its changes while rolling back the other changes. So until and unless a transaction commits the data changes made in the transaction are not visible to any user outside of the transaction. So I hope you were clear with the commit transaction. Next we have the what is end sessions command. So basically end session expires the sessions that are specified. Now the command overrides the timeout window that the sessions wait before closing. Now what do I mean by that? So this method basically closes an existing session. So if a transaction was associated within this a session the transaction will get uh, aborted once you uh, you know give this end session command. So after calling this method application should not invoke any other commands on this session anymore. So let us understand the syntax. The syntax is followed as db.run command and within the parenthesis I am giving the end sessions keyword and inside that I am mentioning id where you have to give the uuid. Now uuid is basically an you know alt, uh, alter uh, you know specification for you know object id we have in mongodb. So mongodb and other mongodb drivers come with this inbuilt support for the uuid data type. And it's very easy and convenient to start using the UUID immediately as well. So it basically MongoDB itself stores UUIDs as a binary field and when such binary fields are accessed from software MongoDB drivers usually convert their value which is found uh, in the database to language specific uh, you know UUID objects. So that is just an opposite of not an opposite I can say it is an alternative uh, to the use of object ID in MongoDB. So that is what end session is all about. Next we have the what is kill all session command. Now killing a session terminates any in progress operations in the section session. So we haven't discussed what exactly why we are using kill uh, keyword here. So the MongoDB takes this command in order to terminate any ongoing process or the operations in that session. So the kill all session commands kill all the uh, you know sessions that are being run on the MongoDB database and if access control is enabled the command only kills the sec sessions that are owned by the user. So let us now understand the syntax. Now so we have uh, you know kill sessions as well uh, as in addition to kill all sessions. 
So the basic or the generic type of syntax that we write here is db dot run command. Inside that we are specifying kill all sessions and you can either give a particular user and the database name wherein the command takes an array of documents that specify the UUID portion of the uh, session ID or else what you can do is you can just simply run the db dot run command where you are just specifying kill all sessions which will automatically terminate all the operations in the in that particular session. And if you want a particular only uh, specific type of uh, session, in that case, you have to mention the user and the DB associated to it. So let's say I have uh, this uh, two users, right? I just want to uh, stop only these two sessions, right? In that case, I'm using db.run command, kill all sessions, and I'm just giving the username and the DB. So Rohan1 uh, is the user and the DB that is working on is employee1. So it will basically terminate all the sessions or the transactions that are ongoing. That is, if you're performing any read or write operations on this, it will terminate all the sessions in one go. Next, we have what is kill all by session, all sessions by pattern. Now, as the name suggests, we are basically stopping all uh, particular session with the help of a specified pattern here, which is the definition of this command is the kill all session by pattern command kills all sessions that match any of the specified pattern. Now the syntax is also similar to that of kill all sessions which is db dot run command and inside the parenthesis we are giving the keyword kill all sessions by pattern and mention the pattern here. Now there are various patterns that are associated uh, with this. So you can either have any of the four choices that you can see in the table here. Now the first one basically specifies the UUID portion of the session ID that you want to terminate. Next you can just give the uh, UUID or and give the bin data which will basically specifies the hash of the owner of the session to kill. Next you can just give the uh, you can just specify the owner of the session in order to kill or to terminate that session which will require additional privileges. And finally, you can also uh, terminate a session by just giving the role uh, to that database. So it, if you specify the role assigned to the owner of that session, in order to stop it, you can just give to that uh, particular uh, role as well, which will again require additional privileges. Now, what I mean by uh, additional privileges here is that, so if uh, the database that you're working on enforces any authentication or authorization, you must have the kill any session or kill all session privilege action in order to run the kill all session by pattern command. So only in such case you can use this type of command which is kill all section by command if you have the permission of kill all session command. So that is what uh, kill all session by pattern uh, command is all about. And with that, we have come to the end of today's session, guys. I think we have discussed pretty much about all the uh, session commands that we use. Now, in terms of working on MongoDB database, it is not uh, an e important topic to uh, you know learn. It is just a uh, conceptual topic. Maybe you might be asked in your interview questions. But in general, if you're working on a database, you might not use uh, more of the session commands. So it is important to uh, have a knowledge a pretty much knowledge on what are the session commands and what is the basic significance on why we use in our mongodb database what is backup and restore in mongodb and how to implement in real life so we will walk you through the steps of backing up and restoring process in mongodb database and also the collection present in them so firstly let us discuss what is backup in general before we understand how a backup works in mongodb now backup and recovery refers to the process of creating and storing data copies that can be used to protect any organization or companies when they have any data loss so this is referred also to as operational loss and recovering from a data from a backup usually entails restoring the data to its original location or that is copying of data in other location where it can be used in place of the lost or damaged data. Now to protect da against data loss due to primary hardware or any software failures, a proper backup copy is stored in a separate system or a medium like hard disk or pen drive from the primary data. Now data should be backed up at regular intervals because it is important that you have the access to the data uh, within The data should be backed up 
uh, in no time so that you can access that data in whatever uh, you know uh, situation you want and it also determined by how frequently that data changes and depending upon that you have to back up your data it might be every week every month or maybe once in a quarter or like that so moving ahead just like uh, the backup which we do for other systems as well mongodb also requires backup since it is a NoSQL database and works a lot on non-structured data which has large data sets and in order to ensure that the customer uh, the user's information is stored properly and their identity and their uh, data is safeguarded it is important that we uh, you know back up the data into our mongodb database so for that mongodb provides with various inbuilt tools uh, for example mongo dump as well as mongo restore commands which is used to connect the MongoDB instance on the local system and create a database backup named dump in the current directory. Now we'll understand how it works when we get into the execution part. So for now, just, just understand. How does MongoDB backup works now? Now there are various ways in which you can uh, backup your data in MongoDB. Uh, so if you're working on MongoDB Atlas, you can use so MongoDB Atlas, which is the uh, hosted MongoDB service option in the cloud, offers basically two types of methods for backups, which is cloud backup as well as legacy backup. Next, we have the MongoDB Cloud Manager and Ops Manager. Now, MongoDB Cloud Manager is a hosted backup uh, monitoring and automation service for MongoDB. The MongoDB Cloud Manager supports the backing up and restoring of MongoDB deployments. So MongoDB Cloud Manager generally backups mongodb replica sets and sharded uh, clusters by reading the op log data from your mongodb deployment and next we have the basic tools like mongo dump which is uh, an easier way let's say if you are trying to backup data which is less than uh, 100 gb or 500 gb in such case mongo dump which is a inbuilt command tool is a great option for you and finally we also have file system backups where you can create a backup of a MongoDB deployment by making a copy of MongoDB's underlying data files. So if the volume where MongoDB stores its data file supports point in time, you can use this uh, file system backup in order to create backup of a MongoDB system at an exact moment in that time. So in this tutorial, we are only concerned with the MongoDump and we'll see how it works. So to create backup of a database or a collection, you should use MongoDump command. Let's see how the syntax is. Now the syntax is simple. You just have to write mongo dump. And again, let's uh, understand this when we get into the execution part. So if you want to uh, back up only a particular database or uh, let's say a particular collection, in such case, the syntax would be mongo dump, mention DB and the database name. Next mention collection keyword and the collection name. And after that mention out and the location path of it. So in this way, you can use uh, this command in order to back up a particular database and a collection name. So MongoDump is an ideal backup solution for let's say small MongoDB instances due to its ease of use and portability. I hope you understood you know what is backup and uh, how does it work in MongoDB. So let us now jump into execution part and see how it is done. We'll also see how to uh, once we back up our database and after deleting or dropping the database or the collection how to restore it back to its original uh, position in the database as well so what you have to do is you have to basically first open command prompt and before we get in uh, ahead with the uh, execution part on how to back up our mongodb database you have to install the mongo dump which is a command line which is an inbuilt command line so what you have to do is you have to uh go and download the data which is the command line from the mongodb official server so for that what you have to do is type mongodb command lines database tools all right so scroll down a bit and you'll have this download mongodb command line database tools click on that and you can see that we have this mongodb command line database tools download and all the description of this i will file the latest version of it and you will have the package zip here just uh, remove that and select msi package and click on download now i've already downloaded it on my system so i'll just show you what has to be done 
so when you download it it will ask for uh, the setup just give the permission necessary permissions and all so as i've already installed it says you can change the features i've installed repair or just click the next button until you finish it okay now once you're done with that it will basically uh, store the data in the c drive so go to program files and c drive and open mongodb folder and in that it will be downloaded in tools section so click on this tools we'll have this 100 click on bin so this is where we have the all database tools for example based on dump mongo dump mongo expert mongo files mongo import mongo restore mongo stat and mongo top so this is how you have to download the basic command line tool which is which since we are working with mongo dump which is a part of a command line tool we are downloading this so all right so once we are done with this now go back to our command prompt and next type mongos which will basically direct to our mongo shell all right so let's just get started i'm using the show dbs command here so it, it says various uh shows the dbs various databases present in our uh mongodb database right all right now now you can now you can work on the existing database or you can create a new database in order to back up the data that is present in that so let's say i'm just using a new database here let's say the database name is mongodb backup okay so it says switch to db mongo backup so let us now just create a, a set of collections okay for example we'll create two collections so the first collection would be orders right so i'm just creating collections db dot orders insert and inside that i'm basically uh just creating a field let's say let's take a name let's say rohan okay so this is this is just for example guys uh, i'm just showing a basic example so that you'll have a clear idea on how uh, the backup works here so similarly let's just create another collection let's say customers dot insert and let's say take the name as rahul All right close the brackets well as you can see in the uh, assertion tool we can see that it is successfully acknowledged true and it is inserted ids are also created so let us just uh, use the show collections command whether or not they have created or not so you can see customers and orders are the two collections that are created inside the mongodb backup now once we are done with this we have to create a path or let's say a folder wherein we are trying to backup the data that is present in our mongodb database so for that what you have to do is go to let's say c drive and just create a folder let's say i am creating a new folder here let's take the name of the folder as backup okay click on that now click on the open the backup folder now you will see that folder is empty now now since we haven't done any backup on our database it will show this folder is empty now what you have to do is just copy this uh, address okay just double click uh, over here and just copy the address now now once again open command prompt all right now we have to set the path to our location which is the c drive where we have created the backup folder so for that i'm using the cd which means current directory and just copy paste the uh, location that we have just copied okay which is the c backup file now click ok now it is changed to c backup now we have to set up the path for our backup file right now for that i'm using the set path so we have to set path for our mongodump command which is uh, basically stored in i think the program files again just go there click on program files click on mongodb click on tools click on this open bin and just copy paste this address over here copy just open this and within the uh, brackets uh, inverted comma sorry uh, paste this click ok now that means you have successfully uh, set up the path for your mongo dump command wherein the data that you have created in your mongodb database that is the mongodb uh, database and that we have created two collections right which is orders and customer will now be backed up now for that you have to just simply use the mongo dump keyword and click enter so it will just process and it says done dumping simply code one dot new employees and all all right so let's just go back to our uh, folder here and see whether or not we have created a backup right so where you can see the backup 
and inside backup now we have a dump folder and inside that we have all the database names which is admin company db mongodb backup simply code one student db test we have recently created this mongodb backup click on that and you can see we have the data in the form of based on format which is of customers as well as the orders so that means you have successfully uh, copied the data from your mongodb instance to your local uh, system wherein you have uh, downloaded the data from the database and you have inserted you have basically backed up into this folder here so i hope you have understood how to uh, basically perform the backup uh, in your mongodb database so let's say if i want to uh, drop this database so let's see how does it work for that i'm using the db dot drop database command make sure the d is capital otherwise it will throw an error so as it uh, it says it has successfully uh, dropped the mongodb backup database so let's again see the collections i mean show dbs let's see if it is showing or not so as you can see mongodb backup is not there in our uh, you know list of uh, the databases that we are that have that are available now so we have to perform the restore uh, option here so for that i'll just go back uh, to the command prompt and i'll just simply write mongo restore click enter it will process and it will take some time and finally you can see in the end of uh, the line here it says two documents restored successfully so let's just go back and let us now see whether it is showing uh, the mongodb backup database or not so now you can see mongodb backup is present in our list of databases that are present in our mongodb uh, instance so again let's check whether the collections are uh, backed up or not so for that i'm uh, showing i'm writing show collections command here so as you can see customers and orders are restored again back to its original state without any uh, issues over here so in this way you can use the restore option if you are in case you have deleted your database or let's say deleted the information or the data from your collections that are present in your database so till now we have basically uh, backed up all the collections that are present in a database now what if you want to create a backup of only a particular collection now let's say i have the customers collection here and i want to only back up that and leave the orders so for that we have to basically again go back to our uh, c drive and we'll just create another file here okay and the folder wherein we'll uh, take let's say backup one so we have created a new uh, backup one folder just copy paste this copy paste this and go back to uh, the command prompt and now mention the current directory which we are using is backup one all right since we are uh, basically uh, back up, backing up only a particular folder now the command would be mongo dump mention the db database which is mongodb backup and mention the collection keyword and mention the collection name which is customers i think it's customers only let's just yeah it's customers so when you click on enter it will say that done dumping mongodb backup dot customers one document has been successfully backed up so let's just verify it uh, go back to ba backup one so you can see now only the customers collection is only uh, backed up in our uh, let's say which we have created backup one folder now i'll drop this uh, only the particular uh, collection and we'll try to restore it back to our, its original state so the command would be db dot mention the uh, collection name and mention the drop keyword so it says true that means it is successfully uh, uh, dropped so let's just check the collections and see whether it is deleted or not so you can see only orders uh, collection has is been shown in our uh, you know database which is in mongodb backup database all right so let us now try to restore it uh, just go back to this command prompt and now the keyword would be mongo restore in the same um, 
mongo restore uh, db is the keyword mention the uh, database name which is mongodb backup and mention the collection name as well just customers okay click enter it says error scanning files can file dump is a directory not a json file okay you have to provide the uh, file path also so i think i have so let me just correct this uh, just copy paste the uh, command till here now what you have to do is you have to provide the location of the backup folder where you have created uh, the backup for the customers collection here so just copy paste this So I'm just mentioning the location of where we have backed up our, uh, you know, customers collection here. And it is also saying that it is not a base one file, right? So just uh, keep the uh, slash and mention the collection name and the file format, which is based on. Okay. And I think we are good to go now. Just click enter. So now you can see that uh, one document restored successfully. So let's just go back to the uh, mongodb shell and try to verify whether it is restored or not so i'm just creating again show collections uh, command so now you can see customers order and the orders are both showing in our uh, collection set so that means we have successfully restored the one which we have deleted so in this way you can even delete uh, and backup and restore a particular database collection as well php with mongodb we'll understand how to use mongodb with the help of php now after the initial driver setup we'll continue explaining how to get started with mongodb driver and use and how to use the extension driver which corresponds to various libraries in php to create collection in our mongodb database using php now before we uh, get to the execution part of how to use mongodb with php let us quickly understand what is php now php is a common open source scripting language popular for web applications also uh, it originally stood for personal home page php is now a recursive acronym for hypertext preprocessor and php is a server side scripting language uh, which is embedded in html in its simplest form and it allows web developers to create dynamic content and interact with databases php is known for its simplicity speed and flexibility and many other features that made it a cornerstone in the web development mode now more than 80 percent of all the websites rely on php to some degree making it one of the most favored languages among programmers and web developers and php is used on most uh, some of the most prominent web properties and platforms using uh, including facebook wikipedia wordpress and many other more so i hope you understood what is php so let us now move ahead and understand why we use php now there are some major benefits of learning php now one such uh, uh, you know factor is it's an open source language now just like any other databases like mysql which is available to users directly on the internet similarly php is also uh, is freely available to use and implement without any problem it is also an easy to learn language since it is very similar to how uh, html codes are written so if you have a prerequisite knowledge on how html works now the same the similar codes are written in the same manner in php and it is easy to understand and implement as well it is also highly compatible since it can be integrated with multiple programming languages such as html javascript and it also sub supports different databases uh, with, by giving an extension like mysql postgresql oracle and noisql database like mongodb as well it is a platform independent uh, you know uh, database uh, which means that applications developing using php can run in environment also finally it has a large community of developers and that is programming is all about helping and being helped right so a large community would mean would mean that you can have an instant help whenever you are stuck with any problem using php so i hope you understood why we use php let us now move ahead and understand quickly how does php work now php uh, being a server-side language as i said earlier the entire workflow is on the server itself 
So basically we have a PHP interpreted which is installed into the server to check the PHP files. Now while on the client side, the only requirement is a browser and inter internet connection. So if you look at this diagram here, we have a client, a server and a .php file. So basically the client is requesting the web page on the browser. So the server where the PHP software is installed then checks for the .php file associated with the request. So whenever it, if it uh, finds this file, it sends the file to the PHP interpreter. Okay, since PHP as we discussed earlier is an interpreted language which checks for requested data into the database. And then if you look at the step 3 where the interpreter then send back the requested data output as an HTML web page since a browser does not understand a PHP dot file. And once it's done, the web server receives the HTML file from the interpreter in the step 4. And finally, and it sends the web page back to the browser. So this is what the uh, complete flow of how PHP works. So let us now move ahead and discuss uh, in detail like in a nutshell how exactly uh, this is being done on uh, you know on the server side. So the PHP program com communicates with the site server which is responsible for sending web pages to the rest of the world. So for example when you type any uh, URL in your web browser address bar like if you're searching for Google or YouTube you're basically instructing the web server at the URL to email you an HTML file and in response the web server sends the requested file. Now your, your browser reads the HTML file and displays the web page. So whenever you click on the source link on the web page, you are also requesting a file from the web server. And in addition, when you click a web page button now, that submits a form, a file which is again processed by the web server. And this procedure is the same when you are using with PHP also. PHP interpreter interprets the script to access the specific data as requested from the user. Then the server returns the HTML page according to the requirement. So this is in a nutshell how PHP works. Now the main agenda of this session is how to use PHP with MongoDB, right? So MongoDB server is built to already work with your current web server, but not with PHP. So in order to work with uh, MongoDB database using PHP, you're going to need a PHP Mongo driver, which is an extension library. Now, apart from that, we need uh, certain other, you know, uh, you know, factors in order to use PHP with MongoDB. So before attempting to set up a connection between PHP and MongoDB, now a few essential prerequisites needs to be uh, taken care of. So basically you need a DLL file, which is basically a dynamic link library, which can be found on uh, Google, which I'll be showing in a while when we get to the installation process, wherein we'll be setting up a PHP and MongoDB connection by installing the MongoDB PHP driver on our system. And also we need, uh, you either you need to make sure that either XAMPP or VAMP is already installed and configured on your system. So XAMPP, we are going to use XAMPP in this, which is basically used to set up your local web browser. And also we need to have Composer, which will basically connect the PHP command line with our, uh, you know, MongoDB database. So we'll get into the execution part in a while. I hope you understood till now uh, the basics of why, of what is PHP and why it is used and how it is related uh, with databases and how you can perform operations by connecting databases like MySQL and MongoDB. So without any further delay next, let us jump into the installation process and we'll see how to, uh, how we need the PHP MongoDB, MongoDB driver. All right, let us now discuss how to set up the MongoDB connection with PHP. And in order to install the MongoDB PHP driver on our system, we need the uh, extension, uh, you know, driver files, right? For that we will use the PECL. Now PECL is basically, uh, as you can see, it's a, repo a repository for PHP extensions, which provides the hosting facility for downloading and development of PHP extension. Now, since we want uh, for the PHP and MongoDB, right? So we'll just enter PHP MongoDB. So you can see uh, the first result, click on that, where you can see the package MongoDB PECL. It will redirect to, a, uh, to you to a page and you can see various versions that are available to download but we need DLL file here. So you can see we have a DLL and the Windows symbol here right and also 1.13 is also the latest version so we'll be downloading that. Click on DLL. 
Uh, now scroll down a bit. Now you will find the uh, different types of DLL list here, which is PHP 8.1, PHP 8.0, PHP 7.4. Now we need uh, the we have also different files here, which is non-thread safe, thread safe, and uh, you know, non-thread safe 86 and all. So since Windows has a 64-bit configuration, and we will use this thread safe uh, option here. So click on this, which is the latest version. It will download. Uh, depending upon your internet speed, uh, it may take some while. So let's wait for some time. Uh, it is downloaded now. So in this uh, in this file, we can see various different you know options. We can have we have this PHP MongoDB dot DLL, which is basically the application extension in order to connect MongoDB with PHP. So basically, we'll copy this. All right, now. The next step uh, we are going to do is go back to Google Chrome and now we have to download XAMPP. Now we all know that PHP is the most popular and widely used server-side scripting language for web development, right? So, but however, it requires a web server to run even a locally developed web page. So now there are various web server software for setting up on our local web server. Among them, PHP, XAMPP and WAMP server are the most popular. So we are going to use XAMPP, which is a cross-platform application that can run on a Windows, uh, Linux, and Mac OS operating system. So let us now uh, uh, try to install the XAMPP on our uh, system. Uh, so in the search box, type XAMPP, which is the uh, Z X A M P P. So you can see this, which is developed by the Apache Friends. Uh, you can see in the dialog box here also what it is. It is developed by Apache Friends, consistently. Mainly of the mainly of Apache HTTP server, Maria database, and interprets for scripts written in PHP and Perl programming language. So you can see the download option here. Click on that. Now again, we have different uh, configuration and download options for various uh, operating systems that are using. So if you are using XAMPP for Windows, we have three different versions of it. Similarly for Linux, for OS also we have. So since we are installing it on Windows, we are only concerned with this. And we have the latest version of it, which is 8.1.2. So we'll be installing that on our system. So click on download 64 bit. So we have successfully uh, downloaded that. Just wait for some time to install it on your system. It may take a while, again, uh, depending upon internet. And uh, so let's just wait for it to download. In the meantime, guys, if you're finding this tutorial informative and helpful, make sure to leave a like and share it with your friends and colleagues also so that it will reach uh, to most of the people, you know, who are learning PHP and MongoDB. And if, even if there's someone who is at a beginner level who is trying to learn something new, it will be quite helpful. So make sure you, uh, you know, share it with as many as people for a better reach. So as you can see, we have successfully uh, downloaded the XAMPP on our uh, system and then uh, once you, after the download, if you click the file, it will open in this way, which is uh, for an antivirus running. You can, uh, I will ask for continue with installation, just click on yes. Now you have the setup page for the XAMPP, uh, just click on next. So basically all these files will be, uh, you know, installed on your system like MySQL, FileZilla, FTP server, Perl. PHP my admin. So these are all the various components that you get quite handy also when you get you are uh, installing this ZAMP on your system. So click on next. So it will ask to uh, save the location on which you want to save your uh, ZAMP folder. So it is basically saving in a C drive. Click on next. Error for this, which says the selected folder is not empty. Please select a different folder. So now I've already installed the XAMPP on my folder. I'll just uh, go through the uh, you know technique on how to overcome this warning. So let's just go to the XAMPP folder on our system. So if you're facing that issue, uh, just basically delete all the uh, you know files that is already if you have a folder named as XAM, just delete all the files in that or else you can change the location from this also so i'm now taking uh, the location as desktop here so click on next it will ask for language preference click on next again and setup is now ready to begin installing uh, XAMPP on your computer just click on next and it will 
automatically uh, complete your setup and installation. So XAMPP is now successfully uh, you know uh, installed on a system. So just search for it and it will directly open if you have already installed. Uh, as you can see in the XAMPP control panel, you have various services and modules like Apache, MySQL, FileZilla, Mercury, Tomcat, and etc. Now after installing XAMPP on your system, next we'll be installing Composer. Now we need a tool which can be used to install libraries as well as manage application dependencies and for that composer does a great job for uh, you know application level package uh, manner for php which has gained immense popularity and it also became you know the standard managing dependency in php application so you can say it, uh, php uh, you can say composer is basically a dependency managed tool which allows you to declare the libraries your project depends on and it will manage them for you on your system so again let's go to google and type composer so you can also uh, know what exactly composer it from the dialog box here so just click on composer so you'll find this page here and you'll also have a download option click on that now scroll down a bit uh, no need to scroll down uh, so you can see download and run composer setup.exe just click on that so it will, uh, yeah, it is successfully downloaded now. We'll just click on this file and we'll install it on our system. So once it's installed on your system, we'll have this uh, setup page which will ask for, uh, you know, a developer mode. It's your wish if you want to click on developer mode. So let's just leave it like that. Uh, click on next. Next, you have to choose the path command line which you want to use in order to execute the PHP uh, commands on your system. So make sure that the file is php.exe. And if it is not there, you just have to go to uh, the XAMPP file which you have in installed it on our system. Uh, just go to XAMPP. Uh, you have PHP and down you have php.exe. So make sure it is uh being saved on this path and not on the other part click on next so it's checking for the uh, command line and it has successfully uh, chosen the uh, command line so click on just and click on install okay and this is how you can uh, download the composite setup so it will just run the composite install setup script let wait for it some time to complete the installation process so it says that uh, as a last resort, you may need to restart your system. So click on that and restart your system once again. So we have also successfully uh, you know, installed Compose on our system. So let's just wrap up what you have done till now. We have basically added the MongoDB driver extension using the PECL uh, command, uh, which you have again downloaded on system. Next, we have downloaded XAMPP. Next, we have also installed Composer on our system. Now, let us understand how to configure PHP in a way that will allow a connection to MongoDB in the Windows environment. Now, we have uh, downloaded a file from uh, you know PECL command line, right? Which is which is PHP underscore MongoDB dot DLL. So, just copy this file and now go to XAMPP stored in C drive, right? So, click on the XAMPP folder. Click on PHP and in PHP you will find ext folder name click on that and paste it over here all right so as you can see I have pasted the PHP mongodb.dll file on my system now next you have to search for php.ini file in order to uh, you know paste the extension for the mongodb database so just search for php ini in the search box uh, I think we have here itself. So you have php.ini development, php.ini production. Now, in some cases, you will directly find php.ini file or else you will find it this way. So make sure that it is just the file which is above the php.ini development file as in this case. So click on this. Now you will find a series of extension here which is uh, saved in the notepad. So you need to basically uh, add the following file with the extension. So search for the extension, uh, you know, files where they are saved. Just scroll down a bit slowly. You will find it, uh, I think. Scroll down more a bit. Or else you can just search for, uh, all right, we have got the file here. So now what you have to do is you have to basically, uh, I have already uh, 
install it on my system right so i'm just showcasing you know how to do it again so you have this extension dot php so beforehand you won't have this so you have to uh, write type extension and pay, just paste the file which is php mongodb dot dll and you have to save the file now saving the file is must otherwise it will not reflect in your system so i think we are good to go now we have successfully installed the mongodb extension driver in our system now we are good to go and we can write the uh, code on our php line now you can use any sort of editor for writing the php code be it notepad be it sublime text or even visual code so firstly let us run the uh, you know xam file we'll run the apache system so as you can see it has successfully started now all the data that is being uh, you know written or configured is stored in the local host so if you press local host and before that we need to create uh, you know a folder on which we are working because uh, it will basically tell uh, where the data is being stored so go to xamp again xamp and there you will file ht docs now in this you can create a new folder now i already created a new folder which is new.mongodb you can create a new folder again as well so let's just create uh, another one here click on new folder so let's say it has mongodb php all right so click on this it says folder is empty now if you want to find what is happening in this you have to basically go to uh, web search type localhost slash and mention the folder name which you have taken that is mongodb php again put the backslash and enter so as you can see we have uh, index of mongodb php here and there is no uh, files yet that is saved here right now we'll write a basic program now using the php now for that you need a prior uh, knowledge on html because the code written is php is also similar to that so i'm going to use the notepad only for my editor so just open the notepad now this might be a bit confusing because i am using uh, the php uh, you know commands so it might be a bit confusing so just understand how it is going and how it is working actually so first we have to provide the header file which is given by greater than symbol and question mark and write php and again in the end we basically have a question mark and the uh, greater than symbol again to in order to close the tag now in between we have to write our uh, you know code for in order to create a new collection in our mongodb database so firstly i am going to uh, give the necessary actions which is uh, required mention the vendor slash authorized sorry auto load dot php all right close it mention semicolon and then you have to provide the client connection right now what we are doing is we are basically connecting mongodb with database now in general we have the local host of mongodb is 27017 so that is what we will be connecting so the syntax for that is dollar sign client is equals to new mongodb backslash client make sure the c is uh, capital otherwise it will throw an error here client and open the square brackets mention double quotes provide the location which is mongodb uh, colon backslash localhost which is 27017 now if you want to know what is your localhost connection you can just simply open mongodb shell and you can see it mongodb compass sorry you can see that uh, what the localhost uh, name is there on your uh, system that is installed so let's connect it so as you can see we have localhost is 27017 which is almost 
uh, same for most of the system, I reckon. So let's just get back to our code again here. Now I'm going to create a database. Now let's say a uh, company, I'm going to take the database name as company DB. Okay, company DB. And then I'm going to write client. Mention the database name, which is again company DB. All right. Next, I'm going to create a collection. Now for that, we have to use the tag, which is dollar result one. Okay. So mention the uh, database that you have chosen, which is company DB. Or mention the arrow symbol. Now write the keyword, which is create collection. Make sure the C is capital. Otherwise it will throw an error. Okay. Uh, you can give any collection name. So let's take employee collection. So I'm giving it as employee collection as an example here. All right. So let's just close it again. Then you have to store this value. All right. It's not just you have created uh, anything. You have just uh, created a collection. Now in order to store this, you are you have to use var dump character here. Var dump. And save the result now we have taken uh, our you know object as result one right so just write the value which is result one so this is basically our code uh, which is basically a beginner level code on how to create a database by connecting it uh, to the mongodb database and then we are creating a collection employee dot collection so let us just save this file on our system so give it a name uh, let's say mongodb one dot php make sure it is of the extension dot php file and select all files and it should be stored in your uh, you know folder that you have created which is mongodb dot php so this should be saved in this folder click on save all right so let us now go to the local host and see whether it is uh, created or not local host uh the folder name that we have given is mongodb php right click on that so as you can see we have a new file which is mongodb1.php which is created uh it is saying an error one second so there was a small error in the code i just rectified now when you click on uh so let's just type again uh search for it search the folder that you have saved now if you click that you have uh you know like this which says that object mongodb model based on document storage array object private array one okay dot float which means that is it means that you have successfully created uh, the uh, you know document as well as collection in your mongodb database so let's just verify by going into our database and see whether it is created or not just refresh it and you can see that we have a new company db uh, you know document and that we in that we have created a collection name which is AMP collection and it is reflecting also if you want to check in the mongodb shell also you can just cross verify it uh, so let us uh, write the command show dbs so that we can have an idea on which collections we have so as you can see even in the mongodb shell command line also we have company db which is reflecting in our output so if you use the company db it will say switch to db company db and then let's say if you want to see the collection that are present in that so you can see emp collection is reflecting in that so we have successfully created a document and collection using the php that is we have used the mongodb driver extension and we have written the script in uh, in php format so now whatever you are hosting the application that you are hosting on your web page all the data is also simultaneously stored in the mongodb database so this is how you can create a database and collection using php so in this tutorial we have just covered on uh, the basics on how to install and configure the mongodb driver extensions and how to create a basic uh, document and collection in this a session so stay tuned for the next tutorial where we will try to insert some uh, fields into our collection that we have created the fact that java is one of the top most programming languages in the world is due to the fact that it has some of the most robust and practical features 
Java is a modern, cutting edge, and ever evolving computing language that combines an elegant language design with powerful features that were not available in other languages, which include many powerful supporting software libraries for tasks such as database applications, networking, and graphical user interface programming. And did you know that we can use MongoDB to store our data with the help of Java? We know that MongoDB is a NoSQL database and it is a developer data platform that is compatible with several languages, including Java, which is a great fit for applications which are written in MongoDB. MongoDB provides connectivity for Java client applications using the Java driver. So firstly, what is Java? Java is a multi-platform object-oriented programming languages that runs on billions of devices worldwide currently. It powers applications, smartphone operating systems, enterprise software, and many well-known programs. So it is basically used to design and develop application software and other critical software frameworks. Now, the use cases of Java has been a prominent in many uh, sectors. It can be extremely trans used as a transferable programming language used across platforms and different types of devices from smartphones to smart TVs. It's used for creating mobile and web apps. It can also uh, be used in other sectors like gaming, big data and cloud-based applications and other uh, specifications as well. So now in order to integrate uh, MongoDB with Java, you don't need uh, high programming skills and you know much knowledge on Java. You just need basic level understanding of Java and its syntax. So before we get into the execution part, you need the three basic uh, things you know that you want to uh, perform with MongoDB and Java connection is you need to have a MongoDB that is installed on your uh, device and then you need to have Java development kit which is a JDK and then IDE which is an Eclipse. Now MongoDB installation is important uh, wherein we will connect the Mongo client which acts as the interface between our Java program and the MongoDB server. So it is basically used to create a connection which is used to connect all the relevant databases and retrieve collection names which are present in our MongoDB database into our JDK platform. It is basically used to perform uh, CRUD operations like create, read, update, delete operations on our collections and documents. Next, we are using a JDK. JDK is nothing but the uh, compiler or the source where you write the code, which is a software development environment that offers a collection of tools and repo repositories or libraries, which are necessary for developing any Java applications. So if you're integrating MongoDB with Java, you need certain dependencies or certain, let's say, uh, libraries that you need to connect in order to perform uh, MongoDB operations. So for that, we are using Maven. Maven is basically used for Java based projects, which helps in uh, downloading all the dependencies. If you are integrating uh, one language with another uh, to a database, I can, I, you can also uh, include libraries and jar files also. And finally, you need an integrated development environment that is an IDE. So we are using Eclipse for this. Eclipse is basically a free Java based development platform that allows developer to develop and test code written in other programming languages. So I hope you understood the basic concept on how we integrate MongoDB with Java. So let us now just get into the execution part and see how it is executed. So we have already installed MongoDB on our device. Uh, for now, we'll be just installing the ID, which is the Eclipse and the JDK. Now, in order to install JDK, you just have to go to Google, type Java Oracle. And on the home page, you will find this. Uh, just log into that. And on the right side, on the topmost corner, you can see download Java, which uh, is basically the latest version as Java 19. So you just have to click download Java. And if you scroll down, you have the various uh, download options. We are downloading the 19th, uh, which is the current version and we want it for Windows and we are installing for the 64 bit. So just click on this and it will automatically download. Now I have already uh, downloaded it on my system. So just wait for the installation process to complete and give the necessary permissions and click on finish finally. So we have successfully downloaded Java on our device. Now let's see if it is downloaded or not. Go to the uh, C drive and go to program files. And you can see we have a folder named Java. Click on that. So as you can see that we have the latest version which is JDK 19. Go to bin folder. 
and this is where we have all the uh, repositories or the important files of the JDK program. Now what you have to do is you have to set the path. For that just uh, click on this and copy paste everything. And what you have to do is you have to paste it in the uh, system environment variables. So it is mandatory to add the path to the system variable. Now by default, most of the programs uh, will add their own custom shortcuts to the Windows environment variables. So the most used environment will variable in Windows is probably the path variable. So it, it basically allows you to run any executable uh, commands that are located inside the path specified in the variable at the command prompt without having to give the full path to the executable uh, command. So instead of you know, uh, compiling the ways to add the directory to the path each and every time when you are working on Java or the JDK, you can just simply add the path to the environmental variable. So once you are done with that, just come back and uh, let us now download the Eclipse also. So you just have to click Eclipse Java. So on the first page, you can see Eclipse ID for Java developers. You can also find information on the right side of it. So let's just download the latest version of it. So as you can see, uh, the latest version is Eclipse ID 2012 tool. 2022 tool, click on download X. And again, uh, it will show the uh, version, just click on download and it will finally get downloaded. So give the necessary permissions again guys, uh, I've already installed it on my system. So this is just for reference. So once it's downloaded, you are good to go. So once you download it, it will be, it will show you and just type Eclipse in the search box as you can see. And when you try to open it, it will ask for a selected directory as a workspace. Now this is by default, just keep this as it is and launch. So I'm choosing this. So once you click on launch, you will find this uh, final navigation page wherein we'll have to create a Java project now. Now as discussed earlier, we'll be creating a Maven project which is used to add uh, dependencies to a Java driver in order to connect MongoDB and uh, Java together. So I'll just new, click on, go to file, click on new and we have the other option here. Click on Maven project and click on next and tick the box which says create a simple project, click on next again. Now you can need to give a group ID and an artifact ID. Now it can be of any name. So let's just say I am taking it as Java Mongo and let's just copy paste it again here. It should be same otherwise it will show an error. So I'm just creating a new Maven project with name Java Mongo. Click on finish. Okay, it says that we have already created Java Mongo just create another one let's take one so i have already created uh you know maven project of that name java mongo so i'm just changing the name and creating it as mongo java now so just double click on that now you can see various uh you know types of specifications that we get into this project it says the main wherein you have to write your code here and the resources test resources and then you have jre system library src target and Next, we have the POM Excel. So POM.xml file is where you add the dependencies. Now we are working with MongoDB and we are trying to integrate uh, with the Java application, right? So for that, you need to install the necessary Java drivers and Maven, which is a project based, will give an access by providing various dependencies to our MongoDB and uh, Java driver. So the syntax for that would be just, it's a, normal uh, syntax just follow this you can even pause once it's done so the syntax is followed as uh, open the uh, syntax as dependencies and inside that you have to basically again give the tag as dependency Uh, the computer is already showing for you. Uh, 
again close that and it will also have the end tag now you have to basically give, give the group id that you have created for the maven project so it is also giving the group id for us so i'll just take uh, the group now you have to mention as org dot mongodb so you can see it is auto uh, you know pasting for us itself just click on this and next we have to give the artifact id as well artifact id will basically be mongo java driver all right next we have to mention the version of it so let's say i am taking the version as for this as 3.8.1 which is one of the latest versions you can even find uh, the latest versions accordingly on the uh, uh, mongodb official page also you can copy paste that and you can use that as well so i'm just using 3.8.1 here so we have successfully copied our dependencies here so just save it uh, by pressing ctrl and s it will automatically save for you so it will say building 100% it means successfully we have added all the dependencies that are necessary for our mongodb java driver all right now let us go to the main section part where we'll write the actual code first we need to uh, basically connect the mongo client which is basically an interface between the mongodb and java so for that i'm just creating a new class here guys so click on new click on class and just give a name of uh, of your own type i'm just giving as java mongo and click on uh, which methods have you would like to create okay we need to have the main uh, right main section right so for that i'm using uh, i'm clicking on that so that we'll have the public static void main uh, automatically added to that so just click on finish so as you can see we have created a class with the name java mongo and we have created the uh, main header part as well so we'll just write the code here for that we need to create uh, basically where we want to connect the mongodb client right so i'm just writing the code so i'm just creating uh, i'm just writing a comment first we are basically creating a mongodb client all right so the code for that would be mongodb sorry mongo client and mongo client again is the keyword we are using and we are basically connecting a new a new one right so i'm just writing the new mongo client as the keyword and inside that we have to mention the uh, client version so basically we have the 27017 which is the common or default port so inside the brackets mention local host and mention the version of it which is 27017 close the brackets put put semicolon and next you have to basically print out this right so in java we use system so if you're familiar if you're someone who have already worked on java you might have known this we use the system dot out dot print ln as our uh, output command print sorry dot dot print ln so what, basically what i'm telling is that once it is successfully connected i want it to uh, you know show me created mongo uh, let's say connection successfully so this is what i want my uh, you know java specification to deliver this output once it is directly connected with the mongodb client so this is basically the output i mean the code for that and we also have to include some libraries uh, for example let's say import we have the mongodb client right so it is import dot com dot mongodb dot mongo client and next we have another one which is import com dot client dot mongo collection and finally we have import com dot mongo db dot client since we are also connecting the database to it we need to mention the database uh, library as well 
which is client.mongodb database. So these are some of the important uh, which you need to keep in mind before we get in the uh, we execute this. We have to mention we have to import all the libraries from our uh, MongoDB instance. So this is what we have. So now before we get into the execution part, we also need to open our MongoDB instance. So for that, I'm just going to C drive again. Click on program files. Go to MongoDB folder, uh, and then you have server. Click on 6.0. Go to bin and just click double click on this path and clear this and type cmd which is command prompt again it will be direct and this basically type mongod wherein we are starting the mongod instance so it will take time to load it so just keep it aside now let's just get back to our uh, jdk eclipse where we have successfully uh you know made an uh, connection with the mongodb client we have imported all the libraries now click Control shift o all right now next what you have to do is just right click on it click on run as it says java application click on that so as you can see we have successfully uh, you know created a mongo connection successfully now it shows that some reference jan 7 2023 mongod diagnostic logging center info cluster created with settings which is the localhost 27017 mode single and all that so if you are getting this on your screen that means you have successfully created a mongodb connection all right so let us now create a database and perform some you know CRUD operations like creating a collection inserting some documents into that so now it will take a lot of time to you know write each and every single syntax for creating a database and then inserting and then performing operations on that so to save time i've already created a file i'll just uh, leave the link in the description below you can check the uh, all the syntax and the commands uh, that are in the present in the drive so for now what you have done is we've just basically created a mongo client here and next we have to create a database now in general if it will list out all the database that are present in that and if you want another database it will automatically create a database for you just have to mention the database name so what i'm doing is i'm just uh, just reading out this syntax which is mongodb db and then we are using the get database keyword i'm just creating a database name let's say mongodb java and then i'm printing it out which says get, get database is successful next in order to get all the databases in there we have to use mongo cursor string db cursors and we are using an iterator here that will list out all the uh, databases that are present in our mongodb database so i'm just basically copying all this data and let us go to our eclipse paste it here so i think now let's just again uh, run it let's see what is the output so it says error existence require project model proceed with launch proceed so it mean it basically shows error that that's because you know we haven't created uh you know of any collection and document into our uh, mongodb database mongodb java database right so that is why it says uh, there is an error in this so we'll just fix it out so once you execute this you can see that it is says it says that open collect connection and it is connecting to our mongodb uh, database and you can see we have the list of all the databases like admin company db config local mongodb backup simply code one student db test now if you just want to cross verify it let's just uh, go to that so let me just open command prompt and click mongo write mongo sh which is mongo shell it will basically connect to that so in general what we do is we show uh, we use the show dbs command in order to retrieve all the databases so you can see admin company config and uh, all the other databases that are present so let's just compare it with our uh, whether it is not correct or not so you can see admin company db config we have local test database we have student db simply code one and mongodb backup now the thing is So now the next main problem is that we just created a mongodb database java database but we haven't created any collection and we haven't inserted any documents in that so that is the reason it is not showing mongodb java database as of now so for that we basically create a document and we'll basically create a uh, collection here so let's just 
roll back to our uh, uh, syntax of how to insert a sample record by creating collection and a document. All right, now the code is followed as Mongo collection and within the uh, tag which we mention as document, mention the collection name where we are using the db dot get collection command again. And let's say the collection name is Java programs. And then I am mentioning a new document name which is document doc is equals to new document. And let's say our document name is hello world here. So I'm basically just uh, retrieving all the values for that I'm using uh, this system dot outprintl ln and I want to uh, the computer the system to mention this when it successfully gets executed right so I'm mentioning it as insertion is completed so let's just copy paste it and let's see the output how it goes so when you execute that you can clearly see that now in the list of all the databases we can see MongoDB Java also which we have created just now so let's just cross verify and go to our Mongo shell and see whether or not it is showing or not. So again, click show DBS. So you can see we have successfully created MongoDB Java. And if you try to use MongoDB Java, we have switched to MongoDB Java. And when you try to show collections, it will basically show a collection name, which is Java program. Now, if you want to find the documents that are present in that, you just have to mention db.java program dot find. Okay, I just gave a space. So I've just changed the name. I've, uh, we need, we shouldn't give a space to our uh, collection name. So I just change the name again as Java program. Now, if you just uh, write the collection in order to find the documents that are present in that, which is Java dot program db.java which is the collection name db.java program.find you can clearly see that there is a document which is of name hello world that means you have successfully created your document in mongodb database by integrating with the java application so that is how you use java uh, with the help of mongodb in order to create files and store data in your mongodb database now i can understand uh, you know it is important that you need to have some sort of knowledge on java syntax and all the uh, you know syntax all the basic syntax we are using here so it it will take a lot it will take some time in order to get familiar with how to use mongodb with java this is just a basic interpretation of how you can use you know using the java application in order to integrate with mongodb database and store your information so we'll be covering uh, some more in the next tutorial wherein we'll cover how to uh, perform read and write operations how to update delete and even drop uh, the collections that we have created so for now let's just understand let's just we've uh, focused only on how to uh, connect the mongodb interface with the java and then we have created how to create a database and then how to create a simple collection and document and we have also inserted some uh, simple recording as you all know we are living and working in a data driven world so if you want to make the most of the data you need to organize easily accessible information in other words you need a database right a database is any structured information or data specially organized and stored in a computer for fast retrieval and searching of a data well that's great but there are a lot of database out there in the market so which is the right one and when to use the different databases out there now as you know we have different databases like mysql my microsoft sql server cassandra mongodb and so many popular databases out there surely you would have heard about all these uh, databases several times Firstly, let us go through the agenda for today's session. We'll start the tutorial by understanding what is MongoDB and then we'll go through and understand and why we use MongoDB and after that we'll be discussing some features of MongoDB. Up next, we'll discuss how exactly MongoDB works and after that, we'll be discussing some advantages of MongoDB over MySQL and then we'll have a detailed comparison between these two databases that is MySQL versus MongoDB. And finally, we'll understand which is the better database and when should be using these two databases. All right. So what is MongoDB? MongoDB is an open source, non-relational database developed by MongoDB INC. MongoDB stores data as documents in a binary rep representation called JSON or binary JSON format. 
Related information is stored together for fast access query through the MongoDB query language. Now fields can vary from document to document in the MongoDB database. So there is no need to declare the structure of the documents to the system. So documents are self describing here. So if a new field needs to be added to a document, then the field can be created without affecting all the other documents in the collection. Now MongoDB is a non-relational database system which is a docu document based database. Now there are two primary databases type as we know that is SQL which is a relational and a NoSQL which is non-relational and MongoDB is also based on that. Now relational databases store data in columns and rows. So organizations like Microsoft use uh, Microsoft SQL Server uh, to use the relational database management system. While on the other hand, NoSQL database uh, stores schema-less unstructured data in a multiple collections and nodes. Non-relational databases don't need fixed table schema whereas no data, NoSQL databases are scaled horizontally and support limited joint queries. So that was about MongoDB guys. So let us now understand what is MySQL. As you all know, MySQL is a popular open source relational database management system which is developed, distributed and supported by Oracle Corporation. Like any other relational database system, MySQL st stores data in tables and uses structured query language or SQL for database access. In MySQL, you predefine your database schema, right, based on your requirement and set up rules to govern the relationship between the fields in your table. So any changes in schema necessities a migration that can take a database offline and significant significantly reduces the application performance. So that was about MySQL. So let us now move ahead and discuss why we exactly use MongoDB. Now MongoDB uh, uses the hierarchical storage structure instead of a table like structure. As we discussed earlier, RDBMS stores the data in the form of a table which comprises of rows and data. Now MongoDB uses documents that contain sub documents in a complex hierarchies making it expressive and more flexible. Now MongoDB can map objects from any programming languages ensuring easy implementation and maintenance. MongoDB is used to handle large amounts of complex unstructured data. Now unlike MySQL you only work on structured data that is uh, it has a proper structure for example name uh, you know a sort of like that so in that case we use my x my sql but whereas uh, compared to when it compared to my mongodb it only handles uh, large amounts of complex unstructured data mongodb is open source less and has less server cost and it has no fixed pro schema so NoSQL database or in particular a MongoDB databases are cheaper and easier to maintain. These databases have feature like easier data distribution, they are simpler data models, aggregation, file storage, indexing and many more. These benefits require less administrative cost and consequently are less expensive. Alright, let us now discuss some of the features of MongoDB. MongoDB is a general purpose language. MongoDB can serve diverse sets of data and multiple purposes within a single application where it uses document oriented type of uh, database to store data. It has a flexible schema design. The document oriented approach allows non-defined attributes to be modified in a single go or on the fly. This is a key contrast between the MongoDB and other, other relational databases like MySQL. Scalability and load balancing. Now, MongoDB is built to scale both vertically and horizontally using the technique of sharding and architect uh, can achieve both write and read operation scalability in this. Data balancing occurs automatically and transparently to the user by the shard balancer. Now, we'll be discussing about all this uh, in our upcoming video wherein we'll discuss what exactly is MongoDB and in a detailed manner. So in that time, uh, we'll be discussing about this. So for now, let's just keep it uh, simple and we'll understand how it is. Aggregation framework. Now MongoDB offers an extract, transform and load, which is an ETL operation of framework, which eliminates the need for complex data pipelining. 
And finally, just like any other databases, it has high performance as well as speed. So those were some of the important features of MongoDB. All right, let us now understand uh, how MongoDB exactly works, guys. Now the entire database of a MongoDB consists of collections. These collections hold multiple documents and since MongoDB is a schema list, the documents in one collection need not be similar. So it can be of different types. Now all data is stored as JSON documents with the help of a key value pair. Now at the back end, MongoDB converts JSON data into a binary format known as JSON. MongoDB also makes provision for nested data. This makes fetching data comparatively efficient. Now if I want to tell you guys how exactly MongoDB works and how is it different from MySQL. Now instead of tables, a MongoDB database stores its data in collections. So basically we have a database in both these uh, uh, MySQL and MongoDB, but instead of the tables in uh, SQL or MySQL, we have the collections. Now a collection holds one or more JSON documents. Now documents are analogous to records or rows in a relational database table. Now each document has one or more fields and fields are similar to the columns in a relational database. So this is basically So this is an example of how a document look like uh, in a MongoDB database guys. So we have a uh, various fields here such as ID, first name, last name, address, street, uh, city, state and zip and hobbies. So instead of storing them in a row and column we are just uh, storing it as a document file here. So that is what uh, MongoDB is and how it exactly exactly works. All right, moving ahead, let us now discuss some of the advantages of MongoDB over MySQL. Now, the one of the biggest advantages of using MongoDB is it has flexible document schema. Now, schema design for a database is critical and choosing the right schema for your application impacts the performance and affects its ability to adapt over changing business requirements. So, MongoDB is a great choice for modern applications as it offers a flexible schema design that allows you to meet the ever changing condition characteristics of complex and big data applications so unlike mysql where you need to define a schema while creating a new table that is the whole structure of the table as in which uh, the attribute type uh, the you have to all allot the primary key and so on so in mongodb you are not required to do that you can just uh, directly go with it now the second advantage is of course it is an open source and it and it incurs few server costs. So as discussed earlier MongoDB is an open source and it incurs fewer server costs. So open source is always free. So no SQL databases use cheap servers so the price of data storage and processing is also significantly lower as well. And it is also easily and highly scalable uh, that means no SQL databases like MongoDB expand horizontally. That means you can scale by adding more machines like CPU and RAM to your resource pool. And finally, it is schemaless and user friendly as well. Now MongoDB has uh, has no schema hassles. You can place data into a no SQL database without requiring a predefined schema. So you can change the data model and formats without dis disrupting the applications or changing the data structures as well. And it is also user friendly guys. It offers plenty of useful features uh, like cab collection, file storage, indexing, load balancing, replication, server side JavaScript execution that makes it a user friendly database. All right, moving ahead, let us now discuss how MongoDB and MySQL are different from each other. Now when I talk about MySQL, it stores each individual record or data as a table cell within a particular row and column. So if you want to uh, inculcate a new data into a particular table, it is always defined into a table with a particular schema and structure and it is stored in the formats of rows and columns. Whereas MongoDB, it stores unrelated data in JSON-like documents after converting into a JSON file. Now MySQL requires a schema definition for the tables in the database. So as we discussed earlier, before creating a table, you need to specify the structure or the schema that is the attributes and the values that has to be present in it. Whereas MongoDB doesn't require any prior schema. 
MySQL supports structured query language, which is it's SQL, which is used to access and manipulate the data in the database. MongoDB uses JavaScript or JSON or JQL as a query language. MySQL supports join operations. That is, you can join multi, one or more multiple tables using various join operations like inner join, outer join, left join, and outer join. While in MongoDB, we does not have the option of join. And finally, MySQL databases can be scaled vertically, whereas MongoDB da database can be scaled both vertically as well as horizontally. All right, that brings us to the end of today's session and which also brings us to the main question that which database you should be using. Now, although MongoDB is a great database, there are times when you should and you shouldn't use it. It's not universally uh, applicable, guys. So like any other tool, it has a li certain limitations and drawbacks as well. But if you're working on a database, for example, requires multi-row transactions and has structured data with a clear schema and if you're performing various transactions, in that case, MySQL is a good choice. Now, if I, MongoDB works best with unstructured data. So it's great for complex big data systems, guys. So if you are using even cloud computing, MongoDB is very ideal for cloud computing as well. Cloud-based storage needs to easily distribute data across multiple servers, right? So which basically suits MongoDB nature perfectly. Also, you can use uh, MongoDB if you have a need to fast and easy accessible of data. So using MongoDB when you are running performance critical applications. So in that case, you can use MongoDB, which offers high data availability, providing instant and automatic data recovery. And that brings us to the end of today's session, guys. That was all about MySQL and MongoDB and how they are different from each other. So stay tuned to the channel uh, for our upcoming video, wherein we'll discuss clearly and in more detail about MongoDB, where we'll discuss uh, how it exactly works, where it has initially started, and why is it a good choice for you when you're working on a complex data structures? MongoDB has consistently been ranked as one of the top five NoSQL database management systems. So if you're someone who's applying for a position in database management roles, you will almost certainly be working with MongoDB at some point. Now, whether you're upgrading your skills or interviewing for a database management position using MongoDB, it's a good idea to be familiar with the most frequently asked MongoDB interview questions and answers. In the latter case, it is beneficial for you to prepare for the interview so that you're not caught off guard. Even if you are just interested in learning about MongoDB for the sake of upskilling, keep in mind that acquiring this kind of knowledge may lead you to looking for a better job, which means you will be facing an interview sooner. So firstly, let us discuss the agenda. Now this MongoDB interview question is intended to give you a general idea of the types of interview questions you might face. Now we will be covering some theoretical as well as practical questions in this tutorial. Now typically, recruiters begin with simple questions and gradually increase the difficulty level. So in this MongoDB interview questions tutorial, we'll start with the basics and then progress to more complex questions. Now, before we begin with the types of questions that are being asked, here's a simple and quick tip for everyone who's watching this video. Now, make sure you have the never give up attitude. I know it's that time of the year where placements are going in a rampant way, but and I know you might be giving interviews uh, regularly. And what if you uh, didn't get an offer in one of the interviews from that. So make sure you have that attitude of never give up and prepare for your next interview. And whenever you're giving an interview, make sure you're interactive. Being interactive is one of the most best or best way you can say in order to get, uh, you know, hired by the recruiter. So make sure you're conversing properly with the interviewer while asking the questions. And finally, behave professionally, which is another key aspect while giving an interview. So let us now discuss the first question, which is the basic question which will be asked, which is explain what is MongoDB and its features. So this is how you can answer. MongoDB is basically an open source cross-platform NoSQL document oriented database management system. Now, NoSQL can be utilized as a substitute for traditional relational databases like SQL, and MySQL, which is dependent on the SQL language, right? So if you want to work with large data sets of distributed data, then NoSQL databases may be quite supportive, which are used to store large volumes of data in the form of documents. 
which will offer the developers the flexibility to work with the evolving data models as there is no fixed schema in this. Now relational databases such as MySQL and Oracle store data in tables and rows, right? They are based on a branch of a theory known as relational databases. Now these relational databases are structured and tables can be linked with each other via a foreign key, which is a property of relational database, which is asset property, which is being satisfied by the relational database. But whereas the MongoDB being a documented oriented database, it can handle only that sort of information and store as well as retrieve information from this documents only. It provides the flexibility as well as scalability that you want with the querying and indexing according to your requirement. This MongoDB basically is based on JSON like documents where we store all the information in that. So this is how you can answer the question which is what is MongoDB and its features. Well, the next question is, what are some alternative NoSQL databases to MongoDB? Now we have various alternatives from MongoDB such as Cassandra. Apache Cassandra is a free and open source distributed NoSQL database management system, which is again similar to that of MongoDB to handle large amounts of unstructured data across the servers, providing high availability with no single point of failure. Apache Cassandra is a database which can be a right choice when you need scalability and also high availability without compromising performance. Next we have Redis. Redis is actually another uh, popular NoSQL database which is an open source which is implemented as a distributed key value store with optional durability. It can be also used as a catchy and a message broker. Also we have other types, other popular NoSQL databases like Amazon Dyno, DynamoDB, Apache HBase and Neo4j. Now HBase again is an open source non-relational uh, distributed database guys. It is generally written in JavaScript and it is also developed as part of the Apache Software Foundation. So these are some of the examples and can be used in alternative to MongoDB. Alright, let us now move to the next question which is what type of NoSQL database is MongoDB? Now, in general, we have four different types of categories when we talk about in which category MongoDB comes under. So basically, we have key value, column based, document database and graph database. Now, when I talk about key value, this database store data as an index key and value pairs. This database is stored data in a schema less way. Example of a uh, key value data store include Cassandra, Redis, DynamoDB and etc. Next, we have column based. Now column based or column store type of database is the one where these databases are designed to store data as columns of data rather than as rows as data. If it stores in a row type of data again it becomes a traditional which is not a NoSQL database right. So again example of a column store databases are HBase even Cassandra comes under the column based as well. Next we have the document database which is actually the type of NoSQL database that we are looking for which is MongoDB. Now document databases are designed to store documents with each document having a unique key and popular document databases are Couchbase and MongoDB. And finally we also have a graph type of database where they are based on graph theory. So these databases are basically designed for data which needs to be represented as graphs. So the data that is present in this sort of database is interconnected with multiple number of relationship between them in, uh, in the form of graphs and trees and a popular uh, graph database is Neo4j as well as Big Data. So this is what MongoDB is and it comes under the document database type of NoSQL database. The next question is how does MongoDB store data? Now data in MongoDB is stored in JSON documents or the JSON style data structures. Documents contain one or more fields and each field contains a value of a specific data type. So MongoDB stores data records as documents which are in the form of JSON documents which are gathered together in collections. So these documents as we said earlier has a sub specific data types including let's say arrays, normal general data and these documents tend to share a similar structure which are organized as collection. So you can say a group of documents are kept in a collection. It may be helpful to think of documents as in a comparison to the rows in a relational database. So fields are similar to columns and collections are similar to tables in MySQL database which is again a no, it's a relational database. So this is how MongoDB stores data. 
The next question is MongoDB is a schemaless database. If yes, how do you create schema in MongoDB? Now the schema of a database describes the structure of the data to be stored, right? In a relational database, the schema defines its tables, its fields in each table and the relationship between each field and each table. So if you take SQL as an example, which is a schema based database, right? So its schema is defined by the tables and the fields that is the columns and rows that are present in it and the relation between them. On the other hand, we have MongoDB. Now in documented oriented databases like MongoDB, data is stored in collections of key value pairs. Now given that JSON is a schema free data structure and that MongoDB depends on it, it would be more accurate to say that it has a dynamically typed data. So whenever you create an inserted document to create a schema, it will automatically create one for you. So whenever a document is added, the database will automatically create the corresponding collection. The next question is how is MongoDB different from SQL and better than MySQL? Now MongoDB is again a documented oriented NoSQL database which is used to store high volume of data and which needs to process your huge data in a quick session. Now it is a database that came into picture around the mid 2000s and it is again considered into the category of a NoSQL database. Whereas when you take SQL, SQL is a programming language used to communicate with and manipulate relational databases. For example, MySQL. Now there are quite differences between both of these databases basis right being being one as a relational database the other being relational and non relational database there are quite differences between them so for example if you take the structure in sql data is represented in tables whereas the data is represented in documents and this further documents are stored in collections now schema again sql has a predefined schema so whenever you are creating a table you need to predefine its schema whereas mongodb does not have the implications of specifying any schema before working on it so it has basically a dynamic schema next we have this scalability the data in sql can be vertically scalable and when it comes to mongodb both horizontal and vertical scalable of scaling of data is possible when i talk about transactions sql also supports atomic operations and follows asset properties Whereas MongoDB does not have proper support for transactions and it follows cap theorem. And finally, the type of operations. Now, some operations that we perform in relational databases like SQL, for example, SQL supports join operation, whereas we don't have uh, the same sort of join operation in MongoDB. So in this way, MongoDB is different from SQL and in some ways it is better than MySQL in terms of processing a lot of unstructured data and also has certain features like replication, sharding and map reduce and some of more critical uh, features that are not present in MySQL. Well, the next question is what are the different data models in MongoDB? Now data models are categorized into two types. The first one is embedded data model. The next one is referent data model. Now if I talk about embedded data model, embedded documents capture relationship between data by storing related data in a single document structure. Whereas reference data models store the relationship between data by including any links or references from one document to another. Moving on to the next question. The next question is how does indexing works in MongoDB? Now a good indexing strategy be it a relational database or a NoSQL database, it is essential for ensuring that your database returns your results as quickly as possible. Now MongoDB indexing is a special data structure on which the index is created to hold the data of a specific fields in a document. Now in the absence of indexing in MongoDB, there is a need to scan every collection, which is basically a collection scan. So MongoDB indexes make it unnecessary to perform a collection scan which involves looking through every document in collection for matches to your query. It also provides effective indexing strategy. Now any collection in MongoDB can have uh, one or more indexes and those indexes can be made on one or more multiple fields and even through throughout a MongoDB database. So you need a good indexing strategy to quickly and let's say effectively access the data you require from it. And it also provides search efficiency. Now indexing is a necessary operation in MongoDB which will bring search efficiency in various execution of statements. So this is how indexing works in MongoDB. So moving on to the next question, what is MongoDB replication and sharding? 
Now, if I talk about replication, replication means duplicating the same data across multiple MongoDB servers. So the main use of replication is the data is available at an instant way that is high availability of data and it also supports data redundancy and multiple copies of, of the data are being saved across servers and also it provides data recovery and backup options as well. So in a nutshell, you can say that database replication is the process of copying data from one database in one server to a, another database in another server ensuring that the same data is available on more than one MongoDB server. So again, the main purpose of using replication is data redundancy and high availability. So by keeping data several copies or replicas stored on physically separate servers, it will ensure that the data is uh, protected and it is also accessible whenever we need. And also by generating multiple copies of your data, replication enables you to increase data availability, which is also another important factor. This is especially helpful if a server fails. So in that case, you can use the replication. And finally, you can also recover the data that is lost due to any uninterrupted or any hardware failure issues. Now, if I talk about sharding, sharding is also similar to that of replication, but it is a method of distributing data across multiple databases and MongoDB supports this deployment of data with having large data sets and high throughput via sharding. So let's take an example. So you can give an example to the uh, recruiter like this. Let's say I have a database having 2 million users and it has a capacity which is 2 million records. Now what I'm doing is I'm basically distributing the data across multiple databases and I'm storing different data in different uh, databases. Now we have two machines which has 1 million user capacity and another 1 million user capacity. So in this way you can add more and more multiple databases in order to store your data. So by adding more capacity to a single server such as adding more memory and processing units or adding more RAM on a single server that can be done using sharding. Let us now to move on to the next question which is explain horizontal and vertical scaling. Now vertical scaling refers to adding more resources like CPU, RAM or any hardware or hard drive disk space to your server which is again a database or an application server which is done on demand. On the other hand Horizontal scaling refers or involves adding more processing units or physical machines to your server or databases. Now MongoDB which is a NoSQL database handles horizontal scaling through sharding. So in a nutshell you can say that vertical scaling can be used in order to increase or decrease the capacity of existing services. Whereas horizontal scaling adds more resources like virtual machines to your system to spread out the workload across them. The next question is when should we embed one document with another? So you should consider embedded document that is sub document whenever you rely on these four factors that is when the relationship is one to few that is it can be one to one to many but not one to one. So for unlimited use case you should start considering separating sub documents into another collection. The next situation is when retrieval is likely to happen together which will improve the performance in such case you can embed one document with another. The next factor is when updates are likely to happen at the same time, you can use this multi-document transaction by embedding data model. And finally, when the field is rarely updated, in such case, you can use the embedded document. Well, let us now move on to the next question, which is what are replica sets and explain primary and secondary replica sets. In MongoDB, the process of replication, as we discussed earlier, is done via using replica sets in simple words. It is a group of MongoD processes to keep the same data across different servers. Now a replica set is basically a collection of related MongoDB nodes which must have three nodes at least. Now one of them must be a primary and the rest secondary ones and a replication structure can have up to 50 nodes. So the main types of nodes that we have is primary and the secondary or you can call them as primary and secondary replica sets. Now when I talk about primary uh, replica set, it is the primary is the member in the replica set that receives the write and read operations. But read operations can be pointed out to secondary nodes changing the configuration at the moment to perform the query. Besides the replica set can have only one primary node at most. 
and talking about secondary the secondary is the node where the data is replicated to maintain a copy a replica set can have one or more secondary nodes and the clients cannot write data to secondary ones only they can read from them and if at all there is any failed node it works as a secondary node again until it is until a new primary node will be replaced with that so this is what a replica set means and the type of replica set which is the primary and secondary i hope you understood this so moving on to the next question which is what is the use of capped collections now the size of collection in mongodb is typically unrestricted right so the collection increases its size as more documents are being uh, added to that now a capped collection is a special type of collection that has either a fixed number of documents in a collection or fixed number of elements so it creates new documents by overriding the oldest documents present in that collection so capped collections can have maximum size or document counts that prevent them from go growing beyond the maximum threshold that is being allocated and all capped collections must specify a maximum size and may also specify a maximum document count only now mongodb removes older documents if a collection reaches the maximum size limit before it reaches the maximum document count so overall the structure and functionality of a capped collection supports high performance for crud operations like create read and delete so this is what capped collections is and some of its characteristics and why we use it let us now move on to the next question which is how can you store images videos and other large files now we often need to store files in our databases but mongodb sometimes or it doesn't let you store any file larger than 16 mb in a normal document so what you have to do instead mongodb has a functionality specifically for storing large files and it goes by the name gridfs yes you have heard it right gridfs is a driver specification for uploading and retrieval of mongodb files which are larger than 16 mb in order to store images videos and other large files it is one of the most popular specifications and it it has a size limit of more than 16 mb so you can store images videos that have size more than of 16 mb now chunks of files like be it an audio it a bit of pdf file or anything it is being streamed as a chunks so these are streamed into the database and each chunk is uh, limited to 255 kb in the size this means that the last chunk is normally either equal to or less than 255 kb so whenever you read from gridfs the driver resembles all the chunks as needed this means that you can read sections of a file as per your query range so i hope you understood uh, what is gridfs and what is the process to uh, store images videos and other large files which is of more than 16 mb so basically the interviewer want to know that whether you are not familiar with the concept of gridfs so that is the reason he might ask you this question so you have to be well prepared for it well the next question is explain aggregation in mongodb mongodb aggregation process the data records during an aggregation operation and returns a single computed result just like any other operations that are performed in a relational database similar to that aggregation is also used in order to act on a group of values from multiple documents present in a collection to perform operations on this grouped values and return a single computed results now it actually groups multiple documents which applies an aggregation operation and it is basically returning as the particular value that we want from that operation now there are various ways on how you can perform aggregation we have three different ways of carrying the aggregation process in mongodb the first one is aggregation pipeline next we have map reduce and finally we have single purpose aggregation so you can further explain each of these uh, aggregation uh, depending upon the interviewer's preference so basically aggregation process in mongodb is modeled on the concepts of data processing pipeline so multiple document enter the pipeline and then these documents are being transformed into the aggregated results next we have the map reduce as the name suggests it has two operation which is mapping and then reducing that operation so it will map each document and process along with uh, one or more objects for each document and reduce phase in which output of map operations are being combined together and finally we have single purpose aggregation operation where these operations aggregate all the documents from a single collection in 
MongoDB. Now, even though they provide a simple access to the basic uh, aggregation operations, they lack the flexibility that are being provided by the aggregation pipeline and MapReduce operation. So these are the three uh, aggregation pipeline method which they go through. First is basically the match stage which will filter the records or the documents we need to work with. Uh, and next it performs the group operation which basically is the aggregation and finally it will sort the data. So it will sort the resulting documents the way we require that is in ascending and descending order. Now just like uh, any other operations given by aggregation in MongoDB, we also have five different types of uh, operations that we can perform which is sum which will add up the values of every document. Next we have average which will compute the average value of every document and we have min which returns a minimum value from a document and we have max which will return the maximum value within a collection and finally we have push which will add the value to an array in the document. Moving on to the next question, what is meant by ID field in MongoDB? ID is the field that uniquely identifies a document present in the MongoDB collection. So when you are trying to insert a new document into the database, MongoDB will automatically create a unique ID field which will have a unique value to its name. Now by default MongoDB creates a unique index on the ID field during the creation of any collection. And the ID field is always the first field in the document. And if the server receives a document that does not have any ID field first, then the server will move the field to the beginning. And also ID field can be avoided in the document that you want to return by setting the value of the ID field as zero in the query. So what are some utilities for backup and restoring in MongoDB? Now by default MongoDB shell does not include any import, export of data or even duplication or retrieval of uh, data from other uh, you know applications but however mongodb provides the utilities uh, and database tools to take backup and perform the restore operations now mainly we have four type of backup and restoring options which are mongo import mongo export mongo dump and mongo restore so you can use one of these utilities like mongo uh, dump import export and restore to move your data in and out of your MongoDB database. Now, the most commonly used are MongoDump and MongoRestore. The MongoDump utility creates a binary backup, you know, of a MongoDB database. The MongoDump tool is the preferred method of dumping data from your source MongoDB deployment. And if you're trying uh, to restore the data that you have basically deleted or dumped, you can use the MongoRestore in order to fetch back the data that you have dumped. So the next question is, can you explain about MapReduce process in MongoDB? MapReduce is basically a data processing uh, paradigm for condensing large volumes of data into useful aggregated results. So basically MongoDB provides the MapReduce feature for only aggregation purposes. And generally there are two phases of the MapReduce as you can see in the name which is mapping and reducing. So in the first phase each document is processed and emits common and redundant part of the document to pass a unique record for the next phase. And in the next phase all the unique part gets together and aggregated to produce a single result. And finally we have a query. Here we'll pass the query to filter the resultant set. So with the help of MapReduce, users can perform sorting, filtering and document modification as per their need. So moving on to the next question which is, how does MongoDB ensure high availability of data? In general, high availability refers to the uh, you know, improvement of a system or any applications availability by minimizing the downtime caused by a routine maintenance or any hardware uh, related uh, you know issues so mongodb automatically stores copy sets and multiple copies of data distributed across servers and data centers now in general mongodb is one such database which can provide high availability for the users by using features like replication and sharding now in replication the replica sets help prevent website downtime using native duplication and automatic failures now mongodb has a great support for high availability without no thought uh, through replication set but replica set is not enough for a production ready system that is it requires a bit of planning in order to deploy this 
So sometimes it might be an issue, but in most of the cases, if the system crashes or the hardware or software faces any issues, uh, you know, MongoDB in the data, MongoDB helps you recover and backup your data in the system. So the next question is, what is the role of profiler in MongoDB? Now, so far we have discussed some of the basic to moderate uh, level questions, guys. Now, from here on, you will find some practical as well as, you know, advanced level questions. So you might need to focus a little bit and even if you're not confident and if you don't know the answer which we're discussing now you can uh, directly tell to the recruiter or the interviewer that uh, you do not know the answer but you hope that you have an idea on this and you can work on that and you can get back to him so again let's get back to the question which is what is the role of profiler in mongodb now database profiler is used to collect information regarding the queries which are executed on an individual database instance so basically this uh, profiler in mongodb database allows you to collect performance data about operations occurring on a mongodb instance the next question is can we use regular expressions in mongodb now in SQL, we do have regular expressions where we need, uh, where we write a query to find certain patterns that are present in our uh, database table, right? In a similar way, regular expressions are also used to match patterns in a document, just like finding a pattern in an SQL tables. So regular expression basically provides patterns or sequence of characters for matching and defining a search pattern. And also retrieving an unidentified field using a certain pattern becomes easily within a document. And querying a database in order to find a smaller subset of data within a collection, we can use regular expression. So regex operator in MongoDB provides regular expression capabilities for pattern matching strings in the queries. And the syntax is followed as db.collectionname.find, mention the field name and mention the regex uh, keyword and mention the pattern. Now the pattern can be of any uh, of your choice. So the next question is, how do you search for documents in which a specific field has one or more values? Now you can say this is a bit of practical question guys. The interviewer wants to know whether you are not, uh, whether or not you are comfortable and have an idea of using various operators in MongoDB. So you can use the db.collectionFind operation and also use uh, a query operator which is dollar in in order to specify the field and the values that you want to retrieve or you want to search for in a document so for example i have given an example which says that in order to return all employees whose title is product manager or executive di director in such case the query would be db.employees.find mention the field which is title mention the uh, in which is a query operator here mention the product manager and executive director which we are trying to find so if there is any record or uh, the person who is associated with, associated with this title of product manager or executive director it will retrieve the record now we have a person name whose first name is rahul and last name is kumar whose age is 29 and title is product manager so this is how you can search for a document uh, with a specific field which has one or more values so the next question is which command are used to insert single and multiple documents into a collection now we basically have two types of commands which is db.collection.insert1 which will insert a single document into a mongodb collection and it returns a document containing the inserted documents id field and next we have the same uh, command but the keyword changes which is insert many which is insert a single or even multiple records uh, into a doc mongodb collection again it returns a document containing each inserted documents id well the next question is what is the difference between all and in operator in mongodb now both all and in operator are used to filter documents in a sub array based on a conditional statement so but there are some differences or subtle differences between all and in operator now when i talk about all operator all operator retrieves all the documents which contains the subset of the value we pass and the subset might be in any order but whereas in operator retrieves all the documents which contains the either of the values we pass moving on what is the next question is both writes and reads become faster when you add more slaves to replica set 
is this statement true or false explain the reason well the statement is false now a replica set can only have a primary uh, at any particular time that is having a one master with other nodes the secondary nodes being slaves so all right operations are performed only on the master node read operations on the other hand can be performed on any instance which can be a slave or a master node so as a result adding more slaves to a replica set accelerates only reads operation and not the and not the writes operation so the statement is not valid and it is a false statement we cannot uh, you know write and read both uh, operation when you add more slave to replica set the next question is what is shard key and mention the components of mongodb sharded cluster now what is a shard key shard key is used by mongodb to distribute the documents of a collection across shards now on sharding a mongodb data set a shard key is automatically created by default so the shard key can be in the form of indexed field or indexed compound fields that will be used to distribute the data among the shards generally the shard key is used to distribute the mongodb's collections documents across all the shards where the key consists of a single field or multiple fields in every document now the idea is to have multiple replica set with multiple primaries which will basically divide data and load it among themselves and each of this replica set is called a shard shard basically has three components which is basically shard mongos and config server all this together comprises of a mongodb sharded cluster now when i talk about shard what is a shard shard contains a subset of the sharded data okay a shard is basically a single mongodb server or a replica set that stores a partition of the application data that you have divided now next we have the mongos mongos router or the it is a router of operations now because each shard contains only part of the cluster data you need something to route operations to the appropriate shards that's where mongos comes in the mongos process is a router that directs all the reads writes and commands to the appropriate shard in this way mongos provides client with a single point of contact with the cluster and finally we have config servers now mongos process are basically are durable should be durable that means it must be in a position to store the metadata in order to properly manage the cluster right which we have formed with the shard key so that's the job of the config server this metadata includes the cluster configuration the location of each database collection and the particular range of data therein so this is what basically shard key is and multiple uh, components that are included in the mongodb sharded cluster so moving on to the next question which is the join clause is a key feature of relational database systems what is the mongodb equivalent if any and are there any limitations now whenever we hear about joins we have like different operations like inner join outer join uh, left join and uh, you know cross join so similarly we have a question here that means if we talk about no sql that means we do not have no joins that means we do have joins or we do not have joins that's the main question but the thing is we have a join equivalent in mongodb also which is the lookup operator which is a significant disadvantages that is it does not work in sharded collection right so it's worth noting that rather than looking for a direct equivalent to join mongodb developers often simply denormalize the data and which eliminates the need for a join you know operation in a mongodb database so in a nutshell you can say it performs an outer join to a collection in the same database to filter the documents from the joint collection for processing now the lookup operator adds a new array field to each input document and this new array field contains the matching documents from the joint collection so the next question is mention some pros and cons of normalizing data in mongodb database now normalizing data is a key factor in relational database but what about mongodb now updated documents is fast for normalized data and it is relatively so slower for denormalized data well on the other hand reading documents is fast in denormalized data and slow for normalized data so denormalized data is hard to keep in sync and takes up more space so rdbms generally have this organic support 
for normalization and allow data to be managed as a separate entity whereas NoSQL DBMSs like MongoDB do not have this active support for normalization. So the next question is what are the advantages of using MongoDB? Now there are various advantages of using MongoDB. For example, it is an open source DB that is it is readily, readily available for everyone to download and perform the operations right away. And it is also easy to use. The syntax is also uh, user friendly just like SQL. It is also highly flexible which allows you to store and work on different data types and allows you to store unstructured data of different types in one or more documents. And the security is also a paramount feature for any user, right? So MongoDB provides advanced security features as well. And we also talked about high availability in our previous question. And it also has reliable indexing for a faster retrieval of data. It has a flexible schema design, unlike the uh, predefined schema in relational databases. So this flexible or the dynamic schema design allows you to meet the ever-changing conditions of the big data applications, uh, you know, with the vast amount of data that is being incorporated into the documents, you can have a better edge on the data if you're working on large scale applications, then MongoDB can be a great choice for you. With all this, it also gives you high performance, which is another key feature of MongoDB and one of its greatest advantage of a NoSQL database. And that brings us to the last question of our interview question, uh, which is what are some applications of MongoDB? Now, MongoDB being a NoSQL database is widely popular in many uh, sectors nowadays and some of the major applications or real-time use case of uh, MongoDB is it is used in IoT which is Internet of Things with the world rapidly uh, advancing in, uh, you know, in technology. IoT plays a crucial role and it is important that we uh, as a user, you know, have these uh, intention to store the data and have that data protected in any sense now the data is only getting larger and larger and we also heard this phrase that data is the new oil so with the coming in the coming years the data is exceptionally going to rise and we need mongodb to store this uh, huge or uh, huge volumes of data into our uh, databases right so it is one of the applications of MongoDB and we also have mobile applications and in order to perform real-time analysis and we also have uh, it is also used in uh, catalog management content management and for product management and various others sectors as well now companies also like to use NoSQL databases uh, because of its uh, flexible uh, design and the need of you know storing data without any uh, predefined schema makes it a uh, best NoSQL database uh, like companies like eBay, Shutterfly, New York Times, Verizon and many other big companies use uh, MongoDB nowadays and also the one of the real life uh, application or use cases the best example you can give is Aadhaar card which is India's unique identification which is uh, based on uh, identifying a person's you know identity so the other uses mongodb to store this massive amounts of demographic and biographic biometric data of over more than 1.5 billion uh, you indian users so other uses mongodb in order to store the images code qr code details you know the personal details of the user in its database so these were some of the applications of MongoDB. And with that, we have reached the end of this session on MongoDB full course. Hope the session was informative and helpful. We hope you had a lot to learn and if you have any further queries regarding any concepts or topics covered in this tutorial, feel free to let us know in the comments below and our team of experts will be more than happy to help resolve all your queries at the earliest. Until next time, thank you, stay safe and keep learning. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.